Hey everyone, so on Generative Adversarial Network, I made quite a few individual videos previously. So this video is a combination of all of them and also some of the small parts that I had missed out in my previous video recording. And these are the architectures that I'm covering here, a DC GAN, Bicycle GAN, Conditional GAN, Cycle GAN and lastly W GAN or Wasserstein GAN. And I implemented all of them with PyTorch from scratch. Uh, the GitHub link for each of these is given in the description. So enjoy these long series. Hello, my name is Rohan Paul and very welcome to my computer vision and deep learning YouTube channel. Let's get started. So in this video, I will do DC GAN or Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Network Implementation from scratch. So I'm looking at the original paper that was published in 2016 by uh, the researchers Alec Radford, Luke Meds, and uh, Saumit Chintala. And here in this again, like all other GANs, we have two neural networks. One is generator and the other one is discriminator. The generator's objective is to learn the data distribution for the training data to produce fake images that resemble the training data. And the discriminator is a classifier whose objective is to distinguish the real images from the fake data generated by the generator. Every time the discriminator detects the fake data generated by the generator, then the generator is penalized. So basically the generator and the discriminator are pitted against each other as the generator tries to fool the discriminator and the discriminator learns not to get fooled by the generator. Both the generator and the discriminator are neural networks of course. Uh, input to the generator is a random noise vector what you see here at the very start of the network which is a hundred dimensional uh, vector represented by these uh, by this letter Z. And uh, so this is the input to the generator, whole generator network starts with these input vector, which is a random noise vector. In contrast, the discriminator is the, the classifier here. That means the job of the discriminator is to classify the images generated by the generator. So the input to the discriminator is the output from the generator, which are fake data and also the real images from the training data. The discriminator loss penalizes the discriminator for misclassifying real data as fake or fake data as real. This is architecture of a, a DC GAN. So now first let's understand how traditional image processing works. So traditionally ConvNet uses a network that takes an image with the dimensions, height, width and number of color channels as input and through a series of convolution layers outputs a single vector of class course with the dimension of 1 into n where n is a number of class labels. In DC GAN however, under the generator part, to generate an image by using the continent architecture, we reverse the process. Instead of taking an image and processing it into a vector, we take a vector and upsize it to an image. That's what this part is doing. So overall, the core of DCGAN architecture uses a standard CNN architecture on the discriminative part of the model. But for the generator, convolutions are replaced with up convolutions. So the representation at each layer of the generator is actually successively larger as it maps from a low dimensional latent vector onto a high dimensional image. It needs a layer to translate from coarse salient features to a more dense and detailed output. Now let's quickly go through the original paper that was published in uh, Jan 2016 by Alec Radford and Luke Meds and Sumit Chintala. So uh, the original paper mentioned few things to stabilize GAN like I discussed earlier that GAN by itself is super sensitive to parameters and uh, uh, DC GAN is even more so. So the architecture guideline that they have given for a stable uh, DC GAN are the following. Replace any pooling layers with strided convolutions or discriminator and fractional strided convolutions or generator. Use batch norm in both the generator and the discriminator. Remove fully connected hidden layers for deeper architectures. Use ReLU activation in generator for all layers except for the output which uses TANH. 
use leaky relu activation in the discriminator for all layers and one of the most important point in this architecture is that the generator part of the network uses a transposed convolution to convert a hundred dimensional vector to a fully fledged image by the end of this network here in contrast the discriminator part of the network uses these output from the generator which is a fully fledged image and converts it ultimately by the end of the network that is end of the discriminator network into a binary decision of 0 and 1 and this is done in the discriminator by use of a normal regular convolution now quickly see what is transposed convolution as opposed to a regular convolution all right with that background on the architectural details let's start the actual implementation so i am back in my vs code and to implement the entire project i will have three files uh, which is what we can see right now in the screen uh, one is dc gan which will have the actual implementation of the generator and the discriminator methods and the classes actually uh, then i will have a train file which will implement just the training the training the architecture and i will also have a small utils.py file which will have couple of methods to get the data and uh, pre-process the data etc so before starting the actual uh, architecture let's quickly see what the original paper talks about the uh, guidelines on uh, the architectural implementation so remember like many GANs uh, DC GAN is very unstable so um, that means that because of its uh, because of its architecture are slight problems in the initial part of the training or in the structure of the training can make your entire architecture produce only noises so we have to be very careful about that and that's why the original paper clearly says architecture guidelines for stable deep convolutional GANs are the following which are replace any pooling layers with strided convolution uh, in the in the discriminator and fractional strided convolution in the generator then use batch norm in both the generator and the discriminator remove fully connected hidden layers for deeper architectures use relu activation in generator for all layers except for the output which uses tan h and use leaky relu now remember this last point is this this they are talking about using leaky relu and not the relu for the discriminator for all layers all right now let's go back to the vs code okay so I'm in my dcgan.py file. This will have the main uh, implementation of the generator and the discriminator class. Initially, I'm just importing all the standard imports. And uh, then my generator class is here. So the generator takes, basically it takes the noise vector as an input to generate the images that will resemble the training data set. And here, my training data set is MNIST, that is, they're all grayscale, and the shapes are 1 by 28 by 28, that is, number of channels are 1, uh, height and width both are 28. So the entire generator class will convert the noise vector to 1 by 28 by 28 images, which resemble MNIST data set, and it accomplishes this through a series of strided two-dimensional transposed convolution so i'm i'll be using this method of pytorch nn.conf transpose 2d uh, these this layer are paired with batch norm 2d layers as they help with the flow of gradients during training which is followed by a relu activation function so let's see uh, so this is my generator class and um, uh, the, the, the arguments to the class is mainly uh, these number of channels noise vector and number of generator filter that is num gen filter these variable uh, this represents the total number of generator filters or number of channels in a generator so my first it starts with uh, uh, these uh, nn.conf 2d uh, within a nn.sequential uh, module so the first conf 2d layer takes in channels as a noise vector which is coming from the argument this will be a hundred dimensional that is hundred element vector and the out channels that represent the number of output channels or so the number of filters which will be in this case uh, these num gen filter into four now remember these out channels or the number of filters is a hyperparameter so it is you are supposed to tune it to get best results so you could actually change it according to your data set according to your architecture etc so i have taken here uh, this particular number 
num gen filter into four kernel size i'm taking four stride one padding zero and bias i'm taking false that's because in the next line i'm using nn dot batch norm 2d now why does batch norm needs to set bias equal to false in pytorch is because batch normalization already includes the addition of the bias term so uh, to uh, the point to note here is that batch norm learns the mean and standard deviation of the y vector over many batches and uses that to recenter and rescale the data that is standardization of the data and including bias in previous layer will be cancelled here and that's why uh, you will see that in this architecture as well i'm including bias equal to false here and here as well and here as well i mean in the no all the conf transpose 2d layers where i have a batch norm after immediately after it so overall in my generator class the height and width dimension of the input image does not change only the channel dimension decreases we can see that so we have uh, uh, one conf transpose 2d then the second one third one and fourth one so total four con uh, conf transpose 2d and uh, each one each of these conf transpose 2d is followed by a batch norm relu then batch norm relu here again then the batch norm and relu and because this is the final conf transpose 2d i do not have a batch norm 2d after it and instead of the relu i have 10 h this is exactly following the architectural guidelines that was mentioned here in the original paper all right and uh, we can see these uh, output channels uh, continues to decrease because the first one out channels is numgen filter into four then for the next one i have uh, out channel is numgen filter into two for the third one uh, out channel is only no multiplication it's a purely numgen filter and uh, later we will see this uh, this number this out channel i will uh, give it uh, the number 32 for both my discriminator and uh, the generator as well and finally in the final conference post 2d as well the out channel remains uh, the number of channels here because this is a final one and it, it has to produce a final image set which should resemble the MNIST data set and we know the MNIST data set the channel number is one because they are all grayscale so that was the sequential stacking of my uh, four conf transpose 2d and then i have to do the uh, forward function uh, this is just uh, quite easy here so forward is just the output from the network and uh, i'm returning that output and obviously this network that is the self dot network is the name of this entire architecture so i'm naming it uh, the all the nn dot sequential individual stacking to be uh, self dot network here and that's exactly what i'm using within my forward function okay now next is discriminator and for the discriminator quickly have a look at the architecture uh, again so the generator ends here outputting is images that are fake images and that resemble in my case uh, uh, the MNIST data set so here in this picture we are seeing three channels because the, I'm looking at the original uh, original image given in the original paper which uh, implements the entire architecture on celeb a data set which are uh, color images and they have three channels but in my case MNIST data set it will have one channel only so anyway the point is generator will produce this final image as uh, its output and discriminator starts from that image so input to the discriminator is the output from the generator that is i am feeding the discriminator this fake image generated by the generator and now discriminator will classify them is as either fake or real fake will produce zero and real will produce one so here my discriminator starts so the main difference is that generator will use conf 2d that is um, uh, tr sorry uh, transposed convolution to increase from vector to image and to uh, continuously apply it to reduce the number of uh, channels and ultimately produce the image and the discriminator is the opposite it will use a normal convolution and uh, will increase the depth or the number of channels continuously through various application of those uh, uh, convolution layers so here is my discriminator class in the same file dcgan.py 
So again, the discriminator is a binary classification neural network to classify the input as real or fake images of dimension 1 by 28 by 28. In this case, the inputs to the discriminator are real images from the training data set and also the fake images generated by the generator. The discriminator outputs a scalar probability to classify the input images as real or fake. So it's a binary classification problem. Now look at the architecture the way that I'm implementing. So here instead of uh, instead of this conf transpose 2D, each layer will have conf 2D. This is a normal convolution. So I will have four of them. One, two, three, four. And the paper, original paper clearly talks about that use leaky ReLU activation in the discriminator for all layers and use strided convolution for discriminator and anything else batch norm yeah obviously you have to use batch norm in both the generator and the discriminator all right now going back to my code okay so again discriminator starts from the in channels to the first layer will be the number of channels because that's the final output from my generator remember the out channel in the final layer of my generator function that is the fourth output from the fourth conf transpose 2d the out channel was num channel this is MNIST data set, so number of channel will be one, and that will be the starting in channels for my discriminator. Here I am in the discriminator class, in channels is num channel, num, num underscore ch, this will be one. Out channel will be the number of discriminator filter. Here again, this is coming from the arguments, and later we will see in my train.py file while I will actually start the training that I am giving this variable a number of 32. That is, this will be my number of filters or number of channels in my discriminator. Kernel size keeping at 4, stride 2, padding 1, bias false again for the same reason, uh, and that we discussed earlier. And here I'm then using leaky relu uh, for, for it. And then the next conf 2D here and here in channels is again num discriminator filter that because that's output channel from the previous layer and out channel remains uh, out channel. I have to here increase the depth and that's what exactly we saw in the image that in generator. Let's quickly have a look at the image again. That is in the generator, the depth, that is the number of channels are reducing. So here we can see 10245122561288. That again, I'm looking at the original paper image, the uh, image given in the original paper. So this number of channels will not exactly match with my implementation because I'm doing it on MNIST dataset and they did it on Celeb A dataset. So anyway, the point here is that in the generator, the number of channels will continue to decrease layer by layer. And the opposite will happen in the discriminator. Here, the number of channels will continue to increase layer by layer. And that's what we will be seeing in the code. So in the next conf 2D, that is a second conf 2D within my discriminator class, the out channel, I'm increasing by a factor of two. And uh, then I have the batch norm 2D, leaky ReLU. Now, a quick word on use of leaky ReLU here. Uh, we already know that DC GAN, by its uh, definition, it's very unstable. So, you have to be very careful on the implementation of these layers and uh, use of various hyperparameter. And leaky ReLU, it has been found, helps in faster convergence if your output requires both positive and negative values. But the catch is that you need to tune the negative slope of leaky ReLU, which is a hyperparameter to get a get a better accuracy and the negative the negative slope is this this number 0.2 so negative slope in this context means that the negative half of the leaky relu slope it is not describing a slope which is necessarily negative uh, so yeah that's about the leaky relu so uh, yeah so in after my conf 2d second conf 2d again uh, i'm going to the third conf 2d and here again i'm increasing the in channels to be num descriptor filter into four. Okay, see, this is coming from the previous channel because that was um, done. The increase of the number of channels was done in the third conf 2D, and that's exactly I have to do. I have to take in my fourth and final conf 2D. And out channels here remains one, obviously, because um, this is MNIST dataset, grayscale, one channel. Kernel size keeping at four, stride one, padding zero, bias false. And finally, I will be applying nn.sigmoid function for the final layer.
Now for the forward function, quickly remember this point. It's very important. I should mention it in a comment that the discriminator outputs a scalar probability to classify the input image as real or fake. So ultimately, discriminator will give me a zero or one based on if it is if it is real, if it is uh, fake or real. If fake equal to zero, real equal to one. Now. Uh, the forward pass in the discriminator uh, is uh, that's what is happening here the input is an image tensor and returns a one dimensional tensor representing image as fake or real that's what these uh, that's why i'm using dot view here which will kind of uh, flatten the tensor and also i'm using squeeze one which will remove all superficial one dimension from the tensor and with that, I'm done with the implementation of the generator and DCGAN architecture, actually. And I can now uh, go to my, uh, I can actually start the training. But obviously, before starting the training, quickly have a look at the utils uh, file here. Because here I will have two small method uh, just uh, to help in the training. So the first one is obvious that you will see in all PyTorch uh, image dataset project that is you have to get your data loader method running so here i'm just making use of uh, the torch vision mnist dataset uh, obviously at the very uh, start i'm importing all the torch vision dot utils function datasets and transforms and then my trans for the transform i'm only applying the two tensor method and also i'm normalizing the data with this mean of 0 0.1307 and standard deviation of 0 point three zero eight one and why i took this number is because in many projects uh, that i found in uh, various sources uh, this kind of the two numbers that was used mostly on mnist dataset to normalize it and then uh, my trained dataset variable would just be the downloaded dataset from datasets.mnist this is coming from torch vision i just mentioned my root folder to be my google drive uh, train true transform is applying this transform that I'm previously defined download equal to true that means if it is already there that is the data is already there it will not download it again otherwise it will download it and then uh, I'm making use of torch.utils.data.data dot data loader to load these train data set uh, so that uh, it will f it will fetch the entire uh, batch by batch data from the entire data set and feed it to the model and finally from these uh, get data loader function i'm just returning the train loader now uh, this is just each batch of data uh, that it will be uh, fed into the model and another method quick small method i'm using this plot images this is just a simple method uh, just for plotting no calculations uh, no uh, complex here at all uh, it is just making use of plt.subplots uh, so that when my epochs are done, I can see what kind of results ultimately it produced. That is what kind of images is produced from the generator uh, generator class of my DC GAN. Uh, because visually I can see at least uh, the result. So basically it is just uh, creating, a, creating a, a grid of the grid will represent the overall plot and then it will take a number of uh, samples from my output images uh, to be uh, to be plotted and then it is just making use of uh, uh, these plt.subplot to plot it from that sample and uh, yeah so that's my plot function and now coming back to train.py uh, so this is where i will implement the entire training of my decision architecture so let's uh, before before starting on that let's quickly go over some guidelines for training this again uh, so this is that slide the training steps for the generator so these are the steps that i'm going to implement in my uh, generator and disc discriminator within my train.py file so under the discriminator that uh, so by by convention normally many people start with the discriminator with within the training class and that's what i will do as well so it will start with the input the discriminator will get it in input as uh, the real data from training data set and also the fake data from the generator then the discriminator classifies between real and fake data every time the discriminator misclassifies a real instance as fake or a fake instance as real it penalizes the discriminator that is a loss will increase and then it back propagate through the discriminator and update the discriminator's weight based on its loss so let's uh, implement that and then we before implementing the generator we'll look into these other guidelines
that is the discriminator updates its weight through back propagations from the discriminator loss through the discriminator network another super important point when training dc gan that is keep the generator constant during the discriminator training phase because when training the generator we do not want the discriminator to change else we will be expecting the generator learn a moving target and as a result the generator will never converge and also just exactly keep the discriminator constant during the generator training phase that's because when training the discriminator we do not want the generator to change as we want the discriminator to learn how to classify the real data from fake data and now i'm back in my vs code first the initial imports are all the usual ones i'm also defining the device to use gpu if available l cpu and uh, here in these two lines i'm importing all the classes from my other two files that is dcgan.py and utils.py and here is a main method in this uh, in this file that is uh, train method and the train method takes all these uh, arguments number of epochs discriminator net which will be uh, which will be uh, the, the generated object from these generator from the discriminator class and uh, similarly generator uh, discriminator net and generator net which will be uh, coming from uh, coming from the classes from this file and uh, optimizer for discriminator optimizer d optimizer for generator uh, for the generator class train loader which will be my batch by batch data set which will be coming from invoking this function that i defined in utils.pi uh, that is get data loader uh, train loader is what this method returns and that's what i will be using as a training uh, training data uh, then i have two variables uh, that will be defined inside that is fake label and uh, real label actually th they will be passed as an argument sorry uh, i will define it outside of the function later uh, down uh, here when i will just before executing this train method all right uh, criterion that's my loss function and also a couple of other this output path is just a path variable that where i will be saving the uh, the images that will be created by the generator network that is this will be the path where the fake images will be saved number of test sample is just some random number on which i will be uh, applying the uh, this is just a number uh, number of test samples which, which i will be plotting for uh, use by using this uh, method here that is uh, a plot images and uh, yeah device is just device what i already have defined here that is my gpu or cpu depending on whatever is available all right with that now inside the function uh, number of batches obviously will be the length of train loader because this train loader will give me batch by batch data so uh, that will be the length of this train loader and then inside the function i'll just am running the loop for each number of epochs uh, so in this case i think i ran uh, after running for 50 or 60 epochs i got really reasonably good results that is my fake images were almost looking like the real ones so this is just number of epochs and then the real uh, juice starts here so i'm uh, looping over or enumerating over my train data uh, first i'm getting the batch size by taking the shape the zeroth element of this shape uh, and then from here the discriminator network training starts first i'm applying zero grad and why I'm using this zero grad at the very start of the training? That's because in PyTorch, for every mini batch during the training phase, we typically want to explicitly set the gradients to zero before starting to do back propagation. That is, before updating the weights and biases, because PyTorch accumulates the gradients on subsequent backward passes. And because of this accumulation behavior in PyTorch, when you start your training loop, ideally you should zero out the gradient so that you do the parameter update correctly. Otherwise, the gradients would be a combination of the old gradients, that is, old which you have already used to update your model parameters, and also the newly computed gradient. It would therefore point in some other direction than the intended direction towards minimum or maximum. Uh, hence, uh, this is a standard behavior, a standard implementation of code that you will see in almost all PyTorch projects. 
all right now my real images i'm transferring to them transferring them to device and that's coming from these real images are my actual training images coming from uh, enumerating over the train loader data set and now i have to create label and uh, first uh, uh, i'm training the discriminator on real images and hence these uh, my initial label creation will be filled with all one and that's what i'm doing here torch.full batch size real images real labels device equal to device so here these variable batch size real images it's just a number of samples in a batch so that many labels would need to be created and real label this is coming from uh, the argument here and later we will see that uh, these this will be number one because it is a zero one binary problem uh, in discriminator so my fake labels will be zero real labels will be one all right then the discriminator uh, the, so okay okay so before this line output equal to discriminator net real images so basically here i am for the first time classifying my real images uh, with the discriminator network so that's the job of the discriminator network that is it is used to classify real images drawn from the training set and also fake images produced by the discriminator so that's exactly how i'm doing in this line that is classifying the next two lines actually i don't need them i have commented out anyway but i can actually delete them this was because i was getting some float 32 problem while uh, while implementing this and so i had to explicitly set both the output and labels to torch.float32 but later i resolved it by initiating the variables to be of float type so let's just delete them all right now that my output is ready that is my classification is done with the discriminator network i am ready to do my uh, uh, loss calculation and for loss i'll be using this criterion later we will see this criterion uh, i will be defining it to be binary cross entropy loss because it's a binary problem so i'll be using torches pi torches bce loss and to that i will pass my the result from these discriminator net that is output variable and also the ground truth that is label that i have created earlier uh, and then i will apply my backward function to do the backward to start the backward propagation and uh, here i'm just creating these extra variable d underscore x this is just pretty much for logging purpose uh, that is well i will be training i will be running the all the epochs i uh, after each epoch i want to output and see what kind of uh, output i'm getting after each epoch uh, and that's why i have created this extra variable and taking and the mean of all these outputs and also extracting the actual value from these by using the uh, item method uh, so anyway this does not exp th th this line does not explicitly affect the overall training it is just for my output logging purpose and next very importantly i have to create this noise by uh, using the torch.random so i am pretty much here creating a random noise vector uh, or variable uh, for the input to the whole adversarial network and uh, yeah so uh, batch again the size for the size of the noise vector it will be uh, the number of batch size uh, which uh, i have uh, these batch size is just a number of samples in each batch and noise vector i will define it this is this is part of the argument noise vector uh where is the noise vector yeah i see that i missed uh, in putting that in my arguments list so noise vector will just be another argument to my train function noise vector equal to oh sorry uh, noise vector is just another argument and later while executing the train method i have to pass this argument and we will see that this noise vector as per the paper it's a hundred dimensional single vector so uh, that's what we will do later uh, anyway so this is that noise vector which is the input for the entire adversarial network and then um, the fake images that's uh, that's the uh, output from my generator class that is uh, uh, this class uh, remember we talked about in detail this generator class entire output would be uh, generated from a noise vector and ultimately after all these convolution it will output uh, a, an an image which is of shape which is of shape 1 by 28 by 28 resembling mnis data set so that's what I'm doing in this line. Fake images generated by the generator class is generator net. And to that, I'm passing this noise. 
and uh, obviously generator net is part of the part of the arguments and we will see that this is an object of the generator class that we will define immediately after uh, defining this train function and now that i have created fake images my uh, discriminator network also needs to be trained on the fake images and so i have to create some labels which are uh, which are which are for the fake images so now uh, training on fake images fill labels with zero so that's what i'm doing the same label variable here i'll be filling them with fake label this is a this is an argument and this will be given a number of zero because they represent the fake uh, so now again train the discriminator that is classify these fake images with the f uh, with the discriminator net and that's what i'm doing here in this line output equal to discriminator net fake images dot detach uh, detach is just to detach uh, detach my gradients from the tensor because pytorch's tensors automatically by default will uh, will have the gradients included it so by detach method will detach the unnecessary gradient uh, layer from the tensor and now uh, after this output i am ready to calculate the loss from the fake images that's this line loss discriminator fake uh, using the same criterion that is a loss function which will be bce loss to that i'm passing output and label that is uh, the predicted ones and the ground truth and obviously after that again the backward propagation and this uh, this line again it is just for keeping a log of my uh, my calculation so that i can print it while running the train method so the total discriminator loss at last because now my fake images and uh, real images both have been run through the discriminator network now the total law and the individual loss has has already been calculated so now the total loss will just be the addition of the real loss and the uh, fake loss and finally optimizer d dot step optimizer d is the optimizer which we have to uh, pass as an argument later we will see in a second and then the step function to update the weights and uh, move on for the next step which is my generator network this will be generator update generator ge any -E right you are and here uh, uh, my generator training will start and just exactly we did in the discriminator first i'm bringing in zero grad to set the gradient to zero uh, to offset the accumulation behavior that pytorch otherwise will do and then uh, the label dot fill equal, equal label dot fill and filling them with real labels real labels are all one values so this is a single value single scalar value of one we have to pass it uh, as an argument and why i'm doing this is because i am setting image label vector values all equal to one to fool the discriminator network because in the next line here i will be classifying the fake images with my discriminator network so i'll be passing the discriminator network all the fake images and i want discriminator network to think that they are real images that is i'm trying to fool them and we'll see that uh, how much of this effort of fooling of trying to fool the discriminator actually work so basically what what's happening in this line is uh, is important to understand that the discriminator net i am passing fake images but all the labels of these fake images are has been defined to be one that is th that's where the uh, crux of the story in the generator that is generated is trying to fool the discriminator network and then if it fails to do that that is if the discriminator really uh, cannot think that is a fake images are real that means the generator failed that is that will be the value of the loss of the generator network and that's what i'm doing in the next line here that is loss from the generator network is defined as the loss between this output and this label and this output is coming by passing to the discriminator network all the fake images while the labels are all one that is these images are all fake so the label should have been zero that is they are fake labels but i have passed all labels to be one and then that will become my loss from the generator to the x that is to the extent the generator fails to fool the discriminator and after the generator loss then i'm doing the back propagation with the backward method and also uh, creating this line is just for logging purpose and finally optimizer g dot step and this is optimizer for the generator network that i will pass as part of the arguments and then the step method to update all the weights and move forward 
okay and then these lines are just uh, for logging during uh, while the all the epochs are running so basically i am just um, outputting the epoch number because epoch will start with zero so i'm adding one to it uh, and total number of epochs that is uh, total number of uh, so it will print something like uh, uh, which epoch i am currently uh, out of my total number of epochs that need to run and also it will print my uh, num batches and loss during the epoch uh, that is a, both the discriminator loss and a generator loss etc uh, yeah so that's my printing from the epoch and then i am setting generator dot uh, uh, generator net dot eval to eval mode because now i want to plot the images between the uh, epochs and uh, because this is this plot images will plot the image that is a fake image that were generated by the generator network and finally, before uh, the final uh, step of the train function, I have to set the generator net again to train uh, so that my gradient calculation, etc., is again turned on. So that's where my train method uh, actually ends. So the entire train method goes on till here. And I trained both my discriminator and generator. And then uh, the next and the final step uh, in this entire project is to uh, do this training before that i have to initialize all these arguments variable that i have to pass to the train method and that's what these few lines are all about here in these lines i'm just creating all the arguments batch size i'm keeping it at 256 output path because i am i was running this in google collab so this is just uh, uh, default session storage path in google collab and uh, uh, so i'm pulling the mnist data set by uh, uh, invoking or executing this get data loader method that i have defined in my utils.py file uh, device i think i have already defined it at the very top so i don't need it here i can just delete um, delete it let's quickly see if i have defined it at the top yes i have defined my device at the top so i don't need it below again and then this discriminator net and generator net is just uh, uh, the class implementation of discriminator and generator. And note these numbers, very important. Number of channels, I'm passing one to discriminator because it's MNIST data set. So both the gen discriminator and generator will take this argument as one because output from the generator will need to be uh, one number of channel and disc for the discriminator as well for both uh, for the input to the discriminator also need to be the number of channels need to be one because mnist is one channel data set and the uh, number of discriminator filter and also the number of generator filter both i am defining to be 32 uh, remember when we did the uh, this generator and the discriminator we need that number generator filter to create to feed into my out channels for my generator class at the very first conf transpose 2d layer similarly this uh, this number of channel will be included in all the conf 2d layer to determine my number of channels so again the generator network the number of channels continues to decrease through the layers and in the discriminator class this number of channels continues to increase the first conf 2d takes only the number of discriminator filter then in the next conf 2d i'm multiplying by two then in the third conf 2d i'm multiplying by four so in the discriminator it increases anyway so this num generator filter i am uh, defining to be 32 for both of them and then i'm transferring both these uh, tensors to my device very important otherwise you will definitely get error criterion as this is a binary classification problem so i am using bce loss uh, and optimizer d for both my discriminator and generator i am creating the optimizer i'm using the optimizer to be adam optimizer and learning rate the very standard one 0 0.001 and here real label and fake label i'm defining them to be one and zero respectively and because i need float number and that's what i'm using it like this that is 1.0 or 0 0.0 so initially when i if you use it just like this it will be taken as an integer and you will get an error and that's when i initially had to use uh, uh, the torch dot float tensor inside my network inside my training uh, code here that i uh, deleted while uh, a while back 
so yeah this is minor point of course uh, that you have to initialize your real levels and fake levels to be float a uh, float value and uh, yeah number of test samples 16 this is uh, this is just for the plotting purpose this will be fed into my uh, this function when i am plotting uh, yeah plot images that will take this number of test samples because that many samples it will actually plot to give me and show me my result and uh, fixed noise uh, this is my uh, uh, this is the noise variable that I'm creating with torch.rand n number of epochs uh, I, I I was testing initially but uh, 20 but I would suggest if you keep it at something like 50 you will see really uh, really uh, uh, good images that is the fake images produced by the generator a generator will almost look like real MNIST images and noise vector obviously as per the paper it has to be a hundred hundred element vector uh, that is a that will that will be fed into the very first layer to the generator input and finally i'm executing the train method here uh, with all these arguments that i defined here so it takes quite a few arguments all right now my all these files are completely ready i will just fire up a google collab instance and upload these three, three files and run a jupyter notebook to see the actual result let's go back actually keep my number of epochs to uh, uh 270 because i think that's when you can really see almost uh, real images from the generator network and here I am in my Google Collab. I have just created a very simple Jupyter Notebook. It will only have kind of only two cells. Uh, that's all. Because uh, I will s you will see that why you need just this two cell. Because all my code is already done in the, uh, in the different three files that we have seen. Now here in the Google Collab, I will just upload those three files individually and run these Jupyter Notebooks to see the result. But first... Uh, let's see my runtime is using the GPU yes I'm using GPU and let's check what kind of GPU I got by running these uh, command NVIDIA hyphen SMI uh, all right I got a powerful GPU Tesla P100 with 16 GB of uh, memory okay now uh, yeah clear this output and the next line I am uh, firing up my um uh, google drive uh, because i have to I, my mnist data set is residing in my google drive so you have to just write these two code to connect your google drive just run this cell and it will prompt you to connect the google drive here and after running it just will say that mounted at content slash drive and now you have to upload those three files that is in my local machine so just upload those uh, three files I have dcgan.py, train.py, utils.py. All right, they got uploaded. So you can just double click and check that this is my train file. Okay, looks awesome. This is my dcgan file. And this is my utils file. Uh, I am zoomed in too much so that's why it has taken the entire let's just bring in my Jupyter notebook okay so I have these three files uploaded and uh, remember my train file has already Im uh, imported the all the modules from dcgan and utils the other two files so uh, my train file has everything it needs so only thing I have to do for this project to run properly is run this uh, command that's pretty much it that is python train.py and it will run it let's just run this cell and we can see the epoch just started uh, running uh, yeah so that's what uh, that's what the, that's the kind of uh, output you will see let's zoom out a little bit let's close this yeah so uh, at the end of the first epoch i have my g loss is this d uh, dx this variable that i have defined at the very top that's one uh yeah so okay so here i'm running for 75 epochs so obviously i am not going to wait i will just show you the final result and after running all the epochs up to 75 that is total 75 epochs this is the final image that i got from my generator 
a class that is these are all fake mnist images generated by my generator class which started with only 100 a uh, vector of 100 elements that is a noise vector and created this Im uh, this ip image of mnist after 75 epochs so we can already see they they are really looking almost like the real mnist images and uh, just to test i actually ran it up to 125 epochs and after 125 i got almost in exactly the original like images from my generator network so that was my dc gan implementation with pytorch for mnist dataset and obviously the github link i will put in the description of the video the github uh, repository has numbers associated with each video so just search by the numbers Hey everyone, in my GAN series with PyTorch, today I'm going to do Bicycle GAN and officially it's known as Toward Multimodal Image to Image Translation. Hello, my name is Rohan Paul and very welcome to my computer vision and deep learning YouTube channel. Let's get started. And here I'm looking at the original paper of Bicycle GAN. It's called Toward Multimodal Image to Image Translation and uh, the paper was released in October 2018 now uh, let's come to the important topic of the paper so i have highlighted all those important areas so bicycle gan consists of two components one is conditional variational autoencoder gan or cvae gan and the next one is conditional latent regressor gan or clr gan and what exactly they are so cvae gan is one approach where it's about first encoding the ground truth images into the latent space giving the generator a noisy peak into the desired output in using this along with the input image the generator should be able to reconstruct the specific output image and then under the clr gan that is the second part of our bicycle gan uh, the approach is about to, uh, first provide a randomly drawn latent vector to the generator in this case a produced output may not necessarily look like the ground truth image but it should look realistic an encoder then attempts to recover the latent vector from the output image this method could be seen as a conditional formulation of the latent regressor model. And finally, in the bicycle GAN, we combine both these approaches to enforce the connection between latent encoding and output in both directions jointly and achieve improved performance. So all these will become much more clear when we start implementing them in actually with PyTorch. Uh, in a moment but let's uh, move ahead in the paper to look at these this super important uh, pictorial representation of bicycle gan and this image tells us all that we need to know about bicycle gan here a and b represent images in two different domains and b hat is the uh, is the fake images produced by the generator g and uh, d here is obviously the discriminator and obviously uh, this uh, letter e represent the encoder and we can see there are two parts in the whole bicycle gan architecture which is the first one is cvae gan and the second one is clr gan so in the first part that is uh, cvae gan uh, it encodes the ground truth image b into the latent space using this encoder e then the input images a and the encoded ground truth images that is the latent vector z are passed into the generator that is this g over here which produces the output image or the fake image uh, that is represented by b hat that is the generator attempts to map the input images a along with a sampled z back into the original image b so overall the flow in the cva gan part is uh, from b we start with b uh, then we move to these latent vector z and then finally to b hat that is a fake a fake generated images from the b domain and now the second part of bicycle gan that is clr gan and here a randomly drawn latent vector along with input image a is 
passed to the generator G and the generator then produces these B hat fake images and uh, these B hat may not look like the ground truth image B but it should look realistic then the generated output that is B hat is passed through to the encoder E and the encoder tries to regain the latent vector that is Z from these output images so the overall flow in CLR GAN is we start with Z then move to B hat and then finally finally try to get Z back again the objective function of bicycle GAN is a combination of CVAE GAN and CLR GAN objectives and they actually detail all the equation for the loss function down here in the paper uh, yeah right here so the first part of the overall loss is the uh, CVAE GAN loss and the equation for that is this one I have put a red border around it and there are three parts three parts to this loss the first one here is the uh, GAN loss or the VAE GAN loss the second part is my L1 loss and the third part is the KL divergence loss and uh, uh, these two pa parameter that is lambda and lambda KL they are hyperparameters that we need to set during our training so that was the first part of the loss and now moving to the second part of the loss that is which comes from and the conditional latent regressor GAN or CLR GAN and the equation of that one is given here uh, here so uh, this equation has two part to the loss the L GAN loss and also the loss for the latent vector and uh, this will all become much more clear when we implement this in a moment and then from these two losses we have our final uh, hybrid loss that is a total loss for our bicycle GAN and that's just the just the addition of those two different losses and this is that final equation uh, of my bicycle GAN loss so that was a loss and just one more important point from the paper which is about the network architecture details for generator they use UNET which contains an encoder decoder architecture with symmetric skip connection and for discriminator we use patch GAN this is exactly the same that we used in cycle GAN paper as well there as well we used uh, 70 by 70 patch GAN so here what they are saying is that uh, we use uh, two patch GAN discriminators at different scales which aims to predict real versus fake for 70 by 70 and 140 by 140 overlapping image patches all right with that introduction about the architecture let's start the actual implementation so uh, first i'm just importing all the standard imports connecting my google drive and then declaring all my hyperparameters the uh, and what are my hyperparameters they are epoch uh, num total number of epoch batch size i'm keeping at eight uh, and then learning rate 0 0.002 uh, then number of CPU 8 you can of course change this uh, image size I'm uh, keeping at 128 and uh, one important thing to note is that here I will be uh, using for the data set the UC Berkeley cycle GAN data set called maps so obviously I will give this link of this data set in the description but if you do a quick Google search you will find it very easily because it's a very popular data set and it actually comes under these uh, pix to pix uh, data set of uh, ucberkeley.edu uh, so this is the data set that I'm talking about maps.tart.zz and it's 239 MB around and in that data set all the data are uh, of 1200 by 600 uh, that is width and height respectively but here for this uh, particular video i will uh, transform all the images to be of 128 by 128 and that's why i have a hyperparameter here called image size uh, number of channels will be three latent dim uh, this is one hyperparameter uh, which will be required to create our z vector uh, which will be passed to the clr gan as the input uh, input randomly generated vector uh, so that number i'm keeping at eight uh, and number of critic five i don't think i need this here uh, this mainly comes from cycle gan uh, yeah i think i can delete that we'll see that about 
uh, in a second and uh, then these are my hyperparameters uh, as mentioned in the paper lambda kl then i also need lambda pixel uh, all right again sample interval uh, this is only required for visualizing or plotting my uh, epochs training and i'm keeping all my data set in my google drive hence uh, this image root folder is referring to my google drive uh, folder directory and then next cell has a uh, image data set uh, class uh, which will do its normal job that is it will uh, fetch the images to be passed to my uh, data loader so this get item method actually implements that uh, job of getting the images by index now couple of uh, standard things i am doing here within the get item the first one is for getting the image by index i am making use of this little uh, code here using the modulo operator of python that is this percentage symbol here so what basically it will do is a modulo b means a divided by b and then the remainder of that division is returned but in this case for example my index say for example it's five and i have 100 images so five modulo 100 will return you the five and why i'm doing this my actual target is to find the indexed item in the list based on the length of the variable in the list that is i just don't want to get the i could have directly put the index on the files list but in that case if my index number is more than the length of the file that would create problem that will generate an error so uh, i had to find some way so that the index number the index item is returned based on the length of the file and if my index number is more than the length of the file none will be returned so that's why i'm making use of this and then in this uh, block i'm just uh, taking my original uh, the width and height of the image and then cropping the image to make image e and image b uh, sorry image a and image b and uh, the crop function takes uh, four coordinates as the argument so those coordinates are the images left corner upper corner right corner and lower corner and that's what i'm passing here so for my image a i'm taking 0 0 then w by 2 and h for image b um the taking from w by 2 and then 0 w h that is which and they represent this is left this is upper this is this is right and this is the lower corner and in this part of the code i am only implementing a horizontal flipping of images based on a randomly generated probability and the probability is determined from this line if np.random.random is less than 0 5 then horizontally flip image a and image b and for that horizontal flipping i could have used uh, some augmentation uh, tools uh, both in the image module or maybe opencv but i am making use the most simple the most um, uh, from scratch implementation of horizontal flipping that is i'm flipping these width dimension of the image so these notation slice slice minus one what this will do is all item in this dimension will be returned will be reversed so uh, basically if you have a list a and you want to reverse all the item in the list a you just do this that a then within the uh, square bracket you pass a slice slice minus one and that what that will return is all items in the array reversed and here in these two lines i am doing the exactly same thing but i am just doing only for this middle dimension and in this case the middle dimension represent my width of the images and then finally i'm just applying the transforms on both image a and image b and then returning a dict uh, with which has a key of a and b and this transform will come from my uh, arguments to my image dataset class and they and this transform we will define in the later in the later cells 
uh, and also one point to uh, note here i have put that in the comment here indeed that why i did this horizontal flipping is because uh, similar horizontal flipping was actually implemented in the official pytorch cycle gan uh, uh, repository here in this link uh, with this kind of code that there they had a, a flip method which will apply a transform uh, which is image dot flip left to right so that's pretty much what i'm doing but i'm doing it from scratch and then in the next cell i just have a couple of two super small methods uh, utility methods to uh, help in my plotting uh, th these methods are kind of obvious and uh, uh, also the same kind of methods I have used in all my previous GAN videos so I have explained them in detail over there so you can just have a quick look basically it's just uh, nothing uh, the IM show just takes an uh, image tensor uh, then transpose that image tensor to be compatible with matplotlib with these um, with this line of code and then just uh, plotting that image with plt.show that's all and visualize output as well it takes a path and the x and y and plots the image and this visualize output we will use uh, while i am going to plot during the uh, training loop uh, oh another quick point on this im show method that why i am doing this uh, uh, particular thing image by 2 plus 0 0.5 because it's actually denormalizing so i put the notes here again that is um, uh, and i have taken these uh, guidance from the pytorch uh, uh, forum indeed that uh, during normalization you do z equal to x minus mean divided by sigma and now you have to reverse this process so when you reverse it your x will become z into sigma plus mean and that's what i'm doing here and then my actual data loaders uh, again very standard uh, pipeline of uh, workflow that you will see in all my previous gan videos or for example any pytorch projects for that matter with the uh, image data set so this is my transform that very simple resize two tensor and normalize only these three transforms i'm applying on the images then this is my actual data loader uh, and i'm making use of the data loader module of pytorch and then i'm invoking within data loader this image data set class that we have previously defined that only takes the image root folder and the mode whether you are in the training mode or test mode and the transform and also batch size shuffle number of workers etc uh, very simple so that will uh, give me my train data loader and that's exactly what i need for my entire training the next cell here is just a little visualization code when you run this you will see some uh, images uh, plotted properly here uh, from the training data set and now from here the actual uh, network implementation starts so uh, first this method wait init norm uh, here i'm just initializing uh, i'm just mentioning the strategy to initialize my weights based on whether it's a conf layer or batch norm 2d layer and then uh, we have to implement unit both unit down and unit up uh, because as per the paper uh, they say that for generator we use unit which contains an encoder decoder architecture with symmetric skip connection in the encoder the size of the image gradually reduces while the depth gradually increases so that's what this unit down is doing so unit down is that encoder part and um, here uh, the depth will gradually increase and um, uh, so the depth increase means is out size this is this actually represents my uh, output channels number of output channels in my conf 2d that will gradually increase otherwise uh, this is a very simple neural network structure that is very much what i'm doing i'm just declaring these layers uh, which is a nn.conf 2d in size and out size actually represent the number of input channels a number of output channels three is my kernel size stride is equal to two padding one bias false and then uh, depending on whether this normalize is true i am adding batch norm 2d else i am not adding that uh, and after the batch norm 2d i am only adding this leaky relu and uh, then that's it uh, finally, uh, the self dot model is just this entire nn dot sequential, and to 
to that i'm passing these layers and the forward function just takes this input variable x passes that through the model and that's my return that is the model output now note that uh, in unit it's a fully convolutional neural network that is only contains convolution layers and does not contain any dense layer uh, and that's the reason unit can accept images of any size and then the unit up part which is a decoder part and here the image gradually increases and the depth gradually decreases depth again means uh, uh, that is the out size so here again i will be uh, the first layer will be up sample and i'm up sampling by a scaling factor of two uh, because this is uh, this is where I have to gradually increase um, uh, uh, increase the image size and decrease the depth. Uh, so this upsampling is very much required. And then conf 2D in size out size that is input channel output channels. Otherwise everything remains same. And finally batch norm 2D and ReLU. And forward function uh, takes the input x and skip input and uh, then uh, uh, takes the input uh, input x through the network and finally it concatenates x and the skip input uh, and return that value sorry and then the all important generator uh, network of my bicycle GAN it starts with uh, these uh, fully connected layer uh, self.fc that's a linear layer and it takes the in features as my latent dim because the generator in bicycle GAN will be fed uh, both the actual input images and also the latent dim the z vector so uh, the linear layer is actually representing that that, that is uh, in features latent dim and then it also takes the uh, height and width of my image shape and this image shape is my original input image and here we already have made the height and width to be 128 and then this next block is just the repeated invocation of unit down and unit up so for the entire encoder part uh, I am invoking unit down where my depth gradually increases and the image size decreases and then unit up block where the depth gradually decreases and the, in, the image size actually increases and then the final layer is just an up sample and also another conf 2d so i have got uh, three blocks kind of uh, three blocks or uh, you can say that is uh, uh, the fc all these uh, unit and then the final layer and the forward function or the forward method will just uh, implement all these structures so it will start with self.fc that will take my z uh, and that will be reshaped properly that is uh, z will be reshaped to z dot size zero then one self dot h self dot w uh, h and w here is 128 by 128 and then the first invocation of the encoding part uh, with with my unit down is uh, uh, this line but note here that here i am implementing torch dot cat because i have to concatenate two vectors which is and the first one is uh, image vector x and also the z vector that is the noise vector uh, uh, which will be concatenated and passed to my first unit down and then all these is just the repeated invocation of the of those that is the output of the previous layer goes as an input to the next layer and so on and then the u6 becomes my final output from the entire unit implementation and that u6 goes to the final layer and that's my output from the generator network so uh, that's my generator and then my uh, very important part of bicycle gan which is encoder and the encoder will mainly require for uh, calculating these mean and log var which will be required for implementing this re-parameterization trick that is normally used in VAE. So, uh, if we go back to the paper, 
uh they in the implementation details they say that uh, for the encoder e we experiment with two networks one is ecnn uh, which is a cnn with few convolution and downsampling layers and two e resnet which is a classifier with several residual blocks so i am going with this resnet uh, for uh, for doing my uh, encoder architecture and just remember going back to the original uh, architecture image uh, where that encoder is needed uh, so this is the uh, architecture this part is for the cvae gan and this part for clr gan so under the cvae gan we use encoder to uh, here and uh, then uh, the encoder takes this uh, actually produces these uh, z vector and also for the CLR GAN after B hat is produced, that is the fake image is produced from the generator, then we take take that fake images through the encoder to get back my Z vector. So uh, this is where the encoder is needed. So let's uh, go back to our code. And I will talk about this uh, very important topic in VAE, which is reparameterization trick, where we have to uh, modify the Z vector uh, so that the back propagation can continue with stochastically generated Z vector in a in a moment. But let's just go through this quickly through this encoder uh, method, and then uh, uh, in a second we'll talk about the reparameterization trick. So uh, the encoder, the init function, uh, I have these uh, pre-trained model ResNet 18, which is uh, which I brought in from Torch Vision, and um, from these uh, pre-trained model, I have to exclude the last three layers. So let's check what are the layers I have in my ResNet 18 pre-trained model. So I'm just going to a, a new Jupyter notebook and pasting this code. Uh, it will just print the various child uh, and with the child counter and uh, variable all the different child children that ResNet 18 model has. Let's run this cell and I have these uh, starting from child 0 up to child 9. And now I am going to see, check out what are these uh, children actually. So first uh, let's just check out with this code the last uh, last one child indeed so I'm just uh, making use of the slice notation with minus one and then slice that will just bring me the last item from the from a list let's run this and I'm getting the last layer as a linear layer with in features 512 out features 1000 let's check out the last two layers and now I have the adaptive average pool 2d I also I uh, want to exclude both of them let's check out last three layers all right, so now I have a uh, batch norm to the relu conf to the uh, and then my adaptive average and linear layer. So uh, I want to exclude these last three layers. Uh, and um, so in this line, what I'm doing is uh, I'm bringing in the slice notation before the minus three, uh, which will include everything except the last three items in the array. And uh, here uh, my array means uh, the whole list of all the layers. And that's why I'm using this list method here. And after extracting all the layers except the last three layers, then I am only adding uh, average pool 2D after this in this line. And then I uh, from this network, I need to from the last two layers of these encoder network, I will define my uh, mean and the log var variable so uh, that's how i'm defining it that is uh, output is mu and log var for reparameterization trick used in the vae and uh, both the mu and the log var is assigned the same value which is encoders last layer output and the forward function is just implementing this network structure that is uh, a feature ex to the feature extractor object i'm passing the input image then the output uh, from that goes to the input from my pooling layer then i reshape it with view and um, uh, so my, my final mu and log var becomes um, this final output and that's what i'm returning from the forward function which will 
actually become the return value from the entire encoder block and that's what i'm going to use to uh, calculate my reparameterization uh, numbers and then my discriminator block and uh, i'm naming these multi discriminator because it will be used uh, as a discriminator for the for the different parts of my bicycle GAN architecture that is both for the VAE GAN and also for the CLR GAN and uh, uh, this is pretty easy I'm just first defining a discriminator block which will uh, add a conf 2D to a layer and depending on whether the normalized argument is true or false it will also add a batch norm 2D and uh, a leaky ReLU at the end uh, so this discriminator block is invoked multiple times to build the entire network of my discriminator uh, through these uh, looping methodology here uh, uh, so where i'm looping over a range of three and for each time i am adding an n dot sequential with the discriminator block and the channel numbers the uh, input channel and output channel is defined as below and you can see that the output channel goes on increasing uh, to be ultimately 512 uh, here and uh, uh, okay, and within the discriminator class, I also have these compute loss. It is just a single simple MSC loss calculation between the ground truth and the uh, predicted output uh, uh, variable. And finally, the forward forward method in the discriminator class just takes the uh, input X, uh, takes that input X through the entire um, uh, entire network of discriminator and, and finally gives the output from that. Oh, another quick thing that I uh, added these um, uh, nn.average pool 2D to downsample my input. Uh, so, few points to note here in the discriminator that uh, this module list, uh, uh, this nn.module list, it is just like a Python list. It was designed to store any desired number of nn.modules. It may be useful, for instance, if you uh, want to design a neural network where where the number of layer is passed as an input and that's what i'm doing here note that uh, here when i'm passing an dot sequential uh, the discriminator block then i'm using this asterisk and what this means is that the i'm not passing the list of uh, the discriminator block directly to the nn dot sequential but rather the content of the discriminator block layers is passed and that's why I'm doing these uh, nn dot sequential and then an asterisk and then my discriminator block instead of uh, instead of without the asterisk. And uh, here in this line, self dot models equal to n dot module list. Uh, you can ask that uh, why not if module list is just like a Python list, then why not instead use a normal Python list? And the answer is that if you use a plain Python list, the parameters won't be registered properly. And in that case, you cannot pass them to your optimizer using models dot parameters. And because I use this nn.module list, which is just like a list, note how I, I have to use uh, uh, these list element from the module list within my forward function. So here, basically, I am running a loop through each of the layers within my models. And then uh, I am passing to that model layer, these input variable x. And that gets appended to my outputs array or output list. And finally, from the forward function, these outputs array is uh, being returned. So here in this line, it's the most important one that to each element of the outputs array, I'm passing the output of these specific layers uh, output. And what are these specific layers? This is each of these discriminator block. And uh, also note uh, that in the compute loss method, how I have to use uh, uh, these uh, forward function. So I have I have to do self dot forward x. All right. So both my generator, discriminator, and encoder is defined, and now I am almost ready to do the training. So in the next cell, I am just uh, initializing the model, the buffers and um, and uh, uh, dvae and the dlr so here uh, generator and encoder object to that i'm passing uh, uh, the latent dim uh, 
to both of them and latent dim comes from the hyperparameter and uh, input shape is just the input shape of my input image which is uh, hp.channels which is three because it's all our, all our color images then hp.image size and image size and we set this image size to be 128 and then I am passing all these variables to my CUDA to use GPU and also initializing weights with the apply method. So for each of my generator and then the discriminator for the VAE part and the discriminator for the CLR part, I am making use of the apply method to initiate my uh, weights uh, initially. And then uh, this cell next is a simple utility function. So this method will basically work on the validation set and it will take a sample of images from the validation set, generate a fake images and then uh, returns a path of the fake images to be later uh, plotted. So this entire sample image method will just be uh, implemented to visualize after my training is done or rather during the training of epochs so that I can continuously see the uh, how my uh, how my training is working on the validation set so uh, this path variable you have to define and it can here i'm defining it to be like this because i'm running this in google colab and the content directory is the default path uh, in your session collab session um, and then i'm just uh, uh, taking images with this line from my validation data loader uh, so this next and iteration will continuously uh, give me the next and next and next batches when this loop will run and uh, then I'm creating this fake B images by passing the real A and the sample Z to my generator and then these fake images are horizontally concatenated and uh, then the concatenated images are saved with the save image method of torch vision uh, the save image just saves a given tensor into an image file and then finally i'm returning the path from this method and this path will be passed to another method that we have defined earlier called a visualize image or something like that and then visualize image will just plot or show uh, the images in this path so that's how it will work and then in the next cell i am just initializing all my optimizers that is uh, a one for the encoder one for the generator then one for the discriminator vae and another one for the discriminator lr and um, uh, declaring or initializing this tensor variable to be uh, to use my cuda if that's available all right now the very important part in a vae called the reparameterization trick and the reparameterization trick is about uh, modifying my stochastically generated z vector uh, by learning two additional vector mu and sigma and then the modified z vector will be defined by these expression that is the new modified z is equal to mu plus epsilon multiplied by sigma and here epsilon is a very small number which is sampled from a normal distribution n01 that is a normal distribution with 0 and 1 as a mean and standard deviation respectively and this uh, multiplication symbol here uh, actually uh, actually expresses the element twice product between epsilon and sigma so if an input data point is to be mapped into a latent variable z via sampling it has to follow these equation that is a modified z equal to z mean plus epsilon into std and here the standard deviation is defined as torch dot exp and then within bracket the log variance of z divided by two so we'll, co we'll uh, come to this expression in a second so basically uh, the these uh, reparameterization trick for z has two mathematical expression one is what we just saw z equal to z mean plus epsilon into std and another one that you will see in many papers is um, this expression z equal to mu plus epsilon into e to the power 0 0.5 into log var actually they are just the same because if you simplify simplify this part that is equal to 0 0.5 log variance that will become e 
log then variance to the power 0 0.5 which will become variance 0 0.5 and that's my sigma so basically uh, this expression and the first expression that we saw initially that is the z equal to z min plus epsilon into std both are just the same and on the elements of these uh, uh, of this reparameterization equation both mu and log var is coming from the encoder's latent space and also uh, we learn the log of the variance instead of just a variance because the variance of a random variable is uh, constrained to be positive that is uh, this term uh, var needs to be positive only and so if we if we were to try to learn only the variance and not the log of the variance we would have to constrain somehow the output of the neural network to be positive which may not be always the case so a simple way to go around this problem was to learn the logarithm instead of the variance thereby uh, we are no more constrained to be the output to be to be a positive number always and also why don't we learn uh, uh, the log of the standard deviation directly why do we take the square that is why do we take the uh, variance that's because it doesn't mathematically really doesn't make any difference because log of a uh, log of a square term is just the two log of that term so what i'm meaning is this that is um, uh, log of sigma square equal to 2 log sigma so learning one is as easy as learning the other and normally just by uh, practice in most mathematical paper most machine learning paper we use variance in this kind of situation and uh, the fundamental question that why do we need reparameterization at all that's because to implement encoder and decoder in a neural network we need to back propagate through random sampling and that is a problem because backpropagation cannot flow through random node and z here is my random node or it is generated randomly or stochastically so to overcome this problem we modify z with the reparameterization trick so uh, overall the, the this term epsilon allows the mean and log variance vectors to still remain as the learnable parameter of the network while still maintaining the stochasticity of the overall system all right that's uh, all the theories behind reparameterization and now the uh, simple function to implement it so this is my method uh, that will take the z mean and z log var as argument and this will give me the uh, modified z after applying the uh, reparameterization so all i'm doing my std is just torch.exp z log var by 2 that's following this uh, this equation uh, here that we discussed and then i create a sample z from np.random.normal uh, from a normal distribution which has a mean of 0 and std of 1 and this just uh, mentioned the shape of the normal di uh, normal distribution and then my uh, modified z will just become z mean which comes from the argument plus sampled z into std and std is my log var by 2 uh, that is e to the power log var by 2 and that's my uh, modified z is a return value from my reparameterization and now we will see the use of these during the training but let's now move forward for the training and here starts my training and just like all GAN training and all my previous videos on GAN we have two loops here the outer loop is for each epoch and the inner loop is for is where all the actual work will go on and this inner loop will start with this line where I am fetching batch by batch data from my train data loader and uh, so uh, th this is just my model input from my train data loader real a and real b remember my train data loader returns actually a dict where the keys are a and b uh, all right so now first my generator uh, train the generator and the encoder and if we go back to our original paper we remember uh, training generator the training cvae gan starts with this part where where the main difference with a normal GAN is that instead of paired generator and discriminator, here in bicycle GAN, the model uses generator and VAE encoder. So this E is my VAE encoder. Uh, 
and g is my generator and again uh, from this figure we can see that a and b are images in two different sets and in cvae gan it first encodes a ground truth image b into the latent space using encoder e then input image a and encoded ground truth images that is the latent vector z are passed into the generator g which produces the output image b hat that is the generator attempts to map the input image a along with the sampled z vector back into the original image b so let's implement that in our code so uh, in my cva again first uh, this is the standard step zero grad i am making both the optimizer uh, cleaning up the slate uh, and then uh, i am uh, bringing in my encoder and passing it real b which will give me mu and log var and then uh, that now that i have ha i have the mu and log var i can uh, pass them to the reparameterization function to generate my encoded z and then my fake b will just be that is uh, the real a and this encoded z is passed to the generator function that produces fake b that is in this image to the generator i give both the encoded z vector and also the real a to produce b and now that i have the fake b and also my real b i can calculate one part of the loss of bicycle gan which is um, this line uh, this is an L1 loss between fake B and real B. And if I go back to the paper, uh, the loss section, uh, so under the CVAE GAN, uh, so this is a loss or objective function of CVAE GAN. And what I just calculated, this is this L1 loss L1, uh, VAE, uh, G, and E. So that's my L1 loss. And uh, and now i also need to calculate two more losses that it, because uh, our objective function has three elements this is the first one this is a normal va gan loss then the l1 loss and the last part is a kl divergence loss so for my kl divergence loss i am uh, doing that in this line uh, which is 0 0.5 into torch dot sum then within the braces torch dot e exp log var plus mu square minus log var minus one and how i am getting this formula you can check that in this um, uh, in this stack overflow uh, uh, question it explains it very well let's go let's go there so here is that page in stack overflow and the question is how is kl divergence in pytorch code related to the formula so the original formula is this if you go to wikipedia you will see this is how the uh, kl divergence is defined for uh, vae that is variational autoencoders architecture but how come this uh, this formula actually boils down to uh, this one and this is exactly my formula that i have used here they are using taking the minus sign at the very first i do not have that minus sign because i have making the corresponding adjustment within the braces so the reason that the answer gives very beautifully that if you actually simplify these uh, matrix multiplication and all these uh, traces calculation etc then you actually end up with this formula that is uh, the the, uh, the uh, whole kl divergence is equal to half of sigma 1 to k and then within the braces all these elements go sigma i square mu y square minus 1 minus log variance and if you uh, that's exactly what i'm implementing uh, in this formula and that's the kind of way that many repositories which deal with uh, VAE GAN or bicycle GAN or cycle GAN or KL divergence in general have implemented this formula and after these KL divergence loss is calculated the last loss that is still due in my VAE GAN is this first element of the loss function which is a normal uh, GAN loss and that's just my uh, this this line and this is just making use of this compute loss that we have defined within the discriminator class and it's just the mac or mean squared error between model output and scalar ground truth 
all right so there goes there completes my uh, vae gan part and now the next gan part within the generator training is a clr gan or conditional latent regressor gan so coming back to the paper here is the clr gan part so so here in the second component of bicycle gan a randomly drawn latent vector that is nz along with the input image a is provided to the generator the generator outputs b hat may not really look like the original b b but it should look realistic then the generator output is passed through the encoder e and the encoder tries to regain the original latent vector z so here the flow is from z to b hat back to z hence to generate b hat from the z vector first define my sample z so this is my sample z i'm again using np.random and for the size i am this z vector needs to be a 2d two dimensional tensor of batch size and latent dim so the first dimension should be batch size which is 8 in this case and latent dim is also defined to be 8 in the in my hyperparameter at the very top of this notebook so uh, that's what i'm passing in my sample z uh, creation code that is to my np.random.normal uh, real a dot size the the first dimension is zero and that's my batch size and that's eight and hp dot latent dim so if you print uh, the sample z size that is uh, with this line i have commented this out here uh, so that will produce torch dot size eight eight and actually if you print the entire sample z that is with this line again it is commented out it will produce this kind of output so it's uh, this this tensor that you can see here it's a two-dimensional tensor uh, with a size of eight by eight that is uh, total number of rows are eight and total number of uh, columns are also eight and obviously before uh, passing these uh, real a dot size etc i had to check the real a size as well so here in this line that is commented out i actually printed the size of real a and that outputted 8 by 3 by 128 by 128 it's again uh, the format is uh, batch size channel height width all right so now i have sample z i have real a so i can produce my fake b that is this b hat and that's simply this line that is to the generator i pass real a and sample z that will produce fake b and now i can uh, have my loss clr gan that is a loss of the clr gan that's simply dlr dot compute loss to that you pass this fake b that is just generated and the valid vector and remember valid vector we have defined at the very top of the training uh, which is a valid or all one so now i have all the loss components both from my vae gan and also clr gan so i can calculate the total generator losses but let's quickly go back to the paper to check this uh, final formula here to for the hybrid model that is for bicycle GAN total generator loss will be defined by this formula and it is just the addition of the uh, losses uh, for the VAE GAN uh, and the losses for my CLR GAN to that I also have to include these hyperparameter that is lambda lambda latent and lambda KL and which are all uh, defined uh, in my notebook and the very top of the very top where the hyperparameters is defined so this line this line is my uh, total loss for the generator and that's just loss vae gan plus loss clr gan plus lambda pixel multiplied by loss pixel l1 vae and again lambda kl multiplied by loss kl and uh, then my uh, loss is there so i can apply my backward and step to do the back propagation and update the weights and now i also have to uh, do the next part of uh, the clr gan which is uh, uh, this part that is uh, the generated output is passed through the encoder e and the encoder tries to regain the latent vector from the output images that is uh, uh, these b hat will pass through e to output z and that is this part 
and that is to the encoder i passed the fake b that we just uh, created in the previous step where is that uh, yeah fake b uh, that was created in the previous step in the cellar again so this fake b now is passed to the encoder and encoder we will give me what the mu and log var and i put the log var here just as underscore because now i don't need the log var part now but i need the mu part because i have to compare this mu with the actual sample z so in the next line i'm doing just that which is actually my l1 loss uh, that i'm naming it as loss latent and that's just uh, the lambda latent multiplied by mae loss which is actually calculating the l1 loss between mu and sample z sample z is uh, what we created in this line here uh, that is within the clr gan the very first step so this is just uh, so here the encoder where is that uh, encoder is just try to uh, recreate or reconstruct these original sampled z and uh, and obviously there will be a loss and that loss is what we are calculating in this in this line and again after that loss calculation just do the back prop and the step to update the weight and there here my generator training ends and now my discriminator training let's go there first step as always zero grad and training the discriminator in bicycle GAN is rather very easy. It's uh, just two small steps. So here, uh, first I'm uh, calculating the uh, DVAE. Th that is, e in this part, I'm calculating the CVAE GAN's part of the discriminator. So I have DVAE.compute loss. To that, I'm passing real B and valid. And also, I have to do uh, the fake B and fake. Uh, and uh, some both of these discriminator losses that's my dvae loss then do the back prop and step on this and then do the same for my clr gan part and here again start with zero grad and then again i am in this line is the most important line where i'm summing the uh, discriminator lr loss between real b and valid and also between fake b and fake and just summing them and then do back prop and step that's all that pretty much my training ends and the next few lines here is just for logging purpose that's not really part of training it's just for visualizing uh, how my training is improving batch by batch or rather epoch by epoch so basically i am just calculating total batches done till now by multiplying uh, the current epoch with the lane of the train data loader plus the current uh, index and here i'm just printing uh, uh, printing the various uh, components of my training that is loss dva loss dlr all these things and finally here my um, uh, th those uh, utility function that we just discussed some time back that is uh, sample images will return me the path of the created images from my validation data set and then visualize output will just visualize or plot those uh, samples that is both the original validation data set and the corresponding generated data set for the validation part uh, and plot it uh, in my notebook so i this is i think this plot is it's it's running after only one epoch and after running quite a few epochs i think 20 or so i was from uh, beginning to get some uh, realistic looking images from the data set and these were my those those output and again a uh, point to remember on the data set that this data set that we have used in this notebook is this maps.tar.zz it's a very famous one from uc berkeley and uh, that was used famously in the pix to pix data set and uh, the and the actual data set is something like this so i have two folders in the data set train and validation and uh, the the train folder has i think 1097 number of images and validation has uh, 1098 and each of the data is like this so the data set comprised of satellite images of new york and their corresponding google map pages the image translation problem involves converting satellite photos to google map format or the reverse that is google map images to satellite photos and all the images have a digital file name and they are in jpeg format each image is 1200 pixel width and 600 pixel height 
and contains both the satellite image on the left and the google maps image on the right and that pretty much wraps up this video the github link is in the description that pretty much wraps up this video and the github link is in the description hey everyone so in continuation of my gan series today in this video i will implement conditional gan from scratch with pytorch so first what is a regular gan architecture this is a representation you pass a noise vector to the generator and that produce a fake image represented by g of z and that fake image is uh, transferred to discriminator as input and the discriminator also gets the real images to it and then it produces real or fake 0 1 so the discriminator is a binary classifier that produces real or fake so now here in this regular architecture of GAN suppose you train a GAN on handwritten digit and you normally cannot control what specific images the generator will produce in other words there is no way you can request a particular digit from the generator so a regular GAN is trained in a completely unsupervised and unconditional fashion meaning the no labels involved in the training process so though the GAN model is capable of generating new realistic samples for a particular data set we have zero control over the type of images that are generated but what if instead of a random image generation i want to generate a particular image say in the case of mnist i want to generate only seven can i do it in regular gan no we don't have control on that because we are not feeding the generator or the discriminator model any label information and this is where c gan or conditional gan comes in as we can add an additional input layer of one hot encoded image labels this additional layer guides the generator in terms of which image to produce so in this slide we see the architecture of conditional gan the generator and the discriminator so looking at the generator architecture uh, this uses the noise vector z and the label y to synthesize a fake example so uh, uh, this here is the output after z and y goes to the generator and uh, this notation here is you can uh, read it as x given the condition y and y what is the condition y this is that label vector so the generator is parameterized to learn and produce realistic samples for each label in the training data set and looking at the discriminator architecture at the bottom right corner here it receives both the real images and real labels and also the fake images with the corresponding labels that was used to generate them and remember here discriminator always is working with this pair that is it's always looking at x and y together both the real x with the corresponding labels and also the fake fake images with the corresponding y so uh, on the real examples and uh, label pairs that is x y the discriminator learns how to recognize real data and how to recognize matching pairs on the generator produced image set that is this x hat with corresponding layer the discriminator learns to recognize fake images and fake label pairs thereby learning to tell them apart from the real ones and finally the discriminator outputs a single probability indicating its conviction that the input is a real matching pair so overall the discriminator's goal is to learn to reject all the fake examples and all examples that fail to match their label while accepting all real example level pairs and uh, one thing to note here that uh, for each fake example the same label y is passed to both the generator and also the discriminator and here are some important rules uh, that the discriminator of a cgan should follow uh, let's say i have uh, uh, passed to the discriminator a handwritten numerical image 3 and with that also the label 4 so basically i have passed to the discriminator an image 3 with label 4 
so in this case the cgan discriminator should learn to reject this pair regardless of whether the example that is this handwritten numerical image 3 is real or fake that's because the image and the label does not match that is the image is 3 and the label is 4 so this is an obvious case for the discriminator should, uh, should reject this image even if this image is uh, real and then the next rule is that the discriminator should also reject all image label pairs in which the image is fake even if the label matches the image that is if the discriminator is passed the same in Im same image and label that is image 3 and label 3 but it should get rejected if the image is fake and with that introduction on the architecture of conditional GAN let's start the actual implementation so I am back in my VS code and the main point is that overall uh, project structure for C GAN is very similar to DC GAN or a normal GAN only difference is that I have to include the uh, the la the labels of my input image as a vector to the generator and also to the discriminator and what that means is that or for example let's say MNIST is my data set uh, so in MNIST I have the Y vector that is a target labels is a number from 0 to 9 so what I do is I uh, create a label vector Y by creating a uniform distribution to generate a number uh, from 0 to 9 then I encode this value into a one hot vector and that means uh, for example the number 3 will be represented as this 0 0 0 then 1 this represents a number 3 in one hot encoded vector and also the rest are all zeros similarly if the number was 4 then this place will contain 0 and the next place will be 1 and I feed these uh, one hot encoded vector and the noise Z to the generator to create an image that resembles number three. That's a whole uh, job of generator. And for the discriminator, I add the supposed label of three as one hot vector along with the image input. And for the image input, discriminator will take just as usual both um, uh, fake images and also the real images and ultimately decides between them so now coming back to my project implementation uh, just as uh, just like my other videos uh, implementing the other GANs I have three files the first one is the actual network implementation of C GAN which is um, I'm calling conditional GAN.py I have a train file and also I have a small util files that will have couple of utilities method so starting with the conditional GAN uh, I will rather go over these uh, structure rather quickly because um, it's uh, uh, these generator and discriminator is not too different from a normal DC GAN uh, in here. So uh, the key thing in generator is that I have a sequential uh, block defined under my uh, this method generator block. Uh, so that's that method will actually implement. Uh, a network of a uh, conf transpose 2d and that will be repeated in my generator network so this generator block is like a utility method inside my generator class that will be invoked repeatedly to build the generator block and this is the exact uh, kind of workflow that i have used in my other gan implementation in the other videos so if you have watched them you will be familiar with this so what this generator block is taking is input channel which is uh, how many channels the input feature representation has then output channel which represents how many channels the output feature representation should have and kernel size strides are obvious and final layer is just a boolean it will take true or false so uh, first if it, it is not a final layer then i am just doing these three things that is a conf transpose 2d a batch norm 2d and a relu and uh, if it's a final layer then i do not need the relu and batch norm instead i have a single conf transpose 2d and tan age and then i am invoking this generator block uh, in here to build my this dot gen sequential network 
and remember this generator block is implementing conf transpose 2d so that means i have to down sample while moving forward through the network and that's what i'm doing here so first uh, while i'm implementing generator block it's taking the input dim coming from the uh, argument which is by default will take 10 uh, because this is mnist and then the hidden dim that is output channels of my generator block that starts with four that is hidden dim multiplied by four then in the next layer hidden dim multiplied by two it's get down sampled by half and then in the third hidden dim multiplied on sorry only hidden dim it's again halved again here because the down sampling is going on and then in the last block that is a final layer my uh, second argument to this generator block that is output channel will become my image channel and because in this case in this for, for this video i'll be using mnis data set this needs to be one because it's a grayscale data set and that's what i am defining my image channel as well in the in the argument and kernel size remains four across the network uh, and obviously in the final layer you will place final layer equal to true and then the forward function of my generator class is just this super simple it just uh, the forward function takes a noise vector and then reshapes this noise vector with the view method uh, to be compatible with the the four dimensional tensor that pytorch expects so the first one is batch size then uh, channel number height and width and for for defining my height i do it i am passing i'm creating this new two uh, dummy dimension here with one and one uh, so that these x becomes a four dimensional tensor that can be feeded into my generator network that is at the very start starting layer over here and the next line of this forward function is just doing that that's it's feeding these uh, noise vector after reshaping to my generator network and the output of this generator network will be the return value from my forward function so that completes my generator network and then uh, i have a very very small utility method here just to create a noise vector uh, and this is again the, the same kind of uh, method i have used in my other gan videos it just with the uh, it just uh, creates a uh, simple noise vector with torch.randn and as an input it takes number of samples and input dim so this will create um, a tensor with uh, the first dimension of that will be n samples and input dim and uh, the usage of this function is mainly done in my train.py file where within my generator training i'm creating this fake noise you can see here uh, so fake noise is create noise vector to that I'm passing the current batch size and Z dim and Z dim is uh, my hyperparameter that will be defined at the very top to be let's see yeah Z dim is 64. So anyway that uh, that method will just create the very first uh, vector to be fed into the uh, generator and uh, all right now let's come to my discriminator network uh, here again i have these little utility function uh, discriminator block that will just create a single block and then this uh, method will be invoked again and again to create my network that is a discriminator network and what this function here is doing is again uh, if the final layer if this is not a final layer it will apply conf 2d batch norm 2d and leaky relu and otherwise that for the final discriminator layer it will just implement a single conf 2d otherwise the the arguments remains just the same just like what we did in generator and then for the implementation of this discriminator block method here is my network so uh, it just uh, invoking these discriminator block method three times uh, this is the first layer uh, and uh, remember here it's a conf 2d that means i have to up sample uh, while i am moving forward through the network and um, that's what i'm doing in the uh, in the invocation here that is for the first layer my hidden dim is output channel to my discriminator block function then in the next layer i'm multiplying hidden dim by two to and that's my output channels for the next layer and then the final layer 
my output channel needs to be one and that's what that's why you are seeing here and why one because this is mnist where the channel number is one and then let's quickly see what are the methods that utils file has uh, so the first one is again that i have used in many other uh, again that is it, uh, it this method just plots the images uh, in matplotlib given a tensor and uh, only key thing to remember in this function is that you have to convert the tensor shape from a pytorch tensor to uh, something which is acceptable to matplotlib and that's what i'm doing in here that is uh, uh, once i get the tensor uh, then first i am detaching it that is removing the uh, gradient tree from the tensor and then make use of make grid to make a grid of the tensor and uh, then i am uh, passing this uh, image grid to my plt.im show that is to matplotlib but inside the im show argument i am converting the shape with a permute from uh, to one to zero that means uh, the reason i'm doing this i have put that in detail in the comment that uh, the image in a tensor in pytorch is acceptable in the form of channel number height width whereas in matplotlib the expected image uh, shape should be height width and then channel number uh, and that's why i have to convert these uh, uh, so here in the permute this one actually represent my height which is coming from 10 uh, pytorch to represent my width and zero represent channel because in pytorch the zero eight that is the first index that is the first dimension represent the channel but it comes as a last dimension in i in uh, matplotlib and that's why i'm using uh, this permute okay let's move on uh, then i have these wet init method again this is this method i have used in my other gan videos as well it just creates the weights depending on what kind of conf layer it is that is um, if my current uh, object is an instance of conf 2d or conf transpose 2d then this is my weights and i'm just defining the mean and variance here and if my current layer is a batch norm 2d then uh, this is my weights and also this is my bias uh, that's uh, just initializes the weights now here i have couple of methods to deal with uh, which is specifically about uh, conditional gan that is i have to given a label vector containing one two three four five six uh, seven eight nine zero i have to convert that to a one hot encoded vector because that will be uh, that will be concatenated with my image to get a final vector that will be fed into the generator so this little function a single method is just producing that one hot encoded version of my labels it's very simple just a single liner that is f dot one hot so one hot is coming from the module uh, of pytorch and what is f f is just my torch dot nn dot functional that has this one hot encoded vector inbuilt to that you just pass the label vector and also how many classes you want to have in the you want to have in this level so because uh, in my mnis data set is a number of classes is 10 so i'll be passing 10 as a num classes and the way this one hot vector uh, works is uh, i have put that in this comment that is if you pass for example 43210 as your uh, labels and then number of classes is pass you pass 6 then uh, after doing f dot one hot your x vector that is original was this tensor that will be converted into this form so you can see the first element of my original input tensor is 4 and here after the one hot encoded conversion this 4 is this place that is 0 1 2 3 4 because this 4 is represented by this one number one here in the encoded version then the next element is 3 and so that will take the third place uh, the threeth index place in my output tensor of the one hot encoded vector that is zero zero the zero one two three this is the third place three index similarly uh, let's say the last element this one is zero that will that means for the 
one hot encoded version it will take the zeroth index which is one so that's why you see one here so this is pretty much how it works so in my case the original input will be one two three four up to ten and then the number of classes will be ten and then i have these uh, little method concat vectors what it will do it will it will just concatenate to float tensor and return me the combined concatenated vector and why i need is this because if i go back to the slide the architecture of cgan so in the generator in cgan it doesn't only take the normal the regular z vector that is a noise vector it also takes a label vector so that concat uh, concat method of my uh, architecture here that is concat vector will actually concatenate these z noise vector and the label vector and then pass the concatenated vector as an input to the generator just one more thing on this torch.cat uh, uh, usage that uh, to concatenate with torch.cat where the list of tensors are concatenated across the specified dimension requires two conditions to be satisfied the first condition is that all tensors need to have the same number of dimensions and all dimensions except the one that they are concatenated on need to have the same size. Uh, let's quickly see an example. It will make uh, more sense. Let's say I have uh, my code uh, like this. So I have T1 and T2, two tensors. Both are three dimensional. Uh, that is uh, both of them uh, have same number of dimension. That means the first, uh, the first condition is satisfied that all tensors need to have the same number of dimensions. Now, uh, the second condition is that uh, all dimension except the one that they are concatenated on need to have the same size. That means, uh, say I am concatenating by the dimension of 2, that is this third dimension. Let's see if it runs and prints proper shape. Indeed. So they got concatenated and because I was uh, uh, concatenating them by these, uh, these uh, number two, two index dimension, that means three and three got added. My output is uh, six here. Now let's change this. Uh, uh, let's keep it as it is. Let's change this to zero. That is now my second condition is no more satisfying. That is the second condition. Uh, all dimension except the one that they are concatenated on need to have the same size this is no more the case here because here 32 and 30 let's see if it runs and i got an error as expected runtime error sizes of tensor must match except in dimension 2 and why except because i am concatenating by this dimension so let's uh, revert it back to 32 and let's change this one uh, because i'm concatenating by this dimension and now these two dimensions are, are mismatched. They are not matching. Let's run it. And uh, I got a properly combined concatenated tensor. That's because this is a dimension that I am con concatenating them by. So that means I can have a mismatch in this dimension. And in that case, output will have 3 plus 4, 7 as my output concatenated tensor dimension. So keeping these things in mind is very important while you are doing with uh, large dimensional tensor uh, because uh, making them compatible is extremely important in almost any deep learning projects that you will do. Anyway, coming back to my utils method. And the last util method I need is this um, calculate input dim. So uh, this this will just pretty much gives me the input dimension given my noise vector and the MNIST shape and the number of classes and uh, Z dim that is a noise vector is a hyperparameter that is the dimension of the noise vector is a hyperparameter that I will define in my train file to be uh, I think 64, yes, 64 is a dimension of Z dim. And uh, for um, MNIST shape, this is 1 by 28 by 28. And number of classes is 10 because MNIST has 10 different classes. So let's see uh, what I'm doing in this uh, method. So generator input dimension will be a Z dim plus N classes. And why is that so? Because if I go back to the architecture of generator, I have Z dim plus uh, the y, y vector that is a target classes vector of my MNIST dataset to be combined to be fed into my generator. 
so that's what this line is and then my uh, uh, discriminator image channel will be mnist shape 0 plus number of classes mnist shape 0 will be 28 and n classes is 10 that's because the discriminator does not starts with the noise vector rather it starts with the image vector and the target classes vector and the image vector could be either the re real set of images or the fake set of images generated by the generator so discriminator takes both these images in different parts of the training loop and outputs the probability of it being real or fake and that's why uh, the input to the discriminator will be the mnist shape uh, uh, mnist shape 0 that is 28 and number of classes and this function just returns these generator input dimension and the discriminator input dimension now why do i need or wh where is the usage of this function uh, is because uh, uh, inside the training loop i will be using this concat vectors let's see the uh, usage of this concat vector then we will see why we need this separate function uh, calculate input dim so if i go to my train file the concat vector will be used inside my train yeah so this is the kind of usage in con of concat vectors that will take the fake noise and the one hot labels and concatenate them to be uh, these vector noise and labels that will be fed to the generator to create the fake images so why do i need the this uh, this separate function again that's because what we saw the usage of concat vectors that was inside the training loop but outside the training loop uh, uh, when i am generating or initializing my initial set of where to initialize my optimizer that's when i also need a vector to my generator object uh, that's why i need this function let's see the usage so if i go to my train file again uh no sorry i need only this calculate input dim and i have single usage of that yeah so from the calculate you need input dim i am getting the generator input dim and this generator input dim is passed to my generator class to create my gen object this is where i am initializing a gen object because this gen object i need to pass to my optimizer to initialize my optimizer and um, then to create my first gen object by applying the weight in it a method so that's where that's why i need a initial set of uh, tensor to be uh, to create my gen object and also the same i need for to create my uh, disk that is a discriminator object which will have as input image channel as discriminator image channel that is the output of this calculate input dim all right i think with that uh, i am done with the utils file now the last part which is the train part and uh, again i'm just following the similar uh, structure that i have followed in my other gan videos so the training is not too difficult uh, first i'm just creating all these hyperparameters num number of epochs 200 zdim 64 etc mnist shape in this case i will be using mnist data set that's why this is my shape number of classes 10 all right and batch size i'm keeping at 128 learning rate 0 0.002 so uh, just uh, initially i am uh, creating this transform uh, uh, which will have which will apply the very basic transforms to my mnist data set and also i am making use of this data loader method to create my data loader uh, which will uh, feed the training loop batch by batch data from the mnist and then in these next few lines what we just discussed that is uh, i am initializing my optimizer and also the initial gen object and disk object by feeding the generator class and the discriminator class these initial tensor that is created from this calculate input dim that we just defined in the util function here all right so now my gen and disk object is defined my optimizer gen opt and disk opt is also defined so now uh, let's come down 
and uh, here the actual training starts that is for epoch in range so uh, and before that i'm just uh, defining few variables that i'll be making use of inside the training loop uh, that is current step generator losses discriminator losses this will pretty these two arrays pretty much will keep track of all the generator losses uh, for different epochs and then here starts the most important part which is my training loop and just following the normal workflow for all other gan training i will have two loops the first one is for epoch outer loop and the inside loop is for my where the actual training code will be executed that is uh, it will start with each batch and that's what this line is doing that is from my data loader i will get each batch of data of M from the mnist whole data set and that will have the real images and also the labels vector uh, and then i am creating these uh, passing these real images to the device which is i have defined to be a cuda that is it will use my gpu and then the first variable i'm creating these one hot labels by using this ohe vector from labels that we have defined in the utils file to encode the labels to be one hot encoded and uh, immediately after creating when i'm printing this one hot labels vector this will give me a size of 128 by 10 why 128 because that's my batch size that's the number of sample in each batch and 10 is my uh, number of classes in my that is a number of labels that i have in mnist but because in the next phase of my training i have to convert this two dimensional tensor of one hot vector into a four dimensional tensor because i will be applying concat uh, concatenation with my images and images are four dimensional in pytorch that is uh, batch size channel number height width that's why the first thing i need to do is convert these uh, two dimensional tensor of my one hot encoded labels to be a four dimensional that is what i need is i put that uh, in detail in this comments here actually that is this 128 by 10 need to be converted to these four dimensional tensor 128 10 28 28 because this will be the uh, the shape of my images coming from uh, coming from the mnist uh, so let's do that so for doing that the first thing i am doing uh, i will definitely give the link of this uh, file in the description so you can go through these uh, comments in detail so first thing i'm doing to convert i am making use of this non keyword so uh, so what this non keyword will do it will add some dummy extra dimension to the uh, to the original tensor so uh, one hot labels was my original tensor that i am taking the first two dimension and then i'm appending this to extra dimension and then after adding this non keyword to add dimension if i print these image one hot labels in this next line what i will get is these uh, new tensor which has which has already now become a four dimensional tensor that is we see 128 10 1 1 so these two extra dimension we just added with this none and none keyword but i need this 28 and 28 so now i'll be making use of the repeat method of pytorch that i'm doing in the next line here that is now uh, image one hot labels dot repeat i'm keeping the first two dimension as it is that is i do not need to repeat it that is they will be repeated just once and that's why one and one then this needs to become 28 that is the height of height and width of mnist 28 by 28 so that's what i'm doing here mnist shape one mnist shape two and remember our mnist shape is uh, 1 28 28 1 is the number of channels 28 and 28 are height than width so with this repeat method these two dimension will actually become repeated and finally the shape that it will produce is this that is if i'm just printing these uh, this final uh, variable here in this line and now my torch my size has become 128 10 28 28 exactly what i want it to be because now this is exactly this this exactly matches the images coming from the batches coming from the data loaders
with that all my data preparation is ready and all my data is of correct shape so start the discriminator training from here so uh, let's zoom out a little bit uh, let's uh, show you the overall structure so all these lines are my discriminator training training up to here then i will start my generator training that will go on up to here uh, generator training is relatively easier in uh, cgan uh, so yeah although the discriminator training is long that's because i have put a lot of comments and actually this is uh, not that long really and uh, let's let's just start uh, going through them so as always before starting the training just like in other gan uh, you have to clear out you need a clean slate of gradients that's why you apply zero grad that will zero out the accumulated discriminator gradients create uh, then create a fake noise with create noise vector we define this in util uh, and to that you pass current batch size which is 128 zdm is 64 and then device uh, now i have fake noise so i uh, need to do these two steps you can get the images from the generator steps one combine the noise vector and the one hot labels for the generator and generate the conditioned fake images so uh, i have to concatenate my fake noise with one hot labels with concat vectors that will give me the concatenated noise and labels that i'm passing to my generator and then that will produce my fake images all right so i got my fake images and here's a little unit test uh, this is not important i just made this to uh, check that the length of them matches actually that is a fake length of fake matches length of real that is uh, enough number of fake images has been produced and what is my real remember real is my uh, coming from data loader so when i'm uh, looping through my data loader these two things i'm getting real images and the labels vector so now that i have both the real images and fake images i need to get the predictions from the discriminator and for that the steps are uh, first create the input vector that will be passed to the discriminator and what will be my input vector so for the real image for the fake images i have to combine the fake images with image one hot labels and for the real images i have to combine the real images with image one hot labels remember as we discussed in detail that the discriminator and generator here cannot take only images both of this network here in in conditional gan takes images as well as the label vector and that's what these image one hot labels so uh, we have to combine them and pass to the discriminator so let's do that in the next line uh, that is i'm combining the fake images with the image one hot in uh, image one hot labels with concat vectors uh, that will take fake and image one hot labels again in the next line i'm passing real and image one hot labels so i get both fake image and labels vector and real image and labels vector so i'm all ready to pass these two input vectors to my discriminator in the next next line here uh, next two lines here indeed so that i get the prediction from the discriminator uh, and that's what i'm doing in the next two lines so here these two variables that is that these two outputs actually represent my uh, prediction from the discriminator and these two just again little two uh, unit test lines this is not really important within the training loop but i just made sure that uh, i'm uh, moving forward correctly and i do not later get any get into any problem so i'm just checking the length of disk real prediction and the length of real is same and also i'm making sure that the inputs are different that is torch dot any fake images and labels not equal to real images and labels uh, that is that is what it is supposed to be so now that i have the actual images and also the prediction from the discriminator i can calculate the discriminator loss on fake and reals so these two lines are just doing that that is calculating the loss and i'm making use of this criterion and our criterion was defined to be uh, bce that is binary cross entropy loss with uh, logistic uh, we can check that uh, where did i define yeah so criterion was defined nn.bce with logistic loss 
all right let's uh, come back yeah so uh, these criterion just takes the prediction and also for the fake it 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 uh, calculates the loss between the discriminator fake prediction and all zeros vector that is torch dot zeros like and discriminator fake prediction because uh, these are fake images so they all should actually be zero target and that is a, th their target value should be zero that's what i mean that's why i'm using torch dot zeros like and for the real i am uh, calculating the loss between the prediction and torch dot once like because they are the real images so they should all be once and uh, finally get the average of discriminator loss just dividing them by two all right with after the loss just do the back propagation and updating the weights with dot backward and dot step method respectively very standard step here nothing uh, nothing complex going on and finally because i have to plot all these losses at the end so i need to keep track of these batch losses and this line is just accumulating the batch losses uh, in this vector in this variable discriminator loss okay so with that discriminator loss training sorry discriminator training is done and now i need to do the little generator training this is relatively simpler first step is as usual zero grad then again i'm creating fake images and labels this vector by concatenating fake and image one hot labels and now that my fake image and labels this concatenated vector is ready i can i can pass this as input to my discriminator to uh, get the prediction from the discriminator and then the next line does the generator loss uh, only important point and the difference with the discriminator to note here is this part that is although the generator is creating fake images but here i am using torch dot once once like because uh, look at the difference with the discriminator here for the disk fake loss i used torch dot zeros like because here i'm passing the fake uh, the disc the discriminators prediction from the fake images and because they're fake they all should be zero target value but in the generator training i am passing i am passing those uh, fake image prediction from the fake images and getting the prediction from discriminator and then i'm comparing this predicted vector with torch dot once like because here the discrimin the generator wants to fool the discriminator that is although these are fake images what generator is telling to the discriminator that they are real and that's why i'm comparing with uh, i'm bringing in torch dot once like and after the loss calculation just uh, do the regular back propagation and weight updates with backward and step and the last line of generator training is just to keep track of the uh, generator losses in various batches by appending to these generator losses list because ultimately at the end of the training loop i will need these two uh, variables to plot the graph and uh, yeah that's where my generator training is pretty much over the next part let's uh, zoom out a little bit the next this part is just for logging and plotting uh, no complex things here and exactly the same kind of code i used in my other gans as well that is what i'm very much doing that is for each uh, 50 step this display step is a hyperparameter that's been defined at the very top to be 50 so at at each 50 step i am plotting the uh, generator losses by taking the last 50 losses uh, that's what this uh, this uh, slice notation is doing that is list then you pass minus x and slice that will uh, extract the last x items in the array so from my generator losses which has all my losses appended to it i'm just taking the last 50 and uh, uh, taking a sum of them and plotting them so and, and dividing by display step to get the mean uh, generator losses and then i am plotting that generator uh, that mean generator loss and i'm doing the same thing with the discriminator as well uh so this uh, print statement will just print these two mean generator loss and mean discriminator loss and the actual plotting code is this lines uh, so we made use of this uh, uh, plot image from tensor method that we defined in utils file and i'm plotting both the fake and real one after another 
so that we can actually check the improvement of the fake images when the epox moves forward and then also uh, uh, in the last part of this plotting it's very simple code i'm just uh, doing the plt.plot to plot a graph of my generator loss and the discriminator loss uh, for uh, across the epochs and with that all my code architecture implementation is over and i'm ready to run the entire project and to run the entire project all i need to do is uh, execute this train.py file because this file is bringing in all the other methods from the other two files with these two imports so i am going to go to my google collab and in google collab all you need to do is to upload these three files in your current session storage of collab that is uh, my file names are conditional gan train.py and utils.py you can just uh, click here in this uh, upload icon that will give uh, bring the prompt and just select your files and it will be uploaded then i'm connecting my google drive uh, nvidia smi will just check uh, what kind of gpu i got you have to actually change the runtime type to be gpu so I got a Tesla K80 GPU with 12 GB of VRAM and run the ls command to uh, check all the files that you uploaded is recognized and then uh, final training is just this simple command python train.py and that will start your training. And after the very first epoch was done this is the kind of result I got so on the top here you see the fake images produced by generator and that's almost just noise after the first epoch and then this is my real images from mnist and this is the loss plot and we can see that there is almost no convergence of the losses and that's because it's just one epoch and then after four or five epochs uh, i can see that the images are starting to be formed that that is these top images are my fake produced by generator and uh, here i can kind of recognize some of the images and also the loss plot looks better uh, they are starting to converge and then finally uh, almost after 30 40 epochs i can see the fake images looks almost like real and that's like after uh, i think after 50 epochs 50 or 60 so uh, yeah it looks much better and also uh, the loss plot is really looking better and uh, the uh, convergence of them uh, looks very nice that pretty much wraps up this video and the github link is in the description so in this video i will go over the cyclegan paper to understand it properly and in the next one i will implement cyclegan from scratch with pytorch one more thing that over the next month i will do many gan or generative adversarial network implementation from scratch with pytorch so do subscribe because you hitting the subscribe button is what keeps me motivated to do this let's start so here i'm looking at the original paper it was published on 24th August 2020 and the name of the paper was Unpaired Image to Image Translation Using Cycle Consistent Adversarial Networks. So CycleGAN is an extension of the regular GAN architecture and uh, it involves the simultaneous training of two generator models and two discriminator models. And we all know that the regular GAN has only one generator and one discriminator. Now what does CycleGAN do and the paper says that in the very first page that given any two unordered image collection X and Y our algorithm learns to automatically translate an image from one into the other and vice versa. And some examples are given here that with CycleGAN you can translate a Monet painting to normal photos, you can translate zebras to horses, summer scene to winter scene, these are some uh, quick examples now quickly see why cycle gan is called cycle and why does it have two generators and two discriminator so this is the intuition of cycle gan and obviously we can see a cycle here one generator so i have uh, x as a source image and y as a target image and i have one generator gx and the second generator fy so the first generator that is a gx takes image from the first domain that is x as input and outputs images for the second domain that is y here 
the other generator that is if y takes image from the second domain that is it takes image from y domain as input and generates images for the first domain that is the result of if y will be x so it's just a cycle that you input one image from this domain then the first generator produces or generates an output which is y that is a second domain then this domain also feeds into the second generator and the second generator produces output which becomes my first domain and just because i have two generators that means i also will need two discriminators because each of the discriminator will discriminate the image generated by each of the generators so cycle GAN is used to transfer characteristics of one image to another or can map the distribution of image to another in cycle GAN, we treat the problem as an image reconstruction problem we first take an image that is the input x here and use the generator g to convert it into a reconstructed image in the y domain then we reverse the process that is from the reconstructed image to original image using the second generator that is f here then we calculate the mean squared error loss between the real and the reconstructed image now understand why does it call the unpaired the word here and why it is an unsupervised algorithm so in the second page uh, uh, of the paper uh, uh, this is the most important kind of image for this paper uh, so on the left i have a paired image set and on the right i have an unpaired data set of images so uh, traditionally training an image to image translation model requires a data set comprised of paired examples that is a large data set of many examples of input images x and the same image with the desired modification that can be used as an expected output image y and what do i mean by the word paired that's very well written here this point that is Paired training data, which is a left data set, consists of training examples x i y i, and i of course ranges from i to i equal to one up to n, where the correspondence between x i and y i exist. That's what is called paired. But in cycle GAN, there is no correspondence. That is, I don't know which x i is connected or mapped to which y i. Now, this requirement for a paired training dataset is a limitation because these datasets are challenging and expensive to prepare. For example, photos of different scenes under different weather conditions. And that's where CycleGAN came to solve this. The genius insight of this UC Berkeley group that brought CycleGAN to the world was that, that we do not, in fact, need perfect pairs. Instead, we simply complete the cycle, we translate from one domain to another and then back again. For example, we go from summer picture which is in domain A of a park to a winter one which is in domain B and then back again to summer. Now we have essentially created a cycle. Let's go back to my slide here. So after we essentially created this cycle, we complete this cycle that is x goes through gx to produce y and then the output again goes through the next second generator fy to produce an image which is in the first domain so essentially these reconstructed image after the cycle is completed should be same but if they are not we can measure their loss on a pixel level thereby getting the first loss of our cycle gan which is cycle consistency loss the most important feature of CycleGAN architecture is that if we have unpaired images from different domains without direct mapping between them, a CycleGAN model should still be able to translate images between these two domains. Hence, the model architecture here is comprised of two generator models. One generator, that is generator A, for generating images for the first domain, that is domain A. And the second generator, generator B, for generating images for the second domain, that is domain B. And the generator models perform image translation here, meaning that the image generation process is conditional on an input image, specifically an image from the other domain. 
so generator a takes an image from domain b as input and generator b takes an image from domain a as input and now talking about the discriminator i have two of them in cycle again the first discriminator take that is a discriminator a uh, takes real images from domain a and generated images from generator a and predicts whether they are real or fake and the second discriminator that is discriminator b takes real images from domain b and generated images from generator b and predicts whether they are real or fake and this is how it works in discriminator i have four options of real and fake images so the first one is domain a real images goes to discriminator a and then it outputs real or fake because that's the job of the discriminator it just tells me that whether a uh, image passed to it is a real one that is they come from the real data set or their fake one that is they were produced by the generator model so that was option one and then option b is domain b real images goes to generator a which produces domain a fake images then that fake images from domain a goes to discriminator a and then it produces real or fake decision then the third one is domain b real images directly go to discriminator b and this produces real fake decision and the fourth and the final one is that domain a images first goes to generator b which produces fake images for domain b then those fake images of domain b goes to discriminator b and that produces real or fake decision now one very important factor to note here is that the discriminator model in cycle gan is implemented as a patch gan model now a regular gan takes an image as an input and it outputs a single scalar value which signifies real or fake but in patch gan looks uh, how it works so in patch gan well, we have a 256 by 256 by 3 image at the input and the patch can works on these 256 by 256 image on a patch by patch basis and in cycle gun specifically the here in this architecture the receptive field of the discriminator turns out to be a 70 by 70 patches in the input image so the patch can maps from the 256 by 256 image to an n by n array of output and say the output name is x where each xij signifies whether the patch ij in x in the image is real or fake uh, here n by n can be different depending on the dimension of the input image and what would be the patch ij in the input well output xij is just a neuron in a convnet and we can trace back its receptive field to see which input pixel it is sensitive to so in practice what this means is that patch can architecture outputs a feature map of roughly 30 by 30 points each of these points on the feature map can see a patch of 70 by 70 pixel on the input space and this is called the receptive field size so in this slide at the very start here this blue segment the selected segment that's a receptive field so to be precise the patch gun architecture is equivalent to chopping up the image into 70 by 70 patches making a big batch out of these patches and running a discriminator on each patch with batch norm applied across the batch then averaging the result and the advantage of using a patch can over a normal GAN discriminator is that it has fewer parameters than normal discriminator also it can be applied to input images of different sizes for example larger or smaller than 256 by 256 pixel the output of the model depends on the size of the input image but may be one value or a square activation map of values each value is a probability for the likelihood that a patch in the input image is real these values can be averaged to give an overall likelihood or classification score if needed and now one of the most important concept in cycle gan paper which is cycle consistency let's look at this image i have horse images and zebra images horse images belong to domain one and zebra belongs to domain two now 
domain one that is a horse image is input to the generator one and that outputs zebra now zebra is again input to generator two and that outputs back to horse and then this output from the generator one should match the original input because both belongs to the same domain one but if they don't, that is after the horse input image goes through generator 1, then again generator 2 and produce the horse again. If these two are not similar, then that becomes my loss and that loss is called cycle consistency loss. So the idea here is that an image output by the first generator could be used as input to the second generator and the output of the second generator should match the original image and if i go to the original paper they also give uh, give a nice uh, diagram for this cycle consistency loss and here is that diagram what they are talking about is our model contains two mapping function uh, the one one is g which maps from x to y and f which maps from y to x and associated adversarial discriminators dy and dx which uh, dy encourages g to translate x into outputs indistinguishable from domain y and vice versa for dx and f to further regularize the mapping we introduce two cycle consistency losses that capture the intuition that if we translate from one domain to the other and back again we should arrive at where we started and uh, so this part of the this section of the of this diagram uh, is what is um, representing cycle consistency loss so uh, first look x is convert x uh, x is the input here and that goes to the generator g and produces y then y is again input to the generator f and that produces x back now this original x and the reconstructed x after the these two cycles should be same theoretically but actually they are not same and that difference is what cycle consistency loss and the opposite way of movement is also true that is in the third section that is uh, the c section of these entire diagram here i am starting with y uh, that is input to my generator f and then i get x and then that x is again input to the second to, to the generator g here and g will produce y so the starting position from this y domain goes through two generator to produce the original y again and theoretically they should be the same because they belong to the same domain but they will not be exactly same and to the extent they are different that is cycle consistency loss so the cycle consistency is a concept from machine translation where a phrase translated from English to French, for example, should translate from French back to English and be identical to the original phrase. The reverse process should also be true. And uh, so that was that's the cycle consistency concept. And obviously, to, to be able to use cycle consistency loss, we need to have two generators, one translating from A to B and then another one translating from B to A. And that also means there will be two losses. One is forward cycle consistency loss and the other one is backward cycle consistency loss. So here in this image, when uh, X is converted to Y and then Y back to X, this loss is a forward cycle consistency loss. And then in this part of the diagram, when we start from Y, go to X after first generator, and then again, it cycles back to Y, then this, this loss, that is the uh, difference between this original Y and the reconstructed Y, this is called backward cycle consistency loss. And that's exactly what the paper talks about. I have uh, put that part in this red border. That is forward cycle consistency loss here, X goes to GX then the output of this entire gx goes to the f function again that is uh, the next part this one here here is f of gx that should produce a reconstructed x so the loss here is a forward cycle consistency loss and then the backward cycle consistent loss is where a y goes to f y and then again the entire thing goes to the second generator that is g of f y and then that should produce the reconstructed y like in this 
part of the diagram and this loss here that is the difference between the original y and the reconstructed y that's my backward cycle consistency loss and obviously all of these will be much more clear when in the next video i will implement these uh, uh, from scratch with pytorch just another example of forward cycle consistency loss while translating summer images to winter images with cycle gan so first step input photos of summer to gan 1 then output of these gan 1 will be winter images then take those winter images and pass them as input to gan 2 then gan 2 will produce summer images again that is after the original summer images after these two gan cycles comes out to be summer images again now compare the summer images here that is a reconstructed summer images with the original summer images and that will be your cycle consistency loss and which is forward cycle consistency loss now exactly the same process but in the opposite direction will be your backward cycle consistency loss so in this case input photos of winter to gan 2 that will output summer images then input those summer images photos to gan 1 that is the output of take the output of gan 2 and pass them as input to gan 1 then output of gan 1 again will be winter photos now compare these reconstructed winter photos after these two GAN cycles with the original winter photos and that will be your backward cycle consistency loss. And so now that we understand very well the cycle consistency loss that is both backward and forward. Now let's uh, go to the section of the paper which talks about the most important part of overall loss calculation. So here is that section in the paper. Uh, so. Uh, obviously after our discussion the total loss will be uh, will be constructed by adversarial loss and cycle consistency loss so the first one is this adversarial loss this is the regular gan loss so this equation should be familiar with you who are already conversant with gan so i put some comment here let's see what i put so this is regular gan loss or adversarial loss for the mapping function g which produces a map between x and y that is uh, uh, it takes x as input and produces y and the corresponding discriminator is dy uh, and here g tries to generate images gx that look similar to images from domain y while dy aims to distinguish between translated sample gx and the real samples y obviously and uh, similar adversarial loss for mapping function f that is which maps from y to x and the corresponding dx are also introduced here so yeah so this is a regular gan loss and i have two of them because i have two generators um, and then i have cycle consistency loss so all this discussion that we had a minute before so now this section actually they mention it very clearly that why cycle consistency loss is needed at all let's quickly read through this section because it is very important actually so adversarial training can in theory learn mappings g and f that produce output identically distributed as target domains y and x respectively However, with large enough capacity, a network can map the same set of input images to any random permutation of images in the target domain, where any of the learned mappings can induce an output distribution that matches the target distribution. Thus, adversarial losses alone cannot guarantee that the learned function can map an individual input xi to a desired output yi. To further reduce the space of possible mapping function, we argue that the learned mapping function should be cycle consistent. Okay, so basically what they're saying is without the cycle consistency loss, uh, I can have one input image map to multiple output image in the target domain and that's a problem so that's why cycle this very important concept this is actually the brilliant concept that was brought to the world of uh, generative adversarial network that is the cycle consistency loss was brought in in this paper and to calculate the cycle consistency loss here is equation for that and what they say in the section b is for each image x from domain x 
the image translation cycle should be able to bring x back to the original image that is x goes to gx then again i take f of gx that is x goes to two consecutive gan cycles and that should bring the original x back we call these forward cycle consistency similarly as illustrated in figure 3 for each image y from domain y g and f should also satisfy backward cycle consistency that is in this case y goes to fy that is one generator then it goes to the next generator g of fy that is after y goes through two generator cycle the original y should be back and we incentivize this behavior using a cycle consistency loss and this is the equation the equation is uh, very simple for uh, uh, they are basically calculating the l1 loss that is f of gx should be ideally the original x and if they are not that is the difference represented by f of gx minus x and that's my forward cycle consistency loss similarly for the backward cycle consistency loss this is the second part that is g of fy should be equal to y but they are not and that difference is my backward cycle consistency loss so now i have adversarial loss calculated here and the cycle consistency loss calculated here so the total loss will be that is a full objective is uh, represented in this equation uh, so here i have uh, uh, the adversarial loss here for the one generator then the adversarial loss here for the next generator and finally my cycle consistency loss and this variable lambda just controls the relative importance of the two objectives now, so lambda is just a weightage factor here that is to what extent i should weight the different part of this overall loss objective and then the next part of the paper is about implementation of the entire architecture of course this will this implementation details will make much more sense when in the next video i'm going to actually implement it with pytorch so basically what they are doing doing is that this network contains three convolutions several residual blocks two fractionally strided convolution with stride half and one convolution that maps features to rgb and also they are talking about we use six blocks for six residual blocks actually for 128 by 128 images and nine blocks for 256 by 256 images uh, all right and for the discriminator network we use 70 by 70 patch gans which aim to classify whether 70 by 70 overlapping image patches are real or fake on the same line on the training guidelines uh, uh, we apply two techniques from recent works to stabilize our model training procedure first for l gan that is equation one uh, which is my uh, this one uh, that is adversarial loss what they're talking about is for equation one we replace the negative log likelihood objective by a least square loss this loss is more stable during training and generates higher quality results uh, all right so that means uh, they are using mse mean squared error uh, which will be uh, the expression mathematical expression will be just this that is uh, uh, for each of the gan so the first gan uh, d of gx minus one whole square and uh, and the train the d to minimize uh, dy that is discriminator y minus one whole square plus uh, this one dgx square uh, okay again this will be much more clear during my implementation in the next video anything else here let's quickly see uh, yeah they have a section where uh, okay this is also important analysis of the loss function uh, so uh, what they saw by using different aspects different way of calculating the loss so removing the GAN loss substantially degrades result as does removing the cycle consistency loss we therefore conclude that both terms are critical to our results that is both the adversarial loss which is a regular GAN loss and also the cycle consistency loss both are equally important for this architecture we also evaluate our method with the cycle loss in only one direction that is GAN plus forward cycle loss or GAN plus backward cycle loss and find that uh, often it 
it often incurs training instability and causes model collapse okay this is also not acceptable that is i cannot in implement just one directional cycle consistency loss so uh, whichever directional cycle consistency so basically the paper says that if i remove only one direction cycle consistency that is either remove the backward or the forward cycle consistency loss then there will be instability in that direction and also you will face a mode collapse uh, for the direction of the mapping that was removed and uh, finally in the appendix section of the paper they also give some more uh, details on the network architecture so uh, they're saying we use six residual blocks for 128 by 128 training images and nine residual blocks for 256 by 256 higher resolution training images and then they give the very important part which will this details obviously will become much more clear when in the next video i will actually implement these structures so basically they uh, give every details of what kind of convolutions str uh, stride and padding and filter size you have to use for your uh, generator and the discriminator architecture implementation so let cs s1k denote a 7 by 7 convolution instance norm ReLU layer with k filters and stride one in that case a network with six residual block consists of c7s1 that is i will have uh, the six residual block each of each one will consist of a seven by seven convolution instance norm relu layer with uh, uh, k filters and k in this case is 64 and stride is one so that's how you have to read these uh, terminologies here and about the D256 or D128, they say that DK, so this D128 is my DK here, and denotes a 3 by 3 convolution instance norm and ReLU layer with K filters and stride 2. So this will be my 3 by 3 convolution instance norm and ReLU filter with 128, with 128 filters and stride of 2, and this will be 256 filters with stride of 2 and about the r the reflection padding was used to reduce artifacts rk denotes a residual block that contains three by three convolution layer with the same number of filters on both layers uh, all right and of course the most important point to note in this architecture is that here we do not use a batch norm instead we use instance norm and about the discriminator architecture for discriminator networks we use 70 by 70 patch gan let ck denote 4 by 4 convolution instance norm leaky relu layer with k filters and stride and uh, also we do not use instance norm for the first c64 layer we use leaky relus with slope of 0 0.2 and then the discriminator architecture is just this that is uh, a 70 by 70 patch can with uh, a 64 filters uh, of 4 by 4 convolution instance norm and leaky relu then i have c128 that is 128 filters then 256 filters and finally 512 filters and they're also saying clearly that for the c64 layer we do not use instance norm and another very important concept of cycle gan is the concept of identity loss so let's look at this image so here uh, the original input is here and this second uh, column represent without identity loss the result and uh, the third column represent with identity loss the final result from cycle gan so the idea here is that the identity loss in identity loss we want to enforce that cycle gan preserves the overall color structure or temperature of the picture and this is done by feeding the images already in domain a to the generator from b to a because the idea is the cycle gan should understand that they are already in the correct domain in other words we penalize unnecessary changes to the image so if we feed a zebra to a generator that is supposed to generate a zebra then we should get back the original zebra because there is nothing to do so basically with identity loss we introduce a regularization term that helps us keep the original image or the overall color structure and temperature of the original image consistent so imagine this as a way of ensuring that even after applying many filters onto your image you still 
can recover the original image. That pretty much wraps up this video where we understood the architectural details of CycleGAN and in my next video that I will publish in the next couple of days where I will implement CycleGAN from scratch with Python. In this video, I will implement the very popular CycleGAN paper from scratch with PyTorch. And as a prerequisite for this video, a couple of days back, I did another one where I discussed in detail the architecture of CycleGAN going through the paper. So if you have not watched that already, I kind of recommend do watch that first because the implementation here in this video will follow that architectural review. I will give the link of that video in the description of this one and also the length of this video became slightly longer than I thought it to be that's because I have pretty much explained each and every line of code in this architecture implementation and all the source code is in my github repository the link of which is again in the description uh, just search by the number because each video in my channel is numbered one more thing that over the next month I will do many GAN or Generative Adversarial Network implementation from scratch with PyTorch. So do subscribe because you hitting the subscribe button is what keeps me motivated to do this. Let's start. First a quick recap of CycleGAN architecture. So CycleGAN attempts to learn a mapping from one dataset X to another Y for example horses to zebras or winter to summer etc or money to normal photographs and it does this with two generators G and F and two discriminators DX and DY corresponding to the two generators. Now generator G attempts to turn X into Y and the generator F attempts to turn Y into X. And here again X and Y denotes images in two different domains. So X could be horses then Y is zebras. Uh, if X is summer then Y is winter. Similar kind of example. And then DX attempts to differentiate real images sampled from real images X and images produced by the generator F. F is updated accordingly to get better at fooling DX. And then the other discriminator dy attempts to differentiate real images sampled from domain y and fake images produced by the generator g. g is updated accordingly to get better at fooling dy. And then about the concept of losses in CycleGAN, we have discussed this in detail in the previous architecture, uh, architecture video that we have three losses in CycleGAN. One is the obvious one, the regular GAN loss or general adversarial loss. Then I have cycle consistency loss. This loss is very specific to the cycle gun architecture and the cycle consistency loss is added to ensure an image a generator outputs can be mapped back into the original image by the other generator. So mathematically it is represented as this that is we have these two uh, generator function G and F which are um, also called the mapping function. So the cycle consistency loss will be calculated as F of G X minus X that is a difference between F and G X and the original image x and also the g of fy and the original image y so basically the concept is this that after an original image goes through two cycles of generator function that is an x is converted to y and then y is again converted back to x domain then the difference between after the two cycle GAN after the two GAN cycles the difference between the original image and the reconstructed image that's called cycle consistency loss and again uh, I discussed these co concepts in detail in the previous video where uh, I reviewed the cycle GAN architecture so if you have not seen that uh, I do suggest do check that video uh, anyway, so the next loss is identity loss. This is the third loss in CycleGAN architecture. So this loss is added to help preserve the tint, contrast or color shade of the image. Basically, conceptually, it states that when given an image of the target class, a generator should return the same image. And uh, that is just um, uh, defined mathematically as this, that is the, the mapping function fx, the difference of fx with x and also uh, the difference between gy and y. And then to measure the total losses, we don't give equal weightage to each part of these three different losses. And that's why uh, the total losses will be an weighted 
sum of the individual losses and lambda is a term that is added to define the relative importance of cycle and identity losses compared to the regular gain losses uh, we will see these um, the actual value that lambda takes uh, in our implementation in a moment and then the generator uses a series of convolution layers and residual convolution layers as well to map one image to another and the discriminator uses a patch GAN architecture to classify images. So that was the initial recap of the architecture and now I'm back in my VS code and for the overall structure of the project I will have three files cyclegan.py, train.py and utils.py. Uh, and this uh, first one that is cyclegan.py have will have uh, three classes that is the uh, entire actual network of cyclegan will be implemented in this file then utils.py uh, file will have all my utility methods we will go through them one by one uh, in a moment and finally my train.py file will have all the training code so here all the hyperparameters will be defined actual values of them and then finally I will run the entire uh, training function from here uh, we'll go through them in detail and uh, these three files together will be run with a single and very small jupyter notebook here this jupyter this notebook pretty much doesn't have anything it's just uh, three cells and because i am running it in google collab so i have to connect my google drive in this uh, notebook and uh, in this uh, jupyter notebook you pretty much run this single line that is python train.py so I'm just running this train.py and this will run the entire project. So, so that was overall structure. Now let's um, start. And while explaining the code, I sometimes have to move back and forth between these different files because uh, some of the methods that I will be using in the cyclegan.py, uh, cyclegan uh, sometimes uh, they are defined in utils.py, uh, things like that. So anyway, so first one is my residual block and uh, uh, this is a very small method small class and why uh, i am structuring it in this particular way for that first uh, quickly go through the research paper what they talk about the architecture on residual block so i am looking at the original paper and if you go to the very last page which is the appendix uh, yeah so that's where the architecture details are here so uh, what they are saying is that uh, so uh, basically the, we have uh, uh, they're talking about two res two kind of structure overall one is with the six residual blocks and another one is with the uh, nine residual blocks so i will be mainly following this one that is uh, the one with the one with the nine residual blocks here and uh, then they are clearly saying that uh, uh, RK denotes a residual block that contains two 3x3 three three convolution layers with the same number of filters on both layer. So this is what is the important point for building our residual block. I'm just putting a red border around it. RK and what is RK? So if you look at the network with nine residual block consists of uh, I have C7164. This is uh, talking about the normal convolution layer that there's uh, talking about here c7 s1k denotes 7 by 7 convolution convolution instance norm a uh, relu layer with k filters and stride one then i have uh, d d12 128 and d256 so uh, these two so d128 and d256 so what is this dk so this is denoted by dk a uh, dk denotes a 3x3 three three convolution instance norm relu layer with k filters and stride of 2 and reflection padding was used to reduce artifacts and then i have d256 and uh, d uh, yes d1 sorry no uh, here i have one second uh, for my residual block r2561 and uh, I have nine residual blocks actually because that's the overall structure I'm looking at. So all these uh, all these layers starting with the letter R, they are my residual blocks. So I have nine of them. 
uh yeah so all are r256 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 and so on and this is where these number 256 denotes uh, denotes um, a residual block that contains a three by three convolution layers with the same number of filters on both layers so 25 256 is my number of channels or number of filters and uh, so back in my vs code that's what i'm implementing here so this is a very simple uh, class residual block i have one single block defined under an end or sequential uh, so that means uh, all these is actually uh, a sequential block and that i'm naming it as self dot block and um, if you notice that i have a starting one a reflection pad 2d and that's again as per the paper because reflection padding is used in cycle gan because it gives a better image quality at edges and uh, then i have a conf 2d instance norm 2d then relu then again reflection pad 2d conf 2d and instance instance norm 2d now if you notice that in conf 2d i'm using in channel in channel and three that is this in channel actually as per pytorch's documentation it is a number of input channels the second argument i'm using in channel but actually the second argument represent out channel or the number of output channels or output filters now here i'm using the same because as per the paper uh, it clearly says that same number of filters on both layers and uh, yeah three and the third argument three here represent the kernel size so uh, this is a three by three square matrix uh, representing the kernel size and again in the same conf 2d as well second conf 2d i mean as well i'm using in channel in channel 3 uh, because of the same reason that uh, the, the the number of filters remains the same in both layers and kernel has been defined to be 3 by 3 and then in the forward method of residual block just because by the definition of residual block here the forward function will be different that i have to add the residual from my previous uh, calculation and that's exactly what this is uh, returning that is x is then i'm adding the self dot block x so i'm adding uh, the original x to uh, to that the entire the structure entire this network i'm adding to that and that's a final return from my residual block so this entire thing is a single residual block but i have to implement many of them and now in this paper they are talking about this network with nine residual blocks but somewhere else in the paper they also uh, said that we can increase this residual block if uh, and that's is supposed to improve my overall uh, overall result of these uh, architecture and that's why we will see in a second in my architecture this number of residual block which is in hyperparameter that i'm using 19 one nine and all my hyperparameters are defined in my train.py file uh, in this uh, uh, in this area here and i'm using num residual blocks 19 so i'm using 19 instead of 9 uh, so it's 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 an even more deeper network that i'm building here um, and that's purely because i wanted to improve the overall accuracy and overall result from my model so yeah so that's residual block the next one is my the all important generator network and that class i'm defining it here let's go over them but first uh, looking at the network architecture section of the paper again uh, this entire green and the yellow highlighted area is my generator network so uh, first i have seven by seven convolution instance norm relu layer then i have a three by three convolution instance norm relu layers then i have reflection padding then the all the residual blocks and finally uh, these uh, u128 u64 uh, these denotes this one that is a yellow highlighted one uk denotes a three by three fractional strided convolution instance norm and relu layer with k filters and stride so this entire thing this entire structure is my generator class now a couple of important points about the generator in cycle gan that uh, here the generator consists of encoder and decoder kind of structure so it first down sample or encode the input image then interpret the encoding with nine residual blocks having skip connections after that with a series of layers it up samples or decode the representation to the size of the fake image 
and uh, also in CycleGAN we are using reflection padding uh, which uh, reflects a row into the padding. It is used mostly for brightness, contrast and for reducing artifacts. Now a quick word on the reflection padding in general that uh, there are a couple of reasons to use it instead of zero padding. So for example on object detection problems zero padding is usually not an issue but there are a lot of areas in computer vision where you are looking at things like biological tissue which can have more of a texture quality than object quality. So if you are trying to mask one type of tissue from another reflecting will help you avoid edge effects that zero padding might introduce. So that's just uh, one of the situation where you would prefer reflection padding compared to zero padding. And then also in CycleGAN generator, we are not using batch normalization. Instead, we are using instance normalization to normalize across each channel in each data instead of normalizing across input features in a data. So with instance normalization, it allows uh, to remove instance specific contrast information from the image content. Uh, which simplifies image generation and this also result in quite a bit of improved uh, images at the end so to represent these uh, visually this is my uh, image here for the generator network and this is exactly what the paper talks about i mean this structure that you see right now is exactly the um, uh, architecture that paper mentions in its appendix part so uh, just like what we are talking about that is a generator consists of encoder and uh, a constant part and a decoder so th uh, this is what we see here uh, let's uh, let me zoom in properly here yeah. so uh, as you can see the representation size shrinks uh, in the encoder phase stays constant in the transformer phase and expands again in the decoder phase a representation size means the the input size the, the actual shape of the input images which is represented by the letter k here uh, and in this case the data set that i will be using comes from uh, the famous uc berkeley cycle gan data set and i will be using winter to summer conversion data set and there the image sizes are all of 256 by 256 so uh, just as let me just go to the paper quickly so uh, this is what they are talking about c7s1 this will have 64 of them meaning 64 filters of c7s1 then i have 128 filters of uh, these next layer d which is a 3x3 three three convolution and then I have all these 256, 256 um, residual layers and finally I have 128. Now go back to my image here. Uh, so that's what we have here, 64 filters of 7x7, seven seven, uh, kernel size, stride 1, then 128 of 3x3 three three filters, stride 2, 256 filter of uh, stride equal to 2 and 3 by 3 size then all of these residual one that is a transformer part of the of the network they remain constant at 256 filter of 3 by 3 size and stride equal to 1 and decoder part uh, I have this expanding again so I have 128 filters of 3 by 3 size then 64 filters of 3 by 3 size and three filters of 7 by 7 size and the representation that is the image input image shape also uh, goes through this kind of conversion that is k then k by 2 k by 4 remain constant at k by 4 across this transformer section then again i have k by 2 k and finally k and this is the output from the generator and obviously this output needs to match exactly in terms of sizes the input images now going back to my class yeah so here uh, that's uh, what i'm doing so this generator uh, resnet takes uh, input shape and number of residual blocks as the arguments and then i'm starting off with my and channels obviously that will be the uh, coming from the zeroth element of the input shape uh, and in this case the data set i will be using that will be 256 and then I'm starting off with the out channels equal to 64 following my base structure again. Uh, where did that go? Yep. Uh, 64. So the, my first 
channel number i'm keeping at 64 and uh, then i'm defining this model variable and this model variable is what i will be continuing to update through these various blocks so my first block is uh, starting with a reflection pad then conf 2d instance norm 2d and relu and uh, uh, go, going following this architecture, I am passing the uh, channels, out channels, and kernel size is 7. This 7 is actually kernel size, kernel size. Uh, yep, so this is a 7 by 7 matrix here. And that's my model variable. This is this array. And then in channels equal to out channels, because I'll be starting with the next layer here. And my next layer will be uh, uh, these two, D128, D256. And uh, uh, so here I am, the same layer will be repeated twice. That's why I'm running a loop here for uh, the range of two. I will out channel, I will multiply, uh, multiply by two for the next one. That's because I have the first one 128, then multiplied by two, I have 256. And these are my, uh, this is this is the one that DK denotes three by three convolution instance norm and ReLU. So I'm doing exactly the same conf instance norm and ReLU. And in the conf 2D, I'm passing in channel, out channel, uh, filter size is three by three. Actually, I can just mention kernel size equal to three and stride to padding one this is following exactly what the paper says and uh, yeah so that my these uh, two chat these two layers are over and finally when i'm done with these layers as well i again i'm making the in channels equal to out channels from this layer because now i'll be running the next layers which will be my residual layers and the residual layers are easy because um, uh, because uh, uh, the same residual layers. So all these are two five six. Here they are talking about nine of them. Uh, in my case, it is nineteen. So I just have to repeat them. So I am just running a single loop here. That is for underscore in range num residual block. This is hyperparameter that I will be setting in my train.py file. And uh, in my train.py file under the hyperparameters variable, I'm setting this num residual blocks equal to 19. So it will run this loop for those 19 times. And each time it will just do model plus equal to residual block out channel simple as simple as this because this whole residual block we already have defined before uh, this one so this is just will be repeated 19 times and each time it will be added uh, to my previous output uh, with this line model plus equal to all right so now i am done with my residual blocks as well and only the last section of my model is due which is my uh, these decoder section or upsampling section and in this, I have uh, these uh, two, uh, two, two layers, U128 and U64. Uh, and what is this uh, U? Here, UK denotes a 3x3 three three fractional strided convolution instance norm ReLU layers with K filters and stride half. So let's go back to my uh, code here. All right. So... Uh, here is the upsampling part. Again, there are two of them and that's why I'm running a loop with a range of two. Uh, out channel here uh, because uh, here the out channel will be decreased and that's why I'm dividing by two each time after the each layer. So they actually will be U128 and then uh, U64. Uh, sorry, U. Uh, all right, so that's uh, 128 becomes 64 in my uh, second U layer. And again, this is just the upsample layer, and that's why I'm using nn.upsample, scale factor 2, conf, then the uh, regular conf2d, instance norm2d, and ReLU. Uh, in channels, out channels, kernel size, again, remember C, kernel size, and stride 1, padding 1. Uh, and finally, after these uh, layers are done, finally, I'm updating my in channels to be equal to out channels because then again, my this block is done and now only the last block is remaining. And what is my last block? That is a conv layer 
uh, this one uh, c7 s13 again this this is where we this c7 s1 is something of a convolution that we started the entire architecture but this was 64 filter now because this is the final layer uh, final color image need to be outputted and hence i have three channels here and they represent a seven by seven convolution with uh, stride equal to one so that's what i'm doing in the last layer uh, reflection padding 2 conf 2d and tan h again again uh, i'm using reflection padding and tan h just as required by the paper and finally when all these models are done that means all my blocks are done uh, this block is done then this uh, d1 228 d 256 this is also done all my residual blocks are done upsampling block is done and a final conf block is also done and then my uh, entire generator is pretty much done and now i will be uh, updating the model like this that is self dot model equal to nn dot sequential to that i pass the star model and uh, finally so this is uh, because i'm updating the same variable model here so from the forward function i can just return a model like this that is model to that i pass the input x and also the star the meaning of the star uh, before the argument model here is uh, a python syntax it is used to take in a variable number of arguments so basically what it allows you to do is to take in more arguments than the number of formal arguments that you previously defined uh, all right so that's the uh, end of my generator network and then my discriminator network and this is this is slightly uh, relatively slightly easier so coming back to the paper again to see the exact architectural details of the discriminator network so here it is and uh, the most important part is given here the discriminator architecture is just this let me see let me put a red border around it yeah so c64 c128 c256 c512 four layers four conf layers that's it and uh, what discriminator network is that for discriminator network we use 70 by 70 patch gans we discussed this in uh, uh, detail in the architectural review video uh, so that is what patch gan is uh, so here let ck denote a 4 by 4 convolution instance norm leaky relu layer with k filters and stride of 2 so i have 64 filters con conf layer then 1 2 8 filters conf 256 filter conf and finally 5 1 2 filters conf now let's go back to my vs code and implement that so let me first put the exact details of the paper here in the comment that's that will be my guiding principle uh yeah so these four points 70 by 70 patch cans convolution instance norm leaky relu with k filters uh, after the last layer i have to produce one dimensional output and we do not use instance norm for the first c64 layers okay so the first thing i will do is uh, within my discriminator class i create and of course discriminator class takes uh, uh, takes um, uh, channels height and width as input shape this is my input shape and uh, the first thing i will do uh, is defining these block the discriminator block that will be repeated uh, all right before that i also have to uh, define a variable output shape because this will be my calculated output shape from the discriminator network and this will be required while uh, um, I do the actual training inside my train.py file and create my uh, create the vectors for the labels etc uh, then these output shape uh, which is out which is output shape of image from the discriminator network uh, this variable will be required and uh, here I am uh, so, so to define this output shape I am just using this uh, one height divided by two into four and width divided by two into four and uh, uh, yeah so coming back to the discriminator block uh, this is just creating this thing that is in the paper they talk about uh, let ck uh, be a 4 by 4 convolution instance norm leaky relu layer with k filters and strides of 2 and uh, 
and what is my k k will be 64 128 256 512 so k is increasing by a factor of two in each layer so uh, yeah so that's what this block will do in channels out channels and normalize equal to true the, this is the three arguments it will take and normalize by default to take the true value and in my layers variable i have a conf 2d in channel loud channel kernel size is four just as defined by uh, by the paper uh, stride of two padding of one and to um, implement this line of the paper that we do not use instance norm for the first c64 layer uh, that's what this normalize this boolean boolean argument is doing that is by default it's true and when uh, that means in all layers if normalize is true then layers will be appended with nn dot instance norm true d but when it is not true then it will not be appended with this instance norm so now my discriminator block is this uh, ultimately from this i'm just returning this layer uh, mm, yeah uh, and uh, then uh, in the next step i am just repeating these discriminator block four times and uh, within nn dot sequential and these uh, four times repetition of this is uh, defined to be my self dot model and uh, each time i'm just changing pretty much this out channel input channel etc so the first one is uh, so this will follow this uh, structure c64 c128 256 512 so the first one out channel 64 then the next one uh, next layer is out channels will be 128 then 256 and 512 uh, and then uh, there will be a zero padding uh, added after this and also note that not listed explicitly in the paper the model also has a final hidden layer of a c512 with a one by one stride so that's my this last one nn.conf2d in channels 512 because that's coming from the previous one previous channel and the final output channel is one uh, and this is because the paper clearly says after the last layer we apply a convolution to produce a one dimensional output so uh, this is what i was talking about this line was not very explicit in the paper but this means that i have to start with a 512 channel uh, as in channels for this layer and produce a one dimensional output because uh, my discriminator ultimately will just produce true or false fake or real this kind of output so that's this conf 2d layer the final one where in channel is 512 out channel is one kernel size four padding of one and also note that uh, in the first c64 layer this is the my this is my starting layer of discriminator uh, block so here i am using normalize equal to false that means that this line here will be invoked in will be will be activated that uh, when normalize equal to false then the instance norm 2d will not be added for the very first uh, c64 layer all right so that's my entire discriminator uh, architecture and finally from the discriminator i'm just returning the uh, entire model uh, from my forward function within the discriminator all right with that uh, okay i also wanted to show you my uh, discriminator overall structure so this is the discriminator that we just built it starts with 256 by 256 by 3 input image then this is my 64 c64 layer c to 128 layer c 256 layer and finally c512 layer and uh, then the final output is uh, fake or not that is uh, real or fake that is it's a single dimensional output from the final layer uh, that is one channel and that's what uh, that's what we built in here now uh, the most important question is you will ask then where is patch can implemented where do i see the patch can uh, let's find that out
So the patch can is inbuilt right in the structure that we just built. These uh, layers that is C64 to C128, C256 and finally to C512. This is referred to as a three layer patch GAN in the cycle GAN and PIX to PIX nomenclature. Because excluding the first hidden layer, the model has three hidden layers that could be scaled up or down to give different sized patch GAN models. Uh, so here to understand these uh, pagan again i'm just going back to the slide of pagan so in pagan given an example of input image of size 256 by 256 the pagan maps from the 256 by 256 to a n by n matrix of output x where within x each xij of that n by n matrix signifies whether the patch ij in the image is real or fake so for example in this slide this um, uh, darker selected blue area this is one patch and this is ultimately getting mapped to a fake or real by the end of the patch gun network so noting again here the main difference between patch GAN and a regular GAN discriminator is that the regular GAN maps an input image to a single scalar output in the range of 0 and 1 indicating the probability of the image being real or fake while patch GAN provides a matrix as the output where each element of the matrix signifies whether its corresponding patch is real or fake. And in the CycleGAN architecture, the receptive field of the discriminator turns out to be 70 by 70 patches in the input image. So in this slide, these, uh, this uh, dark blue area, that's one patch and that is in CycleGAN a 70 by 70 uh, size of patch. So what that means is that the patch GAN architecture outputs a feature map of roughly 30 by 30 points and each of those 30 by 30 points on the feature map can see a patch of 70 by 70 pixel on the input space and uh, this 70 by 70 pixel on the input space is called the receptive field size. So uh, in other words and to be precise the patch GAN architecture is equivalent to chopping up the input image into 70 by 70 patches, making a big batch out of these patches and running a discriminator on each of the 70 by 70 patch with batch norm applied across the batch, then averaging the result. And we can check that in uh, our architecture that we just implemented of the, for the discriminator block that uh, why I start from this end that is the output end of my discriminator block and go backward calculating the input size I will end up with a 70 by 70 size as the receptive field size for my discriminator block uh, let's check that so this is my discriminator network that we just built a while back and uh, to check or verify that patch can has been implemented in this what i need to check that i will start from the last layer of this discriminator network and go back towards the input layer one by one and i will see that uh, starting from the end and going back towards the beginning i will end up towards the beginning with a 70 by 70 size of feature map or 70 by 70 size of patch and thereby I can verify that the discriminator network is actually working on a, a patch of 70 by 70 size and uh, that is it is starting on a 70 by 70 size from the input image and at the end of the network it is outputting a single value uh, of uh, fake or real but first for that, I need to go back to check the original arithmetic of the CNN uh, feature map calculation. And we all know this formula that is um, uh, in output here is a number of output features in in is a number of input features to P P is the padding K is the filter size or kernel size S is stride. So if we rearrange this formula to get my input size from the in output size, I will end up with a, a different formula which will be this that is here I am uh, so in the previous arithmetic 
the all these right hand side expressions were given and i need to calculate the in output but what now for calculating uh, checking the patch can my output size is given stride is given filter size is given and i need to calculate the input size and uh, here i am padding i'm taking to be zero and this will be the formula just uh, so what i'm doing is i'm just rearranging this formula that is um, uh, in output multiplied by s then uh, taking this one uh, here which will be minus one and with that i will end up with uh, this formula now let's uh, do a quick function or quick method to implement this so this is that function a uh, very simple one i'm just um, uh, just uh, including this formula uh, which is the input size given the output size filter size and stride and uh, then i have to invoke this formula on my discriminator network starting from the very end of the network and going back one by one one by one towards the beginning so my discriminator network is this so i'm looking at this uh, discriminator class that we just wrote a while back and i have to uh, invoke that formula starting at this end the very last layer and the output of the last layer was a single channel that is a uh, as we can see the out channel is one because by the end of the discriminator network it will output a single scalar value of zero or one representing uh, fake or real so coming back to the method uh, my uh, the first invocation of these method is this get input size output size will be one filter size four stride one this remains fixed for my entire discriminator network as per the paper and only thing i am doing here is output size one coming from uh, here the out channels of the last layer is one and that will be my last layer the output of this entire invocation of this uh, method will be my last layer input and then this last layer actually i can last layer input uh, size this will be my this and then i can for the next calculating the next one that is fourth layer input size i have to start from here so here output size will be last layer input size and filter size and stride remains one and similarly i am uh, checking the receptive field or the input size for my third layer second layer first layer uh, by uh, and each time i am uh, just changing this output size argument of this method and which will be the input the the output from the previous previous invocation of the method that is a fourth layer input size becomes the output size for the third layer similarly third layer input size this variable becomes output size for my second layer and similarly second layer input size becomes the output size for my first layer and if i run this function uh, this uh, the first the very last output from this method uh, from this line will should be 70 by 70 uh, th th thereby i can verify that uh, the entire discriminator network is working on a 70 by 70 patch and um, uh, by the end of the network it's outputting this single scalar value of zero and one so let's run this uh, cell and the output i'm getting exactly what i wanted that is a fourth layer seven third layer 16 second layer input size 34 and the first layer input size is 70 that's what i wanted so uh, at the very first this discriminator network is uh, taking a patch of 70 by 70 size and then by the end of the network it is outputting uh, zero or one all right so thereby we just uh, what we did this entire uh, here in this part of the discussion is checking that my uh, discriminator network here is actually implementing the patch can architecture that was talked about in the paper now uh, so okay so now with that i am completely done with the uh, explaining generator and discriminator class and now i can move forward for the next section uh, that is uh, I have to explain the train but before that I have to touch upon utils and the data loader uh, methods as well let's do that so starting with the utils.py file this file has just some utilities method uh, let's quickly go through them because they are very standard kind of functions so the first one a small method to convert to RGB it, it will take an image and convert to RGB format I'm just using image.new then giving this argument RGB and then the from the argument i'm taking image dot size and uh, 
uh, then rgb image dot paste finally returning this rgb image next class is image data set so this will this is my data loader uh, method or data loader class and this is again very standard boilerplate uh, code here uh, and this is uh, pretty much standard uh, loader that you will see in almost all PyTorch related computer vision projects where you will have three function uh, this first this underscore underscore init this is a, a constructor function a constructor method then you will have a get item method and finally you will have a lane method and in my uh, constructor i am just uh, uh, configuring my uh, the data set here uh, so uh, let's quickly check my data set file structure then these functions will make sense so the data set that i'm using for this project is the pretty popular uh, uc berkeley cyclegan data set uh, this is the uh, this is the url for that and they have quite a few a uh, very standard and very popular cyclegan data set here all are super popular here the like horse to zebra uh, uh, apple to orange these are super popular that you will see in many projects implemented and the one that i am using for this uh, project is this one summer to winter yosemite so i actually uh, this is just two sets of unpaired images uh, ima photos uh, uh, one for summer and one for winter from the yosemite national park and i already downloaded the uh, data set into my google drive and this uh, this is the data set after unzipping it uh, so i have four folders here test a test b train a train b uh, so data set a and b and that that's how i am uh, i am configuring my image data set loader method here in my uh, function so i am just doing uh, making use of this glob module of python to join my root folder and then with the percentage a uh, and then with the mode and mode is coming from my uh, arguments which will be train or test uh, basically wh what i am doing here is just replicating the folder structure uh, that is uh, i will have two folders one for train a one for train b and again depending on the mode if i change it to test then it will be test a test b that's exactly how my data set is uh, uh, structured the folder structure of the data set and i'm also passing a uh, argument named transforms underscore and um, uh, we can define our the transforms to be applied in this argument uh, yes and then these get item method so basically uh, these get what this get item method uh, does is that it returns the selected samples in the data set by indexing this function is used uh, by pytorch's data set module to get a sample and construct the data set when initiated it will loop through this function creating a sample from each instance of the data set so when uh, the sample corresponding to a given index is called uh, this underscore underscore get item method uh, gets executed so the so this method contains a logic for what should be returned when we ask for the indexed data point index will be the integer between zero and the length of the data set and the length of the data set is uh, returned by this method len which just returning uh, the max of len self dot files a and len self dot files b in this case because i have two different uh, folders here and uh, in my this uh, variable image a uh, that's just my uh, image dot open and from all the files a i am opening that indexed uh, indexed uh, image and with this unaligned argument this is coming from the argument to this class i can take care of both aligned and unaligned image set in my input data set and then here i'm just converting depending on whether the image is in rgb or not i'm if they are not in rgb then i'm converting them to rgb uh, and i'm doing that of course for both set a and set b and finally i am applying the transforms to my image and uh, these transforms i will define in my train.py file before the training starts and we'll go through them uh, in a second and finally i'm from this entire class i'm just returning a dict uh, the a key uh, a keyword will contain all the items a and b will contain all the items b 
and now a very important technique that was implemented in this paper called replay buffer let's quickly go to the paper to uh, read about that one so i think that was on page five Uh, under the implementation section 4, you will see these uh, uh, training details. So they are talking about second to uh, in here. They explain this replay buffer method implementation and what they did. So to reduce model oscillation, we follow uh, Srivastava strategy. And uh, this is another paper that was published by Srivastava. And uh, that's where this replay buffer concept was originally proposed. And uh, in this cycle again paper, uh, these UC Berkeley researchers uh, implemented that same strategy of replay buffer. So uh, what they say is we follow Srivastava strategy and update the discriminator using a history of generated images rather than the ones produced by the largest generators. We keep an image buffer that stores the 50 previously created images. So basically this is a strategy for stabilizing the cycle GAN training and it this replay buffer concept is only used in the discriminator network and it controls how the generated images are added to the replay buffer and then sampled from it. So basically the replay buffer returns the newly added images with a probability of 0.5 otherwise it sends an older generated image and replaces the older image with the newly generated image and we will see the implementation in a second but before that and the entire thing is done uh, for to reduce the model oscillation now i before going into the code the implementation of this just uh, uh, quickly go to the original paper because i went to the original paper that was published in Ju uh, july 2017 by srivastava and other researchers uh, and this is where these uh, this technique of adding a replay buffer was first published let's quickly go to the section i think that was in page three of this yes so this is uh, some images of this paper where this buffer of refined images the concept of buffer was implemented so this is the important section where they are talking about this replay buffer uh, that is updating discriminator using a history of refined images so uh, another problem of adversarial training is that the discriminator network only focuses on the latest refined images. This lack of memory cause one divergence of the adversarial training and two the refiner network reintroducing the artifacts that the discriminator has forgotten about. Any refined image generated by the refiner network at any time during the entire training procedure is a fake image for the discriminator hence the discriminator should be able to classify all these images as fake based on this observation we introduce uh, a method to improve the stability of adversarial training by updating the discriminator using a history of refined images rather than only the ones in the current mini batch so this is the main point a method to improve the stability uh, to let me put a border improve the stability of adversarial training by updating the discriminator using a history of refined images rather than only the ones in the current mini batch we slightly modify algorithm one to have a buffer of refined images generated by previous network let b be the size of the buffer and b be the mini batch size used in algorithm at each iteration discriminator training we compute the discriminator loss function by sampling b by two images from the current refiner network and sampling the additional b by two images from the buffer okay these are some implementation more details uh, this is not so much important right now for our implementation but this is this red bordered one is the most important one uh, and uh, yeah that's what i implemented so let's now go back to my code so here is the code for replay buffer uh, basically it uh, it keep uh, we keep keep an image buffer that stores the 50 previously created images and in my initializer that's what that's why i'm doing a uh, assert uh, test here that is a max size more than zero then empty buffer and self dot max size is kept at uh, default to 50. And this push and pop is a main method which uh, basically controls how generated images are added to the replay buffer and sampled from it. 
so uh, first i'm running a loop loop through the entire data and data is argument to my push and pop that will be my input images data set and uh, for each element of the data set first i'm doing an on squeeze with torch dot on squeeze and then if the, uh, these uh, length of the data set is less than my max size then i'm purely just simply adding them uh, uh, into my uh, to return array because this to return array is a final uh, array that will be returned from these entire class so if this is less than max size i have to add it because uh, these uh, because the whole purpose of these class is to uh, store 50 uh, 50 previously generated images so i'm just adding it here if it is less than the max size length and then um, i am checking two things uh, before uh, first i'm checking if the uh, if the probability if the probability is more than 50 percent then i will be running uh, this block that is here, the rule is uh, returns newly added image with a probability of 0 0.5. So first I am doing is uh, just creating a uh, probability distribution from random.uniform. And uh, if that is more than 0 0.5, then uh, selecting a random index from my max size with this line random.randint. And then I am returning these newly uh, newly selected or newly uh, generated image uh, and appending that to my to return variable that is to return dot append self dot data i and clone cloning will just uh, create a, a copy of the tensor and uh, then i also need to replace the older image with the newly generated image and that is this line that is after after uh, appending the self dot data i then the self dot data i becomes my new element and what is element this is each element from uh, data dot data and uh, if this uh, random probability distribution does not generate more than 0 0.5 then this else clause is activated and here the rule is uh, otherwise it sends an older generated image in this case i have to append the element itself to my to return app to return array which is my final return from this entire class and finally i am from this entire class i'm returning these to return uh, by wrapping it within a torch.cat and also a, a variable a module of torch so this torch.cat just concatenates uh, a given sequence of sequence tensors to the given dimension all right that's replay buffer and then uh, the next very important concept to implement is learning rate scheduling in cyclegan let's uh, first quickly check the paper what they talk about learning rate scheduling here and they say that we keep the same learning rate for the first 100 epochs and linearly decay the rate to zero over the next 100 epochs so the total training will run for 200 epochs and the first 100 epochs the learning rate will remain same at the base rate or the initial rate and after from 101 to 200 i have to reduce linearly reduce the learning rate so that by the end of the training that is end of the 200 epochs it becomes zero and to implement this the first thing i will do is to use this uh, very popular uh, module of pytorch for scheduling the learning rate that is torch.optim.lrscheduler.lambda r and the thing to understand here is that that is um, uh, this lambda r function takes a takes an argument called lr lambda that sets the learning rate of each parameter group to the initial learning rate times a given function that means uh, when i implement this uh, this function each new learning rate uh, will be equal to the old that is a base learning rate or the initial learning rate multiplied by lambda epoch and this lambda can be a function or can be an integer a value to multiply this initial learning rate with so this is the most fundamental thing to uh, understand and then let's go back to my utils function to check my implementation so this is where i am implementing uh, this concept it's a very simple method let's understand this and this uh, this class basically just returns the original base learning rate if my 
uh, current epoch is less than 100 and 100 means this one decay start epoch this argument and in this case of the cycle can decay start epoch is 100 very clearly written in in the paper so in if the current epoch is less than 100 then just return the original learning rate that is a base learning rate and if it is more than the decay then do this calculation here that is uh, this line uh, just return this line and how this line is working we will see in a second but first in the azard statement of the class i'm just checking that uh, total number of epoch is uh, minus decay start epoch is greater than zero that is basically uh, total number of epoch should be uh, more than 100 only then this whole thing will be applicable otherwise it will give uh, uh, assertion error and um, all right so now checking for these um, uh, below line checks whether the current epoch has uh, exceeded the decay epoch i have put some comments here to make it clear for example if the current epoch is 80 then uh, see what happens then max zero current epoch is 80 it will be 80 and self dot offset in this case will be uh, was zero we'll come to we'll see that when implementing in the train dot pi and minus self dot decay start epoch so if for the for the epoch of 80 i will get this value within the max function so max 0 80 minus 10 80 sorry 80 minus 100 uh, that is 0 max 0 minus 20 which will return me 0 that means in this entire expression that is a whole return statement uh, this numerator part will become 0 in that case so 0 by something will return me 0 so the uh, step function will return me 1 and that will be the return value from this lambda function and uh, actually this return value is the multiplicative factor which will be multiplied with my base learning rate what we saw in this uh, in this formula here so the uh, the way the, that uh, these uh, learning rate scheduler scheduler of pytorch will work is that this uh, base learning rate will be multiplied by the uh, multiplicative factor coming out of the lambda function and that will be my new learning rate and when it is one my original learning rate continues and that's a that's a case for any value of epoch which is less than 100 now see uh, what i will get for any value which is more than 100 and now let's say my epoch is uh, 110 which is more than 100 then then see what these lambda function will return so i have just put these um, uh, return statement here uh, and in this case for epoch equal to 100 this will be the calculation 1 minus max 0 110 plus 0 this offset we, uh, is remaining 0 we will see that in our implementation minus self dot decay start epoch which is 100 divide this whole numerator by uh, self dot number of epochs which is 200 in this case in the case of cycle gan we will be running up to 200 minus self dot decay start epoch again which is 100 and this will return me 1 minus max 0 to 10 which will return me 10 uh, that is uh, this expression will become 10 by 100 that is 1 tenth so the final output from this calculation will be 0 0.9 so in the case of epoch equal to 110 my multiplicative factor is 0 0.9 that means here in this expression the new learning rate will be decayed or reduced by these factor that is the new learning rate will be the base learning rate multiplied by 0 0.9 and that's how the decay decay factor will work with uh, learning rate scheduler now let's see another example say my epoch is 120 in this case going uh, doing the same calculation i will get the multiplicative factor multiplicative flat factor as 0 0.8 so my new learning rate will be the initial learning rate multiplied by 0 0.8 again it is decaying and remember this initial learning rate is a original base learning rate that we defined at the very start of the training it is not getting updated it is not the updated it is not the immediately preceding learning rate so this learning rate is original base so that means if i continue reducing this way then there will come an epoch where my learning rate becomes zero actually and that's the purpose of uh, this calculation here that is uh, uh, this lambda or lambda lr function that is by the end of 200 epochs i need to make the learning rate to zero by continuously decaying from 100 to 200 
so to summarize in this line what we are doing is we are dividing the learning rate equally for the last 100 epoch and keep reducing the base learning rate from 101 epoch up to 200 epoch and in doing that because we are dividing the last 100 equally by the end of 200 the reduction of learning rate will be so much that it will come to the value of zero all right that was about the learning rate scheduling and the last function the last method under my utils file is uh, uh, these initialize conv weights normal uh, this is just to initialize the weights and the guideline here was very clearly given in the paper so for the conv layer i am initializing with the normal distribution and for the mean and standard deviation i am taking 0 0.0 and 0 0.02 and for the bias layers it is uh, it is initialized to some constant and that's why i'm using init.constant and giving the value of 0, 0.0 and um, then in uh, for batch norm 2d i have the normal distribution again and in this case a mean and standard deviation is 1 and 0 0.02 and uh, for the bias under batch norm 2d again it's a constant data initialized with the value of 0.0, 0. So this method I will be using inside my training file uh, to initialize the weights. All right, that's uh, all about my utils files. And now I'm fully ready to run my training. So let's go to my train file. Uh, here, uh, uh, remember this train.py file has a dependence on the other two files because all the methods are defined in the other two files. Uh, so that's why I'm importing uh, from utils import pretty much everything and from cyclegan also import everything with this uh, asterisk syntax and then I'm defining the CUDA because if CUDA is available I definitely do want to use that and also uh, related to this I am also defining a, a variable called tensor which will be uh, using uh, my GPU CUDA if my GPU is available otherwise it will be using CPU and the way you define it is something like this uh, that is torch.cuda float tensor if CUDA otherwise torch.tensor so the difference that is uh, generally both torch.tensor and torch.cuda are equivalent you can do everything you like with them both the key difference is that just uh, that torch.tensor occupies cpu memory while torch.cuda.tensor occupies gpu memory and of course operations on a cpu tensor are computed with cpu while operations on the gpu will use your gpu cores and your virtual ram of the gpu uh, all right so that's about the initial setup and then uh, uh, these are all my hyperparameters so i'm just defining a hyperparameter class which will be um, uh, will will return a dict format and uh, then these are the actual values that i'll be passing to this hyperparameter so all these epoch equal to zero n epoch 200 because this is the total number of epochs i will be running uh, data set train mode train and test batch size i'm going to use four remember this is a relatively larger size of photos that for these uh, summer to winter data set of cycle GAN, it is 256 by 256 size and my learning rate this is a base learning rate that's kept at 0 0.0002 decay start epoch is 100 just as defined in the paper uh, b1 b2 are bias terms uh, number of cpu core i'm using eight uh, you can change it of course depending on your hardware situation image size i'm uh, using 128 we'll see where this variable is being used channels three because it, these are all color channels n critic will come to this later uh, sample interval 100 number of residual we'll come to these these are kind of things that will be required for uh, plotting the images we'll see the usage usage of this in in a second and a num number of residual blocks uh, we are using 19 here and the original paper suggested two of them six residual block or nine residual block but they also talked about that how you can increase the residual block to make your network even more deeper and which will improve your overall result and lambda uh, cyc and lambda id these are actually the weightage to be used for my uh, cycle consistency loss which is 10 and my uh, identity loss the weight here is 5 we will see this is this is the pure just the weight so whatever cycle consistency loss you get you have to multiply uh, that with 10 uh, all right let's move ahead so first here i'm just uh, declaring my root path 
I ran these both in Google Drive and also if you want to run it, run it in Kaggle because Kaggle has this data set already, uh, then your root path will be the Kaggle root path. Uh, so in my case, I'll be using the Google Drive root path mainly because that's what I was running. And uh, uh, okay, so these are some small utility function here again in the train and these are just for plotting the images. Uh, nothing much to talk about them. These are extremely simple. Like for example, the show image will pretty much just use plt.show, convert the image accordingly from PyTorch to matplotlib and then just use plt.show to, uh, to visually display the image. Only one thing to remember here is that Note that how uh, I'm getting these uh, PyTorch images uh, in the NumPy, NumPy format uh, with image.numpy and then uh, before the final plt.show I am just transposing uh, the np image variable with np.transpose and I'm passing 1, 2, 0. So why is that? And the reason is the PyTorch module uh, PyTorch modules processing image data expect tensors to be in the format of CHW channel height width. That's how PyTorch sees its images. So when I have this NP image uh, tensor here, it is in the format channel height width. But uh, below or matplotlib expect image arrays in the form of HWC height width channel. So to use uh, the uh, use the PyTorch image into matplotlib, I have to convert it or reshape it to put the channel first and then width and height and that's why i'm doing this transpose one two zero one here is my is my uh, is my height two is the last uh, parameter in pytorch which was width so i'm bringing it in the second position and zero this represent this was representing channel under the pytorch uh, configuration and now it will uh, be at the in the last position and uh, without using np.transpose i could have also used uh, plt.im show and then uh, use a permute function so i could have used something like this that is plt.im show that within a bracket i pass pytorch tensor image dot permute one two zero it would have done the same thing and then my next function these are all small small couple of function this is uh, two image um, here i'm just using x dot view to flatten it and then i'm taking x dot size zero that is uh, from the image i'm taking uh, zero eighth a zeroth uh, element and then uh, also putting hp dot channels hp dot um, image size and hp dot image size because uh, here image size means uh, my uh, height and width and channels is just a number of channels and all these i'm getting from the top uh, here hyperparameter uh, th things like this and uh, we will see that where these two images are uh, used in a second and uh, another function small utility function here for plotting the final output it is uh, again just nothing just reading from the path the image and then mentioning a fixed size and then ultimately showing the image that's all and then here i am defining some transforms so uh, very simple transforms i have used only that is resize my images to hp dot uh, img size here also img size and uh, then i'm converting all the image tensor to pytorch2 tensor method and also applying normalization with uh, uh, these variables 0 0.5 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 for all the three dimensions of the input image similarly uh, the same thing uh, so this is my transforms and then i'm applying the transforms to my train data loader and test data loader validation data loader uh, i'm actually naming my test data loader to be validation data loader here and uh, yeah so uh, uh, and validation data loader is coming from my image data set that we discussed in detail while we were discussing the utility function the very uh, first class was it was image data set which is what uh, passing uh, all the input images to my training model uh, all right now i have another small function to um, uh, save image sample this is again nothing much to talk about it is just uh, creating a grid to plot the images uh, so the save image samples just uh, uh, saves the image 
uh, in a particular path and the path will be defined here uh, and I was saving them in my uh, collab session storage uh, uh, that I will have during the uh, in the virtual machine of collab uh, of course you can define any other path in your local machine or any cloud path in Google storage etc and uh, also note that uh, this function will plot the images uh, after the generator generates the fake images and that's why I am uh, these gen a b and gen b a which are my two generator objects they are set to eval mode here that's because here there is no training going on and i want to switch off the gradient calculation and that's why uh, they are set to eval mode and uh, uh, yeah so otherwise this function is simple and then finally uh, with after all the utility function my uh, overall structure is ready to be trained but before training i have to uh, declare all these uh, uh, variables that is my loss uh, initialize models buffers and criteria etc so first I'm uh, defining three loss function here remember we have uh, three losses in uh, cycle GAN and the first one is a normal GAN loss which is here this line and then I have uh, uh, a cycle consistency loss which is in this case L1 loss that was clearly defined in the paper so just to show you i came back to the paper here uh, this is my cycle consistency loss we can clearly see that uh, this is the l1 loss uh, that's written here that one one here means it's a l1 loss and it was uh, written in somewhere else in the paper as well uh, that uh, here they are just uh, taking the difference between two images produced uh, by the reconstructed image and the original image in the same domain all right so that's my cycle consistency loss and the third one is my identity loss again this was an l1 loss and remember identity uh, what is identity con loss that's uh, when to a particular generator i pass the target image itself that is say for example a generator is supposed to generate images in the domain a and i pass to the generator domain a itself as an input that means it should not make any changes that means the image you generate should not have uh, any difference with the target image so that kind of loss is measured with the third uh, loss in cycle GAN which is identity loss and this is an annual loss and so those are my three losses this input shape variable is just um, for defining the channels uh, height and width and the height and width that is Im image size these are coming from the hyperparameter and then initialize my generator to generator and to discriminator the all important uh, two most powerful thing in cycle GAN. so gen ab is coming from my generator resnet class i am passing to it input shape and also the number of residual blocks uh, and same for gen ba uh they are actually uh, while uh, creating those two objects they are actually the same but while i will uh, the way that i will use it inside my train that's where they will output different things because gen to gen ab that will generate images in the b domain and because they will generate images in the b domain to the input of gen ab i have to pass images from domain a Similarly, for Gen BA, they will generate images in the A domain. That means I have to pass as input images from domain B. And uh, for dis for discriminator A and discriminator B, it's obvious they will uh, do the classification for the two uh, classes of images generated by the other two generators. And then if CUDA, so here I am just passing all these Gen AB, Gen BA, DISK A, DISK B and all the three criteria losses to be used uh, to use my CUDA core uh, if I have GPU in my machine. And of course, this CUDA we already have defined at the very top. Uh, where was that? Uh, here, CUDA equal to true if torch.cuda is available, else false. And then uh, in this section here, I'm just initializing the weights. Uh, so all my generator AB and Gen BA and the two discriminator will be initialized with by with these um, initialized conv weights normal. And also note that I'm using uh, the apply method here to invoke my function that was defined in the utils.py. That is this function, this method, initialize conv weights normal, and that will uh, that will that has all the necessary 
resources within the method to generate the webs uh, it this function does not need anything complex all right so my waves are generated here and then uh, this is where i am creating the buffers and we discussed this reply replay buffer function uh, in detail uh, just a while back so here i am invoking those uh, replay buffer to be created for my uh, fake a buffer and fake b buffer so this is uh, uh, so fake a will be created by generator b a and fake b images will be cre created by generator a b and these two variables will hold the buffers of those created images uh, and the buffer size is 50 that is it will hold the 50 images and uh, uh, will be passed to the discriminator from this buffer and now defining the optimizers this is a simple three lines of code because i have a generator two generators and two discriminators i'm actually defining the same optimizer for both my generator which is adam optimizer and uh, a learning rate to adam op optimizer is coming from the hyperparameter beta is coming from again hyperparameters b1 and b2 Uh, oops, I just realized while I was uh, explaining the hyperparameter at the very top, I mentioned these uh, uh, B1 and B2 to be biased. No, they are my beta to be passed to the optimizers. And after the optimizers, I have my learning rate schedulers. So this is where I am using this function that we discussed in detail that is um, uh, this lambda error class so again this lambda error class ultimately will give me a multiplicative factor that will be multiplied with my initial learning rate to decay my learning rate from 101th epoch up to 200 epoch and that's what it is supposed to do here though so i am uh, just uh, declaring three variables uh, for learning rate scheduler g uh, then uh, discriminator a and discriminator b uh, and this one will be applicable learning rate scheduler g will be applicable for both my generators and uh, all i am doing uh, that i am bringing in this torch.optim.lr scheduler dot lambda lr module and to that i am passing optimizer g and this is the important factor so uh, this is how it will be implemented. So LR lambda takes a lambda function in this case that is uh, my lambda LR class and to that I'm passing my number of epoch then this is this was my offset and this is my starting epoch from where the decay will start and to that dot step uh, this dot step is coming from the definition of the function definition of the module in PyTorch all right with that uh, all the initial setup is ready and now my final train method so i am defining a very long just like in many other gans the train method in gan would be quite long because there are so many steps so many ways to handle or control the uh, two uh, two gans GAN, that is generator and the discriminators and here it will be even more lengthier because here i have two generators and two discriminators and so this is my uh, diff train method it's quite long let's see the length of this it goes on and on and on and also it looks slightly longer because i have put very detailed uh, comments inside for you to uh, uh get it very quickly so this is my train method and this takes all these list of uh, arguments all right let's uh, start off understanding the steps uh, it looks very long but actually it is uh, much easier while you start implementing them because the uh, steps in cycle gan are so clear that is how you control the two generators and two discriminators so uh first step uh, just as usual i am uh, starting my loop here and uh, then within each epoch i'm starting another loop for doing my batching and that is i'm looping over the train data loader which will give me uh, the index and also the actual input or the uh, batch images and then i am setting two variables real a and real b uh, this is uh, uh, this will just take the actual images from batch and remember from our data loader function we returned a uh, dict that is uh, this is my data image data set uh, uh, class and from here i finally returned this kind of dict a will have all the items a which are all my 
uh, a set images and b will have all my b domain images so uh, that's why my real a is uh, accessing them with this a keyword and real b accessing all the images with the b keyword and i'm uh, also applying this type tensor so that they are converted to appropriate tensor based on my gpu or cpu and then in the next two lines i am just creating two vectors this valid and fake valid vector will have all its element filled up with one which i am generating with np dot once and the size i am deciding by this real a dot size and i'm taking the zeroth element and the fake vector will have all elements filled up with zero because they represent the fake generated images and again the size is coming from real a dot size and um, uh, yeah, so then uh, I am um, putting the generators, um, I am switching on the train mode for both Gen AB and Gen BA. And uh, again, this uh, we remember that is Gen BA and Gen AB was defined uh, uh, here. So Gen AB is my one generator, Gen BA is my next generator. And uh, Gen again, Gen AB will produce uh, B domain images and Gen BA will produce A domain images. Uh, very important to remember that because your training structure will be uh, defined exactly, uh, exactly by understanding this that which generator takes what which mode or which uh, uh, domain images and it generates wh which domain uh, images as its output all right now that uh, both my generator is uh, switched on to train now i am uh, this is a standard line optimizer dot optimizer g dot zero grad uh, just because going by the usual standard way that pytorch work that pytorch stores gradients in a mutable data structure so we need to set it to clean state before we use it otherwise it will have old information from a previous iteration that's why in pytorch for every mini batch during the training phase this is the typical practice which is to explicitly set the gradients to zero before starting to do back propagation that is before updating the weights and biases because pytorch accumulates the gradients on subsequent backward passes so if you don't explicitly set the gradients to zero the gradient would be a combination of the old gradients and the new gradients that is the old gradients which you already have used to update your model parameters and also the newly computed gradients and in that case the gradient descent will break that is the descent would therefore point in some other direction than the intended direction towards the minimum and now create my identity loss and to do that the main uh, key point is that I have to pass to the generator the same target level image that means for example gen ba is supposed to take in images from domain b and generate images for domain a but i will do the opposite here that is i will pass to this the target images that is real a images and it is also supposed to create real a images so that's what i'm doing here i will pass real a and then i will see that whether it gives me the same kind same domain image and that's my identity loss and so now this function gen ba by taking real a images will also produce images for the real a and that the difference between that output and real a that is my identity loss and that's i'm calling less loss id a similarly for loss id b uh, i will do this exact same thing but for this is now for real b so uh, normally gen a b is supposed to take as input real a and produce fake b but now i will pass real b and see that the the, uh, the output from these function which will be in the b domain what is the difference of that output with the actual ground truth real b and that's my uh, loss id for b and then in this line i am just calculating the average of these two identity losses and uh, okay so i'm done with the identity loss here and then uh, i have to calculate the regular gan loss and for that i have to create fake b images by passing real a to my uh, gen ab here in this line uh, this gen ab will create images in the b domain 
by taking in real a images and then for calculating the loss i have also i also have to bring in the discriminator b which will uh, discriminate between fake b and real b so in this line that's what i'm doing uh, that is a discriminator b that will take fake b as its input because it will create a, a vector of 0 1 that is a real fake kind of vector and that needs to be uh, so that's my prediction and this is the actual ground truth that we created already this vector at the top valid is uh, the vector containing all ones uh, which is my ground truth uh, target uh, target values so that's my loss gan a b and then i also have to do the same thing for gan b a so i create fake a images by bringing in a gen b a to this i pass the real b images which will create fake a and then to uh, to calculate the losses i have to bring in discriminator a to that i have to pass fake a so this is my prediction from the discriminator which is uh, binary vector zero containing zero one elements and to with that i compare my ground truth that is valid and that's my loss from gan b a so now i have two losses from my regular gan uh, the first one is here loss gan a b and the second one is here loss gan b a and now i take the average of those two losses in this line and next i'll be calculating the all important forward cycle consistency loss and backward cycle consistency loss so quickly revisit the original concept again in a second that uh, cycle consistency loss is uh, th this that uh, a single image has to pass through two generators to create my cycle consistency for example uh, these uh, their starting position here is a horse image which is the original domain a image you can think that pass through the generator one to create my zebra image then this output from generator one is again passed through the next generator two to create back to horse image so now after the original horse image passes through two generators it is reconstructed of again of horse image and ideally in the ideal scenario these two horse image should be exactly the same but they will not be same in practicality and to the extent that they are different that's my cycle consistency loss so this is what we are calculating here that's a forward cycle consistency loss and if we started from here in the opposite direction after two cycles that would be my backward cycle consistency loss and here in this code i am calculating exactly uh, that cycle consistency forward cycle consistency loss in the first uh, section here so uh, if we go back to the paper again just to quickly refer uh, so this is where they are defining the cycle consistency loss in the original paper and they are just saying f of gx minus x it's a l1 uh, l1 loss that they are calculating and for the backward it will be g of fy minus y so that's uh, for the first one uh, that's what i'm doing so recon so for calculating the forward cycle consistency loss i have to compare the reconstructed a images with real a images of domain a and the lambda that is a weightage factor for cycle loss is 10 so penalizing 10 times and forcing to learn the translation that's the purpose of uh, the uh, cycle consistency loss here so ma this line uh, is pretty simple just invoking criterion cycle to reconstructed a and comparing that with real a and reconstructed a i calculated here by passing generator b a the fake b so normally generator b a should take real b but here to generate my reconstructed a instead of real b i am passing generator b a fake b and how was fake b generated fake b generated by this line so so if, if you can see now this real a images that i'm comparing to calculate my cycle consistency loss for a that is a forward cycle consistency loss this real a is going through two cycles of generator so first real a went through generator a b to produce fake b and now the same fake b i am using here 
to pass to my generator BA to produce the original A domain image and that I am naming as reconstructed A. Now this reconstructed A in the ideal scenario in the ideal world should be exactly like real A because they are generated to be the to be the A domain image. But to the extent these two are different that is original real A and reconstructed A that will be uh, captured by my forward cycle consistency loss which I am naming in this variable loss cycle A. And now exactly in the similar way I calculate backward cycle consistency loss as well. So I first reconstruct the B by taking the fake A images through uh, two, two cycles of generator. So originally fake A was generated here that is uh, passing uh, real b to gen b a now this fake a again is passed to gen a b to produce reconstructed b and then i calculate the difference between reconstructed b and the real b and that's my uh, cycle loss b cycle consistency loss b and then i take the in this line i take the average of these two cycle consistency losses and so now looks like all my losses are calculated now time to create my final generator loss so this line is uh, uh, does exactly that and uh, so total generator loss is original GAN loss goes as it is and cycle consistency loss is weighted by this lambda cycle lambda underscore cyc it is coming from my hyperparameter and uh, uh, then the loss identity is again weighted by this lambda id which will be a hyperparameter that will be passed separately and now i start my backward propagation so loss g dot backward and after the backward i need to update the weights and biases so the classic optimizer underscore g dot step this step method will implement uh, this classic function that is uh, updated theta that is theta at k plus one equal to the previous theta that is theta k minus learning rate multiplied by the gradient of the loss function that is y hat the loss of the loss between y hat and y uh, okay so uh, with all these uh, up to this point all my generator training was going on uh, so with this final updation of weights and biases my generator training is done and now i am into the world of discriminator and uh, with discriminators i will have two blocks to train my discriminator first training discriminator a here and then i also have to train discriminator b the overall structure and flow is exactly the same so let's go through them so in discriminator a first just like we did in the generator i have to set my accumulated gradients to zero and that's what this line does by invoking the zero grad method and then i have to calculate two losses my loss real and fake loss now loss real is simple you just pass to the criterion gan this is original gan function regular gan function to that you pass the vector generated by the discriminator classification classification method and also the valid vector that is the uh, difference between these two is my loss real for discriminator a and remember this valid this is just the vector containing all the one as its element because they represent the real images on of the ground truth and now to calculate the fake loss first i have to make use of the buffer well remember we discussed in detail uh, while discussing this uh, replay buffer method created in the utils.py file that the the generated images don't go to directly to the discriminator they go to the buffer uh, with a buffer size of 50 and then from that buffer storage they are passed to discriminator to a function that was defined within this class called push and pop so this function uh, practically just uh, returns newly added images with a probability of 0 0.5 uh, otherwise it sends older generated images and uh, in both cases they are sending images uh, fake images to the discriminator for the discriminator to make decision whether they are real or fake so that's what exactly is what's happening here that is uh, 
uh, my fake a is the output of fake a buffer that we defined earlier on top of that i'm invoking push and pop and to that i am passing fake a images then this fake a will be passed to my discriminator a and i'm also uh, bringing in detach method that will uh, get the actual values from the tensor so that will actually detach the gradient layer or the gradient uh, tree from pytorch tensor because i don't need those extra gradient thing to be carried on while i'm doing all these um, uh, calculation here just for the discriminator because there is no training going on i do not need those gradients to be attached and that's why i'm detaching them here anyway so uh, discriminator a will make a decision on these uh, fake a images uh, by comparing them with the uh, uh, um, um, fake images of real and uh, real and fake and then that uh, output vector from the discriminator will be compared with fake which we have defined at the very top containing all zeros and that will be my loss fake uh, and of course i am bringing in i'm invoking the criterion gan on them uh, which is my regular gan loss here so now i have uh, uh, the total loss for discriminator a calculated in this line loss real plus loss fake divided by two and also remember the what the paper says about these discriminator uh, loss calculation let's go back i think it was mentioned uh here so yeah so in practice we divide the objective uh by two uh, while optimizing d which slows down the rate at which d learns relative to the rate of g so this is the line uh, very important but i i have to be honest i do not exactly understand that how exactly dividing by two uh, slows down uh, slows down the optimization of d and why exactly the researchers did that here so if you know that please uh, put that in the comment and now uh, that uh, my loss disk is the calculation is done for the entire loss uh, disk a uh, now do the back propagation with this backward function again uh, these back uh, these backward function what they do is just that the uh, del theta will come will be computed uh, with this single call that is uh, del theta means the gradient of theta and uh, after calculating the gradients with the backward function i also have to update the weights and biases and this line does that with the step function and again this line what this line is doing very much is just updating the theta that is a new theta at k plus one will be the old theta minus this is actually a minus symbol minus my learning rate multiplied by the gradient of theta and the, the loss between y hat and y that is the predicted y and actual y that's what the step function will do okay so that was my discriminator a training and exactly the same way i have to train the discriminator b so here in this block i am doing exactly that what we did for uh, discriminator a so let's go through them quickly so for discriminator b exactly just like the discriminator a first is zero grad always before starting training you always have to do that to uh, to uh, make a clean slate of gradients otherwise it will be accumulated then my real loss is um, calculated uh, by application of criterion gan and to disk b i pass real b and uh, compare that with valid that's my loss the loss real and for fake loss again first i generate my fake b from the buffer i don't pass them directly to the discriminator b but i generate make use of the buffer function push and pop and then generate this buffer and those buffers i'm passing to my discriminator b and detach the gradients then discriminator b will produce a vector of real fake real fake things like that that is 0 1 0 1 etc and compare that with my fake vector that was defined at the very top containing all zeros for the ground truth images and the comparison between them or the loss between these two vector is my fake loss and then the total discriminator b loss will just be uh, loss real plus loss fake divided by two and then i do the back back propagation with the backward method that is calculate the gradient of the loss and also update the weights and biases with the step method and my final loss d is loss disk a plus loss disk b divided by two 
and with that my discriminator training is also over so i am done pretty much with the uh, main uh, main skeleton of the training the rest of the section is just for logging purpose and that is when the epoch training is going on one after another so this is this part of the code is very short and simple and no point in spending even more time to explain this because anyway this video became longer than i thought it to be so just one thing the uh, these batches done batches left it is just a simple calculation that how many batches are done up to this epoch and how many batches are still left and that i am using to calculate how much more time i am left to it to complete the entire 200 batches of training and then i'm just uh, printing with all these uh, print statement i'm just printing uh, the various uh, status or the various statistics during my epoch training and also uh, i am finally i am outputting or plotting the images uh, by using these two method that we earlier defined plot output and save image sample so save image sample will actually save the image sample to my defined path a defined path and um, then this plot output will just plot the uh, final image that i got up to this point in the training uh, all right so here my training method this long training method gets over uh, yeah so the training method started from here quite a long method indeed but and then find uh, after the method was defined up to here and then i just need to execute the train method and i also uh, for the executing of the train method i also have to pass all these list of uh, uh, arguments and uh, most of them are coming from my hyperparameters that i have defined at the very top and a few only other things apart from the hyperparameter is all these generator and discriminator objects that were uh, created from the generator and the discriminator class and my fake a buffer fake b buffer etc anyway these are obvious so now my all three files are fully ready cyclegan.py train.py and utils.py now only thing left is that you have to uh, you uh, you have to run this train.py file so what i did i created a very small jupyter notebook uh, this Jupyter notebook almost has nothing. It's just three cells. Uh, extremely simple. And uh, because I ran this in Colab, I also connected my Google Drive because all my data set was uh, in my Google Drive uh, uh, storage. You can, of course, keep it in the Colab session storage as well. But in that case, when you close the Colab or uh, shut down the session, your data also will get deleted. So in the first cell in this Jupyter Notebook, I'm just connecting my Google Drive and checking the current directory and also the list of files uh, in my Colab. Uh, the list of files to run it in Colab, you just need to up upload these three files in Colab. That is cyclegan.py, trend.py and utils.py. Keep all of them in the same directory and also Jupyter Notebook in the same exact directory like the other files. And then just run this simple command that is python trend.py. This will just execute these trend.py. UI file and because my train.fui file is importing all the relevant module all the modules in fact from the other two files with these two lines from utils import star from cyclegan import star that means you only need to execute this train.py file and that will start the entire training so let me quickly show you how the training looks like in google collab but before that, just remember my data set here was the uh, UC Berkeley uh, CycleGAN data set that's very popular and I, oh, I have used summer to winter data set. Ob obviously, I will uh, keep the link of that in my description of the video. And uh, so the purpose in this training for that data set was to convert summer images to winter images and uh, so for that we were given a huge set of summer images and also a huge set of uh, winter images and uh, uh, through this training on the test data set i have to convert the summer test data set to winter data set and uh, when i was running this training in my google collab uh, right after like two epochs i got my uh, generated images look like this so i ran this only for two epochs remember the original training needs to go through 200 epochs so we can see this is at the very top left this is the original summer image and this is the generated fake image 
and they are looking similarly for the this one original image fake original fake and obviously you can see right after two epochs we can see reasonably comparable images obviously the fake images are still very blurry we cannot see anything properly but that's just after two epochs so you can imagine uh, the kind of result i got after 300 epochs so uh, i will probably show you uh, right now this is still going on in my uh, se separate collab uh, and it's quite a GPU intensive like for example in uh, my uh, free collab version it almost took my entire GPU so I could not run it for long and then I uh, then I switched on my uh, Golab Collab Pro there it took almost 15 plus GB of uh, virtual RAM uh, that is a GPU RAM so it's very GPU intensive uh, training in this data set so uh, just keep that in mind but anyway if you can run up to 300 epochs you will get very very great result with this uh, notebook this video is about understanding the architecture of wasserstein gan or wgan as it's popularly known and in the next video that's coming up tomorrow i will implement wgan from scratch with pytorch so here i'm looking at the original paper of wasserstein gan that was published in December 2017 by Martin Arzovsky, Saumit Chintala and Leon Botu. This paper is superbly mathematics heavy, lots of equation across the paper, but uh, nothing to get scared of because uh, the underlying architecture is not that complex really. Basically, Wasserstein GAN or WGAN is an extension of the regular GAN that seeks an alternate way of training the generator model to better approximate the distribution of data observed in a given training dataset. So, Wasserstein GAN is a type of generative adversarial network that minimizes an approximation of the earth mover distance or EM distance rather than the Jensen Shannon divergence as in the original GAN formulation. So here is an example comparing a normal regular GAN architecture on the top left corner and on the bottom right I have a WGAN architecture. And one important factor to note here how the discriminator is different between WGAN and a normal GAN. So in the normal GAN when the discriminator gets its input both from the real samples that is real input data of images and also the fake images generated by the generator model then the discriminator outputs either true or false that is fake or real it's a binary output 0 1 but in WGAN the discriminator does not actually classify instances rather here for each instance, the discriminator outputs a number. This number does not have to be less than 1 or greater than 0. So we cannot use 0 0.5 as a threshold to decide whether an instance is real or fake. But the discriminator in WGAN training just tries to make the output bigger for real instances and smaller for fake instances. So in WGAN, instead of using the discriminator to classify or predict the probability of generated images as being real or fake, the WGAN changes the discriminator model with a critic that scores the realness or fakeness of a given image. So basically, the discriminator of WGAN just outputs a number, a score. So the core idea of working of WGAN is to utilize two probability distributions. One is the probability distribution of the generator, what you see here, which refers to the distribution from the output of the generator model. And the other is a probability distribution from the real images. So here, this is called uh, PR or P data sometimes. And the objective of WGAN is to ensure that both these probability distributions are close to each other so that the output generated is highly realistic and high quality. So now we can see that uh, these two distributions that is PG and P data are very far apart and the purpose after the training of WGAN what we want to do is to bring them together as close as possible so these distribution and this one should come close and to bring these two distribution closer to each other the fundamental thing we have to measure is the distance between these two distribution and for calculating the distance between these two probability distributions the paper suggests we have four options so let's go back to the paper 
I'm looking at section 2 under different distances and for each of the options they have also given the mathematical expression and in these expressions you will notice two common things or common terms PR and PG. Here PR represents the probability distributions of the real data and PG represents the probability distributions of the generated fake data. Our first option is total variation distance. Second one is schoolback labeler divergence or KL divergence as it's popularly known. And the third one is Jensen Shannon divergence. So this is the one that's normally used for all regular GAN, like for example DC GAN. And finally, the fourth option is earth mover distance or Wasserstein one distance. And in WGAN, this is the distance measurement for calculating the distance between our probability distribution of the real data and the probability distribution of uh, the generated fake data. And the whole purpose of WGAN is to calculate this distance first between the probability distribution of the real data and the probability distribution of fake data and then make this distance through training as small as possible so that these two distribution comes closer thereby the fake generated data comes as close to the original data as possible. And to make sense of these earth mover distance or Wasserstein one distance, let's look at this image. I have two distributions here, uh, one pile of dirt here and another pile of dirt here. And uh, then there is a tractor to move to make these this pile as close to this as possible and this is mathematically determined by how much work is needed to move this pile to this pile. So mathematically or more in formal term, these art mover distance or Wasserstein distance is defined by the minimum work needed to transform one distribution to another where work is defined as a product of mass of the distribution that has to be moved and the distance to be moved. And this is the mathematical expression of Wasserstein distance between PR and PG. Here, uh, this term uh, that is the pi, pr and pg within braces is the set of all joint distribution over x and y such that the marginal distributions are equal to pr and pg. And this term uh, that is gamma xy can be seen as the amount of mass that must be moved from x to y to transform pr to pg. So, uh, the Wasserstein distance is then the cost of the optimal transport plan between to convert PR to PG. And compared to the JS divergence or Jensen Shannon divergence, the Wasserstein distance has uh, these following advantages, which is uh, the Wasserstein distance is continuous and almost differentiable everywhere, which allows us to train the model to optimality. Then J's divergence locally saturates as the discriminator gets better, thus the gradients become zero and vanishes. So the problem of uh, vanishing gradient or exploding gradients comes into play. Then uh, the Wasserstein distance is a meaningful metric. It is con it converges to zero as the distribution get close to each other and diverges as they get further away. And lastly, the Wasserstein distance as objective function is more stable than using JS divergence. The mode collapse problem is also mitigated when using this distance. So overall, Wasserstein loss or W loss solves some big problems faced by regular GANs like mode collapse and vanishing gradients. But for it to work well, there is a special condition that needs to be met by the critic. So now we will see what the continuity condition on the critic neural network means and why that condition is important while when, when using W loss for training GANs. And I will spend uh, like five to seven minutes of time on this topic because it's so important to understand these. And also this is one of the fundamental building block while uh, architecting your training loop in your implementation. So here is a mathematical expression for Wasserstein loss and uh, the W loss is a simple expression that computes the difference between the expected values of the critics output for the real example X and its predictions on the fake example G of Z and Z here is the noise vector. So the generator tries to minimize this whole expression trying to get the generative examples 
to be as close as possible to the real examples but the critic wants to maximize this whole expression because it wants to differentiate between the reals and the fakes so the critic wants the distance to be as large as possible however for training gans i mean w gans using w loss the critic has a special condition and the condition is that the loss function needs to be something called one Lipschitz continuous or one L continuous for short. This condition sounds more sophisticated than it really is, but let's understand what this is. For a function like the critic's neural network to be at one L continuous, the norm of its gradient needs to be at most one. What that means is that the slope cannot be greater than one at any point. Its gradient cannot be greater than 1. To check if a function is indeed 1 Lipschitz continuous, for example, in this case, our function is fx equal to x squared, and that's why we get this graph of this function as a parabola. So, to check whether this is 1 Lipschitz continuous, you want to go along every point in this function and make sure its slope is less than or equal to 1, or its gradient is less than or equal to 1. And for doing that, what you can do is, we can actually draw two lines. One where the slope is exactly one at this certain point that you are evaluating the function. And one where the slope is negative one where you are evaluating our function. You want to make sure that the growth of this function never goes out of bounds from these two lines. And by the phrase out of bound, I mean this this area this green area uh, the, the the function cannot go out of this green area because within this green area our condition of one l continuous is valid because staying within these lines means that the function is growing linearly so in our case this function which is fx equal to x square this is not one Lipschitz continuous because the function is staying within the green area for only this section and also yeah pretty much only this section otherwise the entire the rest of the function all this white area the white area here this function is out of bounds of this green area that means it is growing more than linearly and this function is not 1L continuous let's look at another example here this is a smooth curved function and you want to check again every single point on this function before you can determine whether or not this is one Lipschitz continuous. So let's do that. Let's check various points on this function to make sure its slope is less than or equal to one or its gradient is less than or equal to one. And uh, here in this slide, we can see that this is, it looks good. That is, its uh, gradient is within this bounded green area. Here also, uh, the function is within the, within the bounds of the green. And here also, it looks good. And let's say you check every point of this function and uh, it never grows more than linearly. That is, every point of this function, the gradient remains within the bounds of this green. In that case, this function is 1L continuous. And so overall, why this condition of 1L continuity is so important for WGAN is because this condition is what ensures that the W loss function is not only continuous and differentiable, but also that it doesn't grow too much and maintain some stability during training. This is what makes the underlying earth mover distance or Wasserstein distance valid, which is what W loss is founded on. This is required for training both the critic and generator's neural network, and it also increases stability because the variation as the GAN learns will be bounded. To recap, the critic uses W loss for training, which needs to be one Lipschitz continuous in order for its underlying earth mover distance comparison between the reals and the fakes to be a valid comparison. Now, uh, in order to satisfy or trying to satisfy this condition during training, there are multiple different methods. And next, we will learn a couple of those methods. And the two most prominent and most well-known methods to enforce one Lipschitz continuity are these two, weight clipping and gradient penalty. Let's learn them in detail. But before getting into the details of weight clipping and gradient penalty, let's recall what it means by 1L continuity. 
So this is the mathematical expression for 1L continuity and this delta symbol here represents a gradient of fx and f is the critic function and x is my input image that is the uh, generated image by the generator and the whole expression that is his whole inequation just represents that the norm of these gradient being less than or equal to one and using l2 norm here because l2 norm is very common which just means that it's a euclidean distance that we are interested in so intuitively in two dimension it's that the slope is less than or equal to one at every single point of this function it will remain within these green triangles and only then this function will be called 1l continuous and now coming back to the methods for ensuring 1l continuity the first one is weight clipping with weight clipping, the weight of the critic's neural network are forced to take values between a fixed interval. After you update the weights during gradient descent, you actually will clip any weights outside of the desired interval. Basically, what that means is that weights over that interval, either too high or too low, will be set to the maximum or minimum amount respectively. That's clipping the weights there but there is uh, there is a downside to these uh, these way as well and the downside is that forcing the weights of the critic to remain in a limited range of values could limit the critic's ability to learn and ultimately to update the gradient to perform because if the critic cannot take many parameter values that means it cannot update freely so weight clipping not only is trying to do a 1L continuity enforcement but this might also limit the critic too much or on the other hand it might actually limit the critic too little if you do not clip the weights enough. So there's a lot of hyperparameter tuning involved in this case. And now the second method of ensuring one Lipschitz continuity condition, which is gradient penalty. And this is much softer way to do the job. So with gradient penalty, all you need to do is add a regularization term to your loss function, like right here, the, this term, uh, uh, lambda reg. What this regularization term does to your W loss function is that it penalizes a critic when its gradient norm is higher than 1. The symbol lambda here is just a hyperparameter value of how much to weigh this regularization term against the main loss function. Now, to check the critic gradient at every possible point of the feature space is virtually impossible or at least not very practical. Instead, with gradient penalty during implementation, all you do is simple is take a sample some points by interpolating between real and fake examples. Let's see what I mean by that. So, for instance, you could sample an image from a set of reals. That is, this is my real image, this is my generated ones. And what I'm doing here is that I'm taking a sample from the real set and also the generated set. And then I can get an intermediate image by interpolating these two images using a random number epsilon. Epsilon here could be a weight of 0 0.3 for the real one. And then for the generated ones, it would be 1 minus epsilon, that is 0 0.7 in this case. Now you interpolate between these two images with this weight factor. That would get you an in-between interpolated image, which is this. Let's, let's call these random interpolated image x hat. And it's on x hat that you want to get the critic gradient to be less than or equal to 1. And here is a mathematical expression of the regularization term for capturing what's happening here so the critic is applied on the x hat rather the x hat is passed as an input to the critic function and then you get the gradient of the critic prediction on x hat and then you take the norm of that gradient and you want the norm to be one so here i am pretty much saying hey can i get the norm of the gradient to be one as opposed to at most one because this in fact is penalizing any value outside of one and the whole expression is squared distance so that it penalizes value much more when they are further away from one specifically that that x hat is an intermediate image where it's weighted against the real and fake using epsilon 
with this method you are not strictly enforcing 1L continuity but you are just encouraging it. This has proven to work well and much better than wet clipping. Now finally putting it all together this is a complete expression of the loss function in WGAN with gradient penalty. So first this part here here I am approximating the earth mover distance with this main W loss component. This makes WGAN less prone to mode collapse and vanishing gradients. And second is this term, the regularization term, that makes a critic to be 1L continuous for the loss function to be continuous and differentiable. Of course, this is a soft constraint on making the critic 1, one Lipschitz continuous, but it has been shown to be very effective, keeping the norm of the critic close to 1 almost everywhere and finally before actually implementing wgan with pytorch from scratch these are the overall architectural key points that we have to keep in mind the first one is obviously all our previous discussion was based on these that we have to uh, bring in weight clipping on the critic to enforce the one lipschitz continuity conditions and the way we implement these is with a hyperparameter that is the weights of the discriminator must be within a certain range controlled by a hyperparameter named C. Then uh, the next point is updating critic more than the generator. So this is in contrast to what we do in a regular GAN. For example, in DC GAN, the generator and the discriminator model must be updated in equal amounts. Specifically, the discriminator is updated with with a half batch of real and half batch of fake samples each iteration whereas the generator is updated with a single batch of generated samples but in WGAN here the critic model must be updated more than the generator model specifically a new hyperparameter is defined to control the number of times that the critic is updated for each update to the generator model and that hyperparameter normally is named as n underscore critic we will see that when we implement that um, from scratch and the third point to keep in mind is that wgan recommends the use of root mean square propagation or rms prop stochastic gradient descent strategy instead of uh, uh, the adam adam optimizer which is used for dc gan or regular gan and also we use a small learning rate of uh, something like 0 0.00005. And now one of the most important part in WGAN, which is implementing Wasserstein loss in WGAN. So in WGAN, the critic loss is defined by this expression. That is average critic score on real images minus average critic score on fake images. So mathematically, it will be dx minus d of gz and z here is the noise vector that is d of uh, so gz will uh, will represent the fake images so d of fake images and the generator loss will be defined by minus of average critic score on fake images and the crucial point to note here again that in wgan the discriminator does not produce a probability rather it produces a pure score so the output of the critic d does not have to be between 1 and 0 uh, that is this expression here so uh, the discriminator tries to maximize these expression on the right side in other words the discriminator in wgan tries to maximize the difference between its output on real instances and its output on fake instances and these strategies in WGAN are implemented uh, following some points which are uh, these. Uh, so first uh, use linear activation function in the output layer of the critic model instead of a sigmoid. Remember in a regular GAN we use sigmoid as a very last step in, in discriminator. Then use Wasserstein loss to train the critic and generator models that promote larger differences between scores for real and generated images. Then constrain critic model weights to a limited range that is weight clipping after each mini batch update for example between minus 0.01 and between plus 0.01 and this range is defined as a hyperparameter to the training function. We will see that in my next video when we implement it from scratch. And the last point is in order to have parameters W lie in a compact space something simple we can do is clamp the weights to a fixed 
to a fixed box okay this is some just some more implementation actual code details uh, the number four points is actually just implementation details so these three points are the most important while uh, uh, implementing this architecture and these are the actual workflow or the actual training steps that i will follow in my next video while implementing wgan entire architecture from scratch let's go through them quickly here because uh, now that we have gone through all the fundamentals and all the theories these steps will definitely make sense so the first part is the critic network is trained on a batch of real data and also on a batch of data generated by the generator then the critic's loss function is arranged such that it estimates the Wasserstein distance that is maximizes the distance between the two distributions that is uh, the probability distribution of generated images that is fake images and also the distribution from the real image data set then clips its own weights to ensure it is one Lipschitz continuous and uh, clipping of this own weights is done through a hyperparameter by defining uh, the range within which the weight should be limited and remember the critics loss is an approximation of the negative Wasserstein distance between the generator distribution and the real data distribution and why I am saying negative Wasserstein distance we will see that and we will actually uh, making sense of that while we will do the implementation in the next video then the generator generates a new batch of images from a noise prior or a noise vector passes these through to the critic who then informs the generator of the Wasserstein 1 distance between the true distribution and the distribution of the images that the generator just produced and um, it does it does this via the loss function of the critic the critics weights are frozen and the error propagates all the way back through to the generator who then updates its parameters to minimize the Wasserstein distance and these whole flows this whole workflow repeats until the loss converges to near zero and the distributions are approximately equal that is uh, the distribution of the real images and the distribution of the fake images that pretty much wraps up this architectural understanding video on WGAN and in the next one that's coming up tomorrow I will implement WGAN from scratch with PyTorch so stay tuned in this video I will implement WGAN or Wasserstein GAN from scratch with PyTorch and as a prerequisite to this video I did another one just yesterday which was about understanding the architecture of WGAN so if you are not too aware of the architecture of WGAN do watch that one first otherwise let's start Another quick point that in this video, I have implemented a very simplified version of WGAN. So to keep it simple, I have kept one slightly advanced topic within WGAN called gradient penalty out of this. But I will do another video after this, which will include gradient penalty implementation as well. But that's in the next one. So stay tuned. First, a quick recap on WGAN. Uh, so let's see what is the difference between a WGAN and a normal regular GAN. So here in this slide, we can see a regular GAN on the top left corner image and the WGAN architecture on the right bottom corner. So uh, some of the differences with a regular GAN is that uh, in discriminator of a regular GAN, it takes uh, real samples and also images that is samples generated by the generator architecture. And then the discriminator discriminates between them. That is, it produces a binary output of 0, 1 that is real or fake. But in WGAN, the discriminator is called critic. And that's because it really does not produce a binary classification kind of output. Rather, it produces a score, a critic score. So it takes both real images and fake images. And then it produces just a single score, which is high for real images and low for, low for the fake images. So in WGAN, the critic is actually a, actually a regression problem because it produces a score. And then the next important uh, point to know about WGAN is uh, the concept of Wasserstein distance. So basically, uh, in, a, in a WGAN architecture scenario, we have two distribution. One distribution is coming from the real images. This is denoted by P data or PR. And then we have a second distribution denoted by PG, which is, uh, which is the distribution that comes from the images generated by the generator. 
so we can see these two probability distribution are far apart and the whole purpose of WGAN is to bring these distribution as close as possible so it's just this to bring them closer and to bring them closer that is two distribution uh, to be as close as possible we have to calculate the distance between these two distribution and that distance calculation is based on Wasserstein distance in WGAN and that's why it's called Wasserstein GAN and then overall these are some important uh, points to note comparing WGAN with the regular GAN the first one is after every gradient update on the critic function we need to clamp the weights to a small fixed range and the range will be defined as a hyperparameter and normally it is denoted by between minus c and c so we have discussed this point in detail in the previous architecture understanding video that uh, the weight clamping or weight clipping is required to maintain the one Lipschitz continuity and what that means in the context of wgan then the next point is use a new loss function derived from the wasserstein distance uh, no logarithms anymore the discriminator model does not play as a direct critic but a helper for estimating the Wasserstein metric between real and generated data distribution and empirically the authors recommended in WGAN RMS prop optimizer on the critic rather than a momentum based optimizer such as Adam which uh, which is normally used in other regular GAN like DC GAN so the main three points in WGAN is critic weights clipping then update critic more than generator and use RMS prop stochastic gradient descent. So putting it all together, this is the workflow of WGAN. First, the critic network is trained on a real batch of data, then trained on a batch of data generated by the generator. Uh, then the critic's loss function is arranged such that it estimates a Wasserstein distance. That is, it maximizes the distance between the two true two distribution, and the two distribution is one coming from the real images and one from the fake images. Then, the clips the critic's own weight to ensure it is one Lipschitz continuous, and then the generator generates a new batch of images from the noise vector, passes those images through to the critic, and the critic informs the generator of the Wasserstein one distance between the true distribution and the distribution of the images that the generator just created then the fourth step is uh, uh, so it does these uh, uh, via the loss function of the critic the critics weights are frozen and the error propagates all the way back through to the generator who then updates its parameters to minimize the Wasserstein distance and these whole steps are repeated until the loss converges to near zero and the and the distributions are approximately equal and now i'm back uh, in my vs code where the full implementation code is there for wgan and uh, just to mention the overall structure of this project i will have three files one is wgan.py which will have the generator and the discriminator that is a critic code and uh, overall i have used a very simple linear layer i have not used conf 2d layer here to build uh, the wgan uh, and also to note again that in this architecture that i am building in this video i will not include gradient penalty because here the purpose is to build an absolutely simplify wgan and in the next video i will have another implementation where my structure uh, the architecture will have will include conf 2d layers and also gradient penalty so anyway that's my wgan.py then i will have uh, utils.py file that's a very small file just to include a couple of uh, utility methods and finally i have a train.py file uh, uh, which will have the whole training uh, flow uh, codes here and finally to run these entire uh, wgan i will uh, do i will run this on mnist dataset and for that i will have another um, uh, uh, jupyter notebook where i will just run this train.py file that is uh, uh, running this entire architecture or, or the entire project is as simple as just running a single command of python and then train.py that is uh, executing the train.py file all right now starts with uh, wgan.py 
and just like all GANs, the first class that I have uh, within WGAN.py is my generator class. And here I have a very simplified implementation of generator class. The first method within generator is this block method. And this just implements one linear layer, then a batch norm 1D based on a condition. And uh, finally, just appends a leaky relu to my layers and finally return that layer. So I have uh, an uh, application of this batch norm 2D is based on these norm normalize argument that will come as a, as an argument to the uh, to the method and this condition is because the first layer when i will implement this block the very first layer will have the normalize set to false because that will not have a batch norm 1d and rest of the layers will have the batch norm 1d applicable so uh, and then in my uh, next next uh, next section here i'm just applying or invoking this block method four times so i have an n dot sequential defined here the first one is block in features will uh, just be as usual the latent dimension which is my noise vector that is that is the very start of my generator network because the whole generator network's purpose is to take in this noise vector and finally output a image from its uh, output layer so that's why the in features here i'm passing the latent dim out features i'm keeping at 128 and because this is the first application of the block i'm setting normalize equal to false in this case this batch norm 2d will not be appended to my layer and then I'm uh, invoking three more blocks and each time uh, only difference is that uh, the out features from the previous block becomes my in features from the next block and uh, then the out features of this block is something that I am defining separately. So, um, and obviously because these block will also have these, uh, apart from the linear layer, it will, all these block, individual blocks will have batch norm 2D and leaky relu appended to it. And then the forward method in my generator class just executes or invokes these uh, sequential model that I have defined here. So the forward method takes as its argument the image shape and the Z noise vector and passes that Z through my model which will produce an image and then it just applies view to flatten it and returns that image. So basically my whole generator model takes as input a point in the latent space and outputs a single 28 by 28 grayscale image. Remember in this case I'm applying this whole uh, WGAN generator and the critic network on MNIST dataset. So uh, it has to produce the generator has to produce an image which which resembles a single image of MNIST dataset and that's a 28 by 28 grayscale image and that's why the output from generator here is also a 28 by 28 and this whole uh, generation process is achieved by using a fully connected layer in this case i'm using linear layer which is a fully connected layer to interpret each point in the latent space this is this is then upsampled through these uh, through the sequential models uh, doubling the size each time so that's my generator and the next one is the discriminator or as it's called in wgan the critic class so here is my critic class a very simple implementation of that and uh, uh, remember our la the last layer of generator was to produce um, uh, this linear layer where the out features were uh, this value uh, integer of uh, np.prod image shape so that should be my in features at the very first layer in in my critic class so that's why we see the exact same thing in the in features of the first linear layer so here basically i am taking this number and ultimately at the end of all the layers in the discriminator i am producing a score because as we know in wgan there is no sigmoid at the very last layer because here we are not producing a zero one or true fake kind of binary output rather we are producing a score a scalar score so that's what these layers are doing in my critic class the first one is linear then a leaky relu uh, with 0 0.2 and in plus true as well then again the next linear layer and here the in features 
is come this 512 number is coming from here uh, here the out feature source 512 so that will become my in features in my next linear layer and uh, keeping the out features uh, equal to 256 here uh, uh, if you look at the structure compare the structure between generator and discriminator here i was up sampling that is uh, uh, out features 128 256 512 1024 and in the discriminator or the critic i am doing the opposite going in the opposite direction so out features 512 then uh, next one out features 256 and finally my out features is one because that's the last layer of my critic and that should produce a single scalar score uh, from its output layer uh, all right and that's the forward function uh, from in my critic and basically what the forward function doing is it's just implementing these models so basically uh, here the forward method takes an image and produce a single score the single scalar score so it takes the image as an input to my forward or argument and then flatten the image and then the final validity score uh, to produce the final validity score i just have to pass this image to this model and that's what i'm doing in this line self.model and that takes the image underscore flat as the input or the argument and this validity score is the final output from my critic so with that i'm done with this file now i should be able to train but before going to train.py just quickly look at the utils.py file there i just have two methods and they are actually just uh, utility methods so uh, no complexity so nothing too much uh, to learn here it's just the first method wait in it normal so this method will just create the initial initializer weights to the network based on whether it's a conv layer or batch norm 2d etc and uh, so when i'm using torch.nn.init.normal this this takes the weight data as a tensor and then it takes a standard deviation and mean as uh, two more arguments uh, and uh, two image is just again a very simple method just to clamp my uh, the input between zero and one and this method uh, for visualizing it just takes an image and uh, passes that image uh, image tensor to the cpu then use the make grid function to create a grid from that from the images and then finally just use plt.im show to uh, actually plot or show the image in my notebook so finally here i am in my third file which is train.ui uh and remember this train dot th these two files are pretty much independent files standalone files but train.py has dependencies on these two files other two files because it has to import all these classes to my uh, to my train.py file and that's why i'm doing this line from utils import star and the same from wgan and uh, yeah so in my uh, train file first i'm defining these uh, hyperparameters class and then actually initiating the values of each of the hyperparameters like number of epoch batch size learning rate number of cpu latent dim is 100 this is a noise vector to start my entire generator network image image size 32 uh, let's see where, where i'm using 32 here we'll come to that in a in a second and also i am defining two uh, variables here cuda and tensor uh, for uh, they are pretty much obvious and standard codes so this will be uh, uh, this will be true if my uh, if my gpu is compatible with pytorch else it will be false and if the gpu is available then all my tensors will be uh, will need to use the gpu and that's what the second line is doing that is this tensor will be using torch.cuda.float tensor if the cuda is true else torch.float tensor only difference between this and this is that a torch.cuda.float tensor will be computed with help of the gpu power else only torch.float tensor will be occupying the cpu and hence the computation will be on the cpu uh, cpu power only so i mean most probably for most of pytorch computer vision projects you will be using uh, gpu uh, else it will be super slow so this line is kind of important all right now coming back to the next section okay so this method this is again a standard uh, uh, standard code that you will see that is here i'm just data loading do uh, implementing the data loader method of pytorch to load my data and also do some basic transform uh, on the data 
so this uh, uh, here i am using torchvisions dot data set dot fashion mnist uh, this is uh, uh, this is a uh, 28 by 28 grayscale training images and uh, download equal to true means that it will download this data set from torchvisions um, uh, if that is not already downloaded or if it is already downloaded then it will not download so that's the significance of this parameter download equal to true train equal to true will just uh, pull the training data and not the test data set and also i'm applying some basic transforms here that is resizing my images to uh, image size and here remember this is part of the hyperparameter and i have defined it to be 32 here and then uh, uh, standard code i'm converting them to PyTorch is 2 tensor and also normalizing using uh, mean and standard deviation of 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 respectively. And batch size is coming from my hyperparameter and I have kept it at 64 uh, shuffle equal to true. All right. And then before starting my train method, I'm just creating the generator and the critic object from the generator and critic class respectively and uh, to the generator i'm passing the image shape and also image shape is actually a three-dimensional tensor uh, because in pytorch the uh, dimensions of image are set like channels first then uh, height and then width and that's uh, what this image shape represent and the second argument to the generator class is latent deem which is a hundred dimensional hundred element noise vector all right and the critic also takes the image shape uh, to create the object and then my two optimizers just following the advice from the paper i am using rms prop uh, to create my two optimizers and to that RM, to that rms prop i'm passing generator dot parameters and critic dot parameters and learning rate is coming from the hyperparameter and uh, then generator dot apply weight in it normal uh, we defined this method in our utils uh, file so that's what i'm applying here to create my to initialize my weights and then my train method so here uh, the regular structure so well, i'm first loop there there'll be two loops the first one outer loop is for each epoch and the number of epochs is is a hyperparameter and then in the inner loop will enumerate through my train data loader we already have defined it above here so that's my train data loader and that's what i'm looping through inside my train method and the very first uh, step is to create two vectors which will one of these will represent the valid targets which will be all filled with ones and that's what i'm doing here uh, using variable module of of torch then creating the tensor passing that images dot shape zero because my valid target number of targets should match with the original data sets number of samples then filling them all up with 1.0 it's a float value and that's what i'm using this format 1.0 and then because these are just uh, target values i do not need this tensor to have the gradients so and that's what i'm saying uh, i'm setting requires grad to false and doing the exact same thing for fake variable as well but here only difference is all the values will be filled up with 0.0, .0 because they all represent my fake uh, images and then these are my real images which is coming directly from the images and what is uh, this imgs this is what i get while enumerating over my train data loaders because that will return a tuple of uh, the index number and also the images and only thing that i'm doing here is i'm converting them appropriately with my tensor variable because this tensor has been defined earlier to use the gpu to make the calculation faster and uh, the first time uh, and then my training actual training starts from here and as the very first step i'm obviously making use of the zero grad and that is because pytorch stores gradients in a mutable data structure so we need to set it to a clean state before we use it otherwise it will have old gradient information from the previous iteration and then in this line i'm just um, creating or initiating my noise vector 
and I'm making use of these numpy random dot normal uh, method which will draw a random samples from a normal or Gaussian distribution and the first parameter is mean second parameter is standard deviation and the third parameter is the shape of output that, that is output shape and here in this case uh, the image dot shape will will be the number of samples and image dot latin deem it is the uh, noise vector number of elements and in this case uh, this is 100 and um, so that's my noise vector and uh, given so my noise vector is ready so now that means if i pass this noise vector as a as an input to my generator that will produce my fake images so that's what this line is about that is uh, to my generator object i'm just passing my image shape that we have defined earlier and these noise vector z and uh, the output of this is my fake images from the generator model and now that i have the fake images generated from the generator model the all important uh, step now which is to pass my fake images through the discriminator that is a critic here and get my uh, loss score from the critic now the first thing to understand here is that in wgan the critic loss is the difference the Wasserstein distance between two distributions and very much it's something like this that is dx minus d of gz what that means is this dx will produce the uh, this x here the actual real images so uh, dx means that i'm passing the actual images to the critic to produce a score and then in this the next part of this um, of this critic loss this is the uh, critic applied on the fake images so g of z this part that is the inside of this function this will produce the fake images and then those fake images will be passed as an input to the critic or the discriminator and that will be my so the difference between these two term is my critic loss and as per the original paper and the very uh, fundamental building block of wgan is that this expression need to be maximized by the discriminator or the critic and now here in the in my train method i'm doing a gradient descent so my optimizing i'm actually uh, running a minimization algorithm so how do i maximize this mathematical expression well you can maximize the mathematical expression by minimizing the negative of this expression and that's why in this line here i am taking the negative of this so this will become positive and this will become negative that that is very much what i'm doing is minus dx minus of minus d of uh, g z and because these two are minus here actually this will become the next this this expression will become just a plus plus take out this symbol yeah so this is what i'm doing in in this line so minus torch dot main critic of real images plus torch dot main critic of fake images and now my d loss is calculated so i am ready to do the back propagation and also updating the weight and that's what these two lines are about so this will back propagate this loss and the next line step will actually update the weights and next the all important step of weight clipping so once my weights are updated that is um, my critic weights are updated now i have to i have to clamp them or clip them and i do that with these lines that is i i, I run a loop for each of the critic dot parameters values and then i do p dot data dot clamp to uh, uh and then pass these clip value minus clip value and plus clip, clip value and what is my clip value that's coming from the hyperparameters and i kept the clip value at 0 0.005 so the way this clamp underscore method will work is that it will take two values minimum and maximum and uh, if the values are less than the minimum they will be replaced by the minimum value and if the values are greater than the maximum then they will be replaced with the max values so up to this point was my discriminator or the critic training that is up to here it started from these uh, using uh, zero grad 
so now i have to start the generator training and as we discussed in the initial architecture that we have to make sure that the generator trains after only so many times the discriminator is trained so basically we are uh, going to increase the training iterations of the critic so that it works to approximate the real distribution sooner and that's why i am making use of these if condition uh, that is taking the modulus of hp dot n underscore critic uh, to be zero and only then i will train the generator and what is my n critic let's quickly see the hyperparameter definition at the very top my n critic is 25 so only after 25 iterations of my critics training then i will train generator so generator will train after each 25 iterations of critic training is done all right now let's see what i'm doing in the generator training so first uh, again the same line i'm uh, uh, making a clean set of the gradient by making use of zero grad and after zero grad as per the original workflow of generator training i first have to create some fake images with generator model and then apply critic on those fake images so this line is first creating the fake images by bringing in generator object and to that i'm passing image shape uh, which has been defined earlier and z is coming from is that's a noise vector that also we have defined earlier and then the generator loss will be uh, just pass these fake images as input or argument to my critic function and take a negative of that uh, that's my generator loss and then after the loss is calculated i'm just implementing or just uh, just executing backward and step to do the back propagation and update the weights that's it and then pretty much my uh, critic and generator training is done and the next these few lines are just uh, pretty obvious i'm just calculating the total number of batches down till now which will be equal to epoch uh, the current epoch multiplied by uh, the length of the train data loaders plus this iteration uh, so this i uh, this i is a current index number so that's my batches done and why this is required it is just to uh, print some statement here in these uh, lines here i'm just uh, uh, printing uh, the current state of the training so that's this whole thing is my uh, is my training method up to here and then as a final uh, line in my train.py file i'm just executing this method and that's it now everything is ready only thing is i have to run these or execute this train.py file so let's go back to my google collab uh, yeah so this is a simple notebook um, that i'm using over here uh, it has got just two pretty much just uh, three cells the first cells i'm connecting my google drive and uh, because i definitely need to use gpu so i am changing the runtime to use my uh, gpu change runtime type and we can see i'm using the gpu here and this nvidia smi command will give me what kind of gpu i got so here i got a got a tesla k80 with 12 gb of ram that's good enough and then the important thing is that that to the uh, these collab so uh, to, to the collab session storage you have to upload these uh, three files that uh, we have our all codes in that is train.py utils.py and wgan.py so that's what i did here i have uploaded these files you, we can just double click it to see the files yeah that's my files and uh, the way to upload it is just simple uh, you just uh, content is your default uh, uh, default directory when you open up your google collab just right click on it upload and select your drive that's all that's all you need uh, so that's how i uploaded these three files so i have got all the three files and now i only need and you can check that by running this ls command yep so i have uh, uh train.py utils and wgan and then the final cell just uh, python train.py that is you are executing the train.py file and why i needed to connect my g drive is because in my train.py file my root path has been defined to be my google drive because that's where i have saved my mnist data uh where is the root path yeah here so i have a root path defined here that's where my uh, fashion mnist data were saved 
So let's execute train.py and it started running. Yep, the epoch started. Actually, uh, here I am actually printing the or showing the images, but when you run a train.py file like this in a Colab notebook, you will not be able to see the actual uh, images. Rather, this something like this will come, and this is uh, this has already been recognized by this is an open open issue in their GitHub repository. Uh, to uh, to visualize actual images that this training is printed that is when my images are gradually getting trained and uh, they're resembling more and more like the original fashion mnist that will for to see that you have to run the entire code in a notebook and uh, to the description section of this video i will also give a link of this entire code and you can just paste all the codes in a single notebook and then thereby you will see the uh, see the actual images but here just for showing you i will let me run the actual notebook so that we can see the images so anyway we can see the epochs are running it's uh, it's actually running in a pretty reasonable time each epoch just getting over in one and a half minute uh, averagely and here i am i just uh, included all the codes from the three files into a single jupyter notebook and uploaded that notebook in google drive sorry in google collab and uh, now i will be running this uh, this notebook and see what kind of result i'm getting uh yeah let's uh, let's let's just rest i have to restart this whole notebook uh, and then i will run it and show you the images that is being produced uh, through the training and this is where i just started the training in google collab uh, the entire notebook and uh, so after each epoch this kind of uh, images will be produced so i am still at uh, my epoch 2 uh, and that's why i'm getting these almost um, uh, almost noise kind of output but you after you uh, pa go past to like uh, 50 or 60 epochs you will see uh, very much realistic looking uh, fashion mnist data set being generated from the entire network and that pretty much wraps up this video and uh, i will put the link of the github repository in the description of this video just search by the number and also note that in this video my purpose was to implement a very simplified version of wgan and that's why i did not include gradient penalty uh, in this one so in the next video i will do another wgan implementation where i will include a gradient penalty and also instead of the fully connected linear layers in generator and discriminator i will use conv layer so stay tuned in this video i will implement wgan or wasserstein gan with gradient penalty from scratch with pytorch so just a couple of days back i did another wgan implementation but that was without gradient penalty link of that previous video will be in the description and also i did another video where i went over the architecture of wgan in detail so if you are not too aware of the architectural details of wgan do watch that one first i will give the link in the description and all my source code that I have shown here will be in my GitHub repository, the link of which in the description. Just search by the number because all my videos are numbered. Hello, my name is Rohan Paul and very welcome to my computer vision and deep learning YouTube channel. Let's get started. One more thing that over the next month, I will do many GAN or generative adversarial network implementation from scratch with PyTorch. So do subscribe because you hitting the subscribe button is what keeps me motivated to do this. Let's start. So as I discussed in my architectural review video on WGAN that there are two methods to enforce one Lipschitz continuity in WGAN and they are wet clipping and gradient penalty. And uh, we already have covered wet clipping in the previous video. So I'm not talking about this point anymore now. So let's uh, talk about gradient penalty quickly before implementing this. But before uh, going, getting into the details of gradient penalty, quickly revisit this concept of uh, uh, one Lipschitz continuity. So as you already know, the job of these uh, gradient penalty is to enforce one L continuity or one Lipschitz continuity. And this is the expression for one Lipschitz continuity. And this inequation here on the right side pretty much tells us that the L2 norm of the gradient will need to be less than or equal to 1. And L2 norm is used here because this is the most commonly used norm in machine learning. And also obviously the paper suggests so. 
and so with the gradient penalty all you need to do is to add a regularization term to your loss function what this regularization term does is that it penalizes the critic when its gradient norm is higher than one and the symbol lambda here that's what you see here uh, is just a hyperparameter value of how much to weigh the regularization term against the main loss function now to check the critic gradient at every possible point of the feature space that is virtually impossible or at least not practical instead what we do is with the gradient penalty during implementation is that we take a middle position or we take a we uh, take an interpolation of from two images from the real image data set and also from the fake image data set and create an interpolated image and apply our critic function on that image to calculate the loss so for instance you could sample an image from a set of reals that is real image data set and also a set of image from the fake or generated data set and uh, then you create an interpolated image what you see right on the right side and uh, the way that you uh, uh, you weigh these uh, uh, images from the original real and generated is through a hyperparameter which is epsilon so for example here i have taken epsilon value to be 0 0.3 for the reals and in that case uh, for the this is just a weight so if i take 0 0.3 for the real for the generated ones it would be 1 minus epsilon that is 0.7 and uh, after applying this epsilon and the interpolation you would get the result as an interpolated image that's in between these two images i will call this random interpolated image x hat it's on x hat that uh, i want my critic to be to be measured so this is a mathematical expression of my gradient penalty and i have x hat as an input to the critic that is the loss is calculated on these interpolated image x hat and then i take the gradient of that and then take the norm and the purpose is this norm should be less than or equal to one so in the absolute ideal case i want this whole penalty term to be zero that is there is no penalty at all so in that ideal case here i am pretty much saying hey can i get the norm of the gradient to be one as opposed to at most one that is if this norm of the gradient that is this term becomes one then one minus one whole square will become zero that means whole penalty term will will become zero and because this in fact is penalizing any value outside of one and the whole expression is squared distance so that it penalizes values much more when they are further away from one and so finally this will uh, become the exact expression while i include the epsilon term that is uh, epsilon into x for the real part and one minus epsilon into g z for the generated part and remember here in this expression z is a, is my generator and this z that's a noise vector so that means actually generator is starting with the noise vector and creating a fake image and uh, yeah so this is my regularization term at the top and this is my interpolated image and now putting it all together the overall loss function calculation methodology will become uh, this so uh, so this is a expression for wgan loss function calculation and with the gradient penalty now it has two component the blue part makes uh, this is the original uh, w part or w loss part and this this part becomes a new our new gradient penalty part of the loss and uh, obviously you already know that this blue part the first part this is where i approximate the earth's mover distance or i calculate the wasserstein distance uh, this is the original w loss component and this makes w gan less prone to mode collapse and vanishing gradients and then this second part that is the gradient penalty part this is brought in to make wgan 1l continuous or 1 lipschitz continuous and uh, uh, yeah i mean actually this brown part makes a critic to be 1 lipschitz continuous and now that uh, we have gone through the architecture of wgan with gradient penalty let's jump in with the actual implementation 
so i will have like my many other gans video i will have three files one is the actual uh, network implementation in this case that's wgan then i have a utils file which will have couple of utility methods and then the final train file which will have the actual training algorithm implemented so let's start with the wgan file the first method is obviously the class is obviously generator so uh, the generator here in this case in my previous video i used a fully connected linear layer in my generator and critic and here in this video i will be implementing the generator and the critic with conf 2d layer so the generator first takes a couple of um, these arguments that is uh, z dim which is the dimension of the noise vector that the generator um, will take at the initial stage that is a whole generator will start with the noise vector and ultimately produce an image which is which should be like the original image data set so here in this case i will be uh, finally implementing the training on mnis data set so the purpose of generator is simply to take a noise vector and produce an mnist equivalent uh, image data set and in the generator class the important part is uh, this method make gen block uh, this method actually just implements a sequence of uh, networks and uh, then i'll be uh, using this make gen block to generate my uh, other layers so this is actually a very simple implementation uh, make gen block takes these input channels and output channels which are like the number of channels the input features representation and uh, number of channels the output feature representation kernel size is just the filter size stride is stride and final layer that's a boolean and uh, it will be true only uh, only if it is in the final layer otherwise it will by default take the false value and uh, then uh, under the inside make gen block i am running this simple if else clause that if it is final layer then i am just doing uh, a conf transpose 2d and a batch norm 2d and a ReLU. and uh, uh, and if it, okay so this is if it is not final layer uh, because if it is final layer then i will not have these uh, final ReLU one so in that case that is the under the else clause that is if it is not final layer in i mean the final layer is false then only conf transpose 2d and tan h uh, that is all and that's following the paper's recommendation and then all i'm doing is implementing this make gen block a uh, couple of more times in my uh, this here in my this uh, section of the code that is my self dot generator this variable will be equal to nn dot sequential uh, first make gen block will start with z dim because that's obviously the starting point of all generator of all of all, almost all gans not each and every gan but mostly all gans will start with a noise vector and just uh, again uh, let's clarify the arguments that generator class takes so z dim is uh, just as i mentioned earlier that it's a dimension of the noise vector which it is it's a scalar value by default it will take 10 then uh, in channel this is the number of channels in the images for the data set used so in this case i am using uh, mnist so number of channels for mnist data set uh, is one because it's a grayscale and hidden dimension this is again another scalar value and uh, uh, yeah so that's my all my arguments to the generator class and uh, uh, yeah so first these variable generator will just be the first layer will be make gen block it will start with z dim hid hidden dim into four that is i'm up sampling in by a factor of four uh, because remember these um, uh, the second argument to my make gen block is uh, this one output channels which is the number of channels the output feature representation should have so here the first one i'm up sampling in up sampling it by a factor of four then in the next uh, because this is my output channel so that will become my input channel for the next layer uh, so it starts with hidden dim multiplied by four and then here i'm putting i'm keeping the output channel uh, of my make gen block to be hidden dim into two kernel size four stride one the next one 
uh, again uh, this will become this is output channels for the previous layer that means this will become my input channels for the next layer so hidden dim into two and then output channels i'm bringing it down to hidden dim only and finally uh, the final layer will be hidden dim again it's coming from previous layers output channel will become the next layers input channel and because this is my final layer and it is supposed to create mnist data set which has a channel of one so the second argument for the last layer will be im channel which has been defined to be one that is the number of channels in the original image because here i am i am outputting the original image indeed and uh, kernel size is four filter layer final layer is true because this is the final layer and the most important factor in these uh, flow of network is uh, if you notice that i started with hidden dim of hidden dim multiplied by four then uh, that multiplication factor started reducing through each layer so four became two in the next layer that became uh, that became all uh, again halved in the third layer that is uh, two became one here and finally in the final layer it became just the image channel which is one only and this is because as you uh, definitely have noticed that in the make gen blog these are actually conf transpose 2d this is not conf 2d this is conf transpose 2d and hence uh, uh, these reductions of uh, the output channel will make sense to you and with that uh, my architecture of generator is very much complete i only have to uh, write the forward function which is here so the forward function will just uh, implement or uh, invoke all these architecture that we build and here uh, the for where is it here here the forward function will just start with the noise and ultimately produce the mnist images so uh, the first line i'm just um, reshaping these noise vector uh, to be uh, shaped like this that is lane noise then i'm using self.zdim which is the dimension of the noise vector a, a scalar and then one and one and uh, the, the view is the method view is working just as a reshaping tool here and as we know that a uh, view dim1 dim2 uh, and uh, etc so on returns a view of the same underlying information or the same underlying tensor but it is reshaped to a tensor of shape dim1 dim2 and so on whatever how many of a dimension you can put in here and after that reshaping is done i am just uh, uh, getting these x through these entire uh, generator network with this line self dot generator x and that's my return value from the entire generator class and then my critic network that is a discriminator network of wgan and it's rather simple here so just like the generator class i am making use of these method make critic block and that takes as an input just like the generator uh, class input channel output channel kernel size stride and final layer so this make crit block uh, it, it just returns a sequence of operations corresponding to a critic block and uh, the sequence of operations are conf 2d batch norm and leaky relu and that's uh, also dependent on these uh, boolean uh, boolean argument final layer so if not final layer then i will be returning a conf 2d then a batch norm 2d and then a leaky ReLU. and if it is a final layer then there will be no batch norm and no leaky ReLU, only a conf 2d now notice the contrast that in generator i used a conf transpose 2d in the make gen block here uh yes here but in discriminator we have used conf 2d instead so this is something to note in wgan all right now that my make crit block is done so uh, so pretty much that will uh, i just need to execute or invoke this function three times to make my entire critic uh, network here so the critic just like generator again the the uh, arguments remains almost kind of same this is im channel that is a number of channels in the original data set hidden dim is a scalar 
and then these variable critic is just equal to three invocation of these make crit block under a nn dot sequential module so the first one obviously takes the im channels because that's where it will start and also takes hidden dim then uh, uh, hidden dim becomes my next layers input channel and um, the output channels is hidden dim multiplied by two because this is uh, all these are conf 2d so here i have to increase uh, output channels accordingly and the last layer is just hidden dim multiplied by two becomes my input channel and the output channel will become one because it's um, grayscale mnist data set and uh, they are of channel one and final layer in this case will be true because now this is the final layer that means i should not have batch norm 2d and also no leaky relu and finally only the forward method here uh, so this just uh, a very absolutely simple simple thing uh, a crit prediction will be self dot critics and it then um, i pass the image to it and this image may be the fake image or the real images because my critic will be evaluating both set of images and produce a score and what i'm returning from this is just a reshaped version version of this crit uh, pred and for this reshaping uh, the first dimension of the reshaped tensor will obviously be the output of the last layer from my critic and that's why i'm using len crit prediction here and uh, the second one i'm passing minus one and uh, this pretty much means in pytorch says uh, terminology that minus one is an alias for uh, infer this dimension given the others have all been specified already so uh, then this uh, second dimension will be inferred by pytorch itself and with that our network architecture is uh, very much built and uh, before starting the training let's go to the utils file to uh, quickly check out our utility methods so the first one is this uh, method plot images from tensor a very simple method all it does is takes an image tensor and uh, also the number of images and plots it with the make grid function so this make grid function is, com is coming from torchvisions.utils and um, so there is no complexity in this function it just converts a ten for it converts a tensor into uh first uh, first detaches the tensor and uh, then uses cpu method and what it does is that the cpu operation uh, transfers the tensor to the cpu if not already there and the detach method just cuts the computation graph that is a uh, uh, i no more require the gradients here on these tensors and so detach does that that is it cuts off the gradients uh, uh, to be fr from my image tensor and then image grid that's just invocation of the make grid function and uh, make grid the first argument it takes the image uh, detached but only this many sorry uh, these many number of images that is uh, the first uh, num images and then the only important point here to note is this line that is how i am uh, permuting or i'm um, uh, transforming the image dimension here and this is a very common implementation whenever you have to uh, take as input your pytorch tensors and plot them with matplotlib uh, this kind of transformation is a uh, transposing is necessary so uh, what it does is i have mentioned that in this comment very clearly here because this is a common uh, architect common kind of implementation you will do in many situation so pytorch modules um, keeps its image dimension in this format that is channel height width but Below and matplotlib library expects images to be uh, in this format that is height first then width and the last one is channel and that's why my channel dimension which was first that is 0th index in uh, tens in pytorch i have to uh, bring it to, the, to be the last index and that's why zero comes last here uh, with my permute method that is one this one is my height which was uh, which was a second in pytorch and then two is my width which was the last in pytorch and zero is my channel which which was the first in pytorch 
and then i'm just applying squeeze to it to um, to filter out unnecessary dimension and finally just plt.show so yeah that's a simple function to plot the images in a in a grid format and then the next one is uh, this one make grad hook so here i will be tracking the gradients for visualization purpose so in this method what mainly i'm doing is um, these gradient list variable will have all the gradients appended to it when the layers are executed one by one so uh, take a look at this grad hook method what i'm doing here is making use of is instance method which will this is instance function returns true if the specified object is of the specified type otherwise false and object is the first argument type is the second argument so here my m is the object in in dot conf 2d is a type so if is instance is conf 2d or is instance is conf transpose 2d then gradients list or append dot and append and then i'm appending the m dot weight dot grad simple and we remember this conf 2d is used across my critic network and conf transpose 2d is used across my generator network and finally from this method i'm just returning this gradient list and also grad hook and this next method is again uh, uh, a very standard method in many pytorch project uh, because it's just initializing the weights so if my again i'm making use of is instance so if my object is conf 2d or conf transpose 2d then my uh, initialized weight would be according to this line that is torch.nn.init.normal m dot weight and 00 and 0 0.02 is my mean and standard deviation and if it is if the if the layers is batch norm 2d then a slightly different way of initializing the weights and in this case for the batch norm 2d i'm also initializing the bias uh, with a constant init dot constant so that's my weight and then this last uh, very small method is get noise and this function uh, is for creating noise vectors given the dimension and my dimensions are in samples z and z dim and device by default i'm keeping it at cpu here in this case uh, of course device later will be defined to be uh, gpu conditionally if my uh, hardware has a compatible pytorch compatible GP gpu so this get noise is just making use of torch.randn function to create uh, a tensor containing a set of random numbers drawn from the uniform distribution in the interval 0 1 and the shape is defined by the variable parameter size and in in my case the shape is z dim uh, uh, which will take by default the value of 10 and uh, of course when i implement this function i will define uh, what the z dim will be we'll see that in a second and uh, all right so those were some of my small utility method and now i also have to define the functions for calculating my generator loss and critic loss and the generator loss in uh, in wgan is very easy let me quickly put a comment here to uh, so we discussed uh, during our architecture review this particular thing here that what generator how generator loss is calculated so this is the key uh, key line that is generator loss in wgan is equal to minus average critic score on fake images as simple as this so uh, and uh, and what is the fake images they are my uh, gz that is g is my generator and z is a noise vector so that will this function g of z will create the fake images and those fake images will be passed to my critic function that is a discriminator function and that will produce my uh, average critic score that will pro sorry that will produce my critic score uh, and then i take the average of that and minus negative of that that's my uh, that's my generated loss and this function is doing just that minus one into torch dot main critic fake prediction so critic fake prediction is the argument and which will be which will be calculated during the training so basically for the generator the loss is calculated by maximizing the critics prediction on generators fake images 
and uh, the, these arguments has the scores for all the fake images in the batch and we will be taking a mean of that so that's my generator loss and in the these next two lines i'm just uh, doing a very simple unit test uh, to check some basic assumptions here and both of these uh, tests should pass and printing these word success uh, all right and now critic loss uh, so this function is calculating my critic loss against nothing too complex here so for the critic loss let's understand this expression uh, this is the expression by which critic loss is uh, defined in the paper so that's the difference between discriminator of real images minus discriminator of fake images so d of gz this one this expression is actually so gz gz produces my fake images and that needs to be passed to my discriminator and that will produce my uh, that will produce a score and the difference between these dx and this d of gz that's a critic loss or discriminator loss and as per the paper we have to maximize this expression so arithmetically to implement the loss function here because uh, we will be passing the loss function into our training algorithm where we will be doing a gradient descent so it's a minimize minimization algorithm hence we have to somehow express these maximization mathematical expression into a minimization mathematical expression and arithmetically maximizing an expression means minimizing the negative of that expression so what we have to do we just have to uh, in front of this entire expression we just have to put a minus sign so that's what this is minus d of uh, x and d of gz that will ultimately become minus dx plus d of gz which means minus d of real images plus d of g of real images uh, and which again transforms to uh, th this expression is actually d of real images means that will produce a fake images so my final expression will become minus d of real images plus d of fake images and we have to uh, minimize this expression so that's what i'm implementing in the function as well so get crit loss uh, is uh, where my crit loss is equal to torch dot mean uh, crit fake prediction minus torch dot mean crit real prediction and to that i also have to add the gradient penalty term and which is just this c lambda multiplied by gp and c lambda is my hyperparameter and that is how much the gradient penalty would be weighted and this gp will be calculated separately and then will be passed to this function as an argument so yeah that's pretty much it and again this function what this is doing is this expression let's see uh, create fake prediction this is just this term that is uh, uh, when i pass the fake images to my critic or discriminator that will produce a score and that score uh, that, and uh, in this function i will have that score for all the images in the batch and i have to take a mean of that and that's all i'm doing torch.mean similarly in this here uh, this is the crit score or the critic score from the real images that is that is this part d of real images and then because i will have this score for all the images in the batch so i have to take a torch dot mean and uh, all right so that's just uh, return this crit loss from this function okay and now my final two more uh, okay these uh, two little tests just to test that um, unit test just to test that uh, this critic loss is working so i'm again using uh, these uh, torch dot is close method to uh, measure my crit loss between two tensor all right my util function is over and now i can go to my train file and start the training and in the train file first uh, declaring all these uh, hyperparameters uh, number of epochs 100 uh, z deem 64 display step 50 and display step is just uh, this is for visualization of my output during the training that is when the epochs are going on we will see the uh, the usage of these variable uh, very soon batch size i'm keeping 128 learning rate 0 0.0002 beta 1 beta 2 c lambda is 10 uh, c lambda will be using in 
our uh, for the waiting waiting the gradient penalty and crit repeats equal to 5 this is uh, as per the paper that is we know already that in wgan we have to train the critic more number of times than the generator so this is the number of times the critic will be trained for each generator training device okay device i should actually make it queue down uh remember if your hardware if you are running it in uh, google colab then you should definitely use um, cuda uh, otherwise if you are running in local hardware and your you or i mean either you don't have a gpu or your gpu is not compatible with pytorch then you should make the device equal to cpu but training wgan is very intensive process because uh, in the gradient penalty section we will be effectively calculating gradient of gradients so it's a very slow process uh, needs a lot of gpu power so training wgan with only cpu is going to be impossibly slow next i'm just defining some uh, transform standard one transform the two tensor and normalizing with mean and standard deviation of 0.5 each and this line is just loading my data uh, so I'm using MNIST. Uh, it will run relatively faster because it's a uh, comparatively much smaller data set. And uh, so this is my root directory. I am giving the root directory as my Google Drive and uh, applying the transforms and download equal to true means if the data is not already downloaded, it will download it. Batch size keeping is taken from the hyperparameter shuffle keeping at true now i have to initialize some of the objects uh, from my generator and critic remember train.py has dependencies on the other two files wgan and utils and that's why i'm importing all the modules all the methods defined in the other two files in my train file with this line from wgan import star from utils import star so i have access to all these classes that i have uh, defined in my wgan.py file in my train file so that's i'm going to use here so i am just initializing my generator uh, from the generator class and my critic from the critic class and both these objects i am uh, passing to my device with this dot two device this is very standard code you will see in almost all pytorch projects and also i am making use of um, torch.optim.adam optimizer to create and initialize my optimizer both gen optimizer and critic optimizer and uh, in uh, in this optimizer you have to pass the generator dot parameters learning rate and betas and betas and learning rate we have already defined at the top in my hyperparameter section and then this line generator equal to generator dot apply weights in it so this is where it will initialize my weights and uh, we have already defined these weights in it method in my utils function here uh, let's go back quickly yeah here weight in it so depending on whether it's a conf 2d uh, or conf transpose 2d it will initialize one set of weights and if it's if the layer is a batch norm 2d then it will initialize another set of weights uh, and also the bias terms all right so that's my generator and critic uh, both are initialized with these weights and then uh, a gradient penalty calculation so this is uh, the important term in wgan and before getting into the code let's just quickly revisit the original gradient penalty definition so here is uh, what we discussed at the start of the video that uh, gradient penalty enforces the one lipschitz continuity on the critic that means to this is the overall expression of my loss in wgan and this part that is this initial part is my general w loss and this second part is my regularization uh, is my regularization term which is actually the gradient penalty so uh, this reg term is what we will be calculating and to that i will multiply this lambda which is a hyperparameter to weigh that regularization term effectively so and what is this rec term is um, just this that is uh, i have to calculate so calculating the gradient penalty has two two steps first i have to calculate the gradient then i have to calculate the gradient penalty so what is a gradient 
so we start by uh, we start by getting the gradients and gradient is computed by first creating a mixed image that is this part uh, um, epsilon into x plus 1 minus epsilon into gz now what is my x x is my mixed image or interpolated image what we discussed at the start of the video that we do not take the real and the fake images directly we create an interpolated or mixed image this is done by weighing the fake and real images using epsilon and then adding them together once we once we have the intermediate image we can get the critics output on that intermediate image and then finally we compute the gradient of the critic score on that mixed image with respect to the pixels of the mixed image and that's exactly what this formula is doing that is x here is the real image coming from real data set and g of z is my generated fake images so i'm multiplying this hyperparameter epsilon with the real images and one minus epsilon with the fake images to get my interpolated image and then that image is called x hat and then that x hat is passed to my critic which calculates which calculates a critic score then after the critic score is calculated on this interpolated image i calculate the gradient of that critic score and uh, then uh, that's a that, so up to this point is the first part of gradient calculation and for calculating the entire penalty of the gradient calculation that is its entire expression i take the norm l2 norm of the gradient and then minus one of that and make a square of that that is i calculate how much the norm two of the gradient differs from one and then square it that's my whole regularization term or whole penalty term that is how much the l2 norm of the gradient diverges from the number one because as per one Lipschitz continuity the gradient l2 norm of the gradient needs to be within uh, needs to be as close to one as possible that's the fundamental of uh, one Lipschitz continuity and that's what the gradient penalty is enforcing so now let's go back to my train file to see the implementation of the first part of my gradient penalty calculation that is the first part will be calculating only the gradient and that's this function gradient of critic score and this method obviously take the critic score as the argument then real images fake images and this hyperparameter epsilon my interpolated image will just be real into epsilon plus fake into one minus epsilon that's just this formula real into epsilon and uh, one minus epsilon into the generated fake images and then that will be uh, that will be the input this interpolated image created with the epsilon will be the input to my critic function so i'm um, bringing in critic passing interpolated images as the input that will produce a score that's my mixed score and then it's simple the final step which is i have to compute the gradient of this critic score with respect to the pixels of the mixed images so i'm making use of torch.autograd.grad function and these are all the standard inputs to to the grad function of torch.autograd package so inputs becomes my interpolated image outputs because becomes my mixed scores and grad outputs is i'm passing a tensor of ones so i'm using torch dot ones like mixed scores create graph true retrain retain graph true and finally uh, and taking the zeroth element of this gradient and that's just the return from this entire method so this method is just producing the gradient that is this part a gradient of c of x x hat x hat is an interpolated image now once that gradient is available that is these part is available then i have to uh, calculate in the next part the entire l2 norm of these and deduct that from minus one but before that just quickly make um, a quick uh, unit test of this method that i just uh, wrote here so the unit test for the above method is this one test gradient of critic score so what this uh, unit test method is actually doing that first it's creating a set of real images and then a set of fake images and i'm doing that with uh, uh, these two lines 
uh, torch.randn and again for fake torch.randn to that i'm passing uh, these image shape and device remains device plus one now image shape will be uh, the one that will resemble my mnist data set and in pytorch we have to follow the convention of batch size channel height width in terms of image shape and uh, so when i will be invoking this function in a second uh, this is the input tuple which represent the image shape that's what i'm giving so 256 is a number of uh, samples in a batch that is a batch size one is channel it's a grayscale image 28 by 28 is a uh, height and width of a typical mnist image so uh, what this is doing is uh, that is real or fake it is creating a four dimensional tensor which exactly resembles an mnist image and the first two dimension is batch size and channel number and to check that it's really doing so i just uh, uh, you can just uh, run this function in a separate notebook and in here I'm just running this function and I'm commenting out all these extra assert comments here because that I don't need I just need to check some of the shape uh, are exactly coming out to be the way that I wanted want them so if I uh, run this cell what I'm all doing here is I'm just uh, printing out the real dot shape and if I run this cell I will get this that is 256 128 28 so that's my that's my uh, uh, real dot shape and exactly similarly I can do that for my fake images as well so that's I'll do fake and then run this cell again I got 256 128 28 so real and fake are creating a four dimensional tensor indeed representing mnist image let's actually print the actual tensor so I'm just without shape I'm just printing the actual real and run this cell all right so this is the tensor you will get so uh, it's a four dimensional tensor and each of these single dimension that that is an innermost dimension this is representing a, a single image so uh, uh, here the entire tensor uh, is shown in a a uh, rather compact way so if you want to see the entire thing just click on this text editor it will create it will open a separate it will open the same tensor in a separate text editor because within the jupyter notebook in vs code it cannot show the entire tensor so let's click on it all right now this is the actual view of those images so it's a four dimensional tensor the first dimension is uh, batch size then uh, channel number then uh, uh, my height and width and each of these innermost ones actually one single image another single image another single image like this so yeah so my that's my uh, uh, that's what this real and fake is created and then i also have to create an epsilon shape and epsilon because for each of these image i need one epsilon value so my epsilon tensor shape also need to be four dimension and that's what I am creating the epsilon shape to be one for uh, underscore in image shape and image shape is again the argument so epsilon shape will uh, th this this uh, code will just create this array one 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 that's all and then to create my uh, actual epsilon values uh, I will create this epsilon variable which will be using again torch dot rand epsilon shape device device requires grad i need for for this epsilon i need the requires grad and that's why i'm passing this requires grad so if you print this epsilon it will show you uh, this kind of tensor so it it is again a four dimensional tensor and uh, requires grad equal to true and what it is doing is that uh, each of these innermost dimension is actually the epsilon value and i need one, uh, epsilon values uh, one epsilon values for each of the image and that is the reason I passed one in here because I just need uh, one dimension uh, in each of the dimension of epsilon, epsilon tensor. And then the rest of the code is super simple. I'm just um, bringing in my previously defined function gradient of critic score that we just defined here so that I get the gradient on the critic. Uh, gradient uh, from the critic on real and fake images and passing to this function the critic real fake and epsilon that will produce that will give me the gradient and then I just need to check few things with the hazard statement on the gradient so first I'm checking the shape of the gradient matches with image shape 
uh, because uh, the, my gradient is calculated on the images so it, the shape should match and also I'm checking that the gradient.max is more than zero and the gradient.mean is uh, less than zero so it was a very simple unit test of my uh, of my this gradient of critic score all right now that we are done with the first part of my gradient penalty calculation so we just uh, we just uh, calculated the gradient on the uh, interpolated image now i have to calculate the next part which is these entire expression so i'm done with this insight calculation here that is gradient of c of x hat now i have to create the norm uh, the l2 norm of these gradients so let's do that in my next function which is this one very simple one there is nothing in this function actually so this is a gradient penalty calculation calculate the penalty on the norm of the gradient so in this method i just pass a gradient then uh, i flatten the gradient or reshape the gradient um, with this uh, view method minus one again it's just uh, inferred dimension given the other dimension i have already given and then I'm creating the gradient norm and gradient norm for norm calculation. I'm just using PyTorch's norm function. And because it's an N2 norm, so I'm pass L2 norm. So I'm passing two as a first argument and across the dimension of one. And then my penalty will simply be torch.mean gradient norm minus one whole square. That's all. It, it, this, this formula, this is just implementing uh, this formula uh, here. Uh, here, this one. So L2 norm of my gradient minus one whole square. And that's what this is. And I'm using torch.mean because I will be, uh, this gradient will have all the gradients for the batch because the entire training will go batch by batch. And from this method, I'm just returning this penalty. That's what I need to add to my loss calculation during training, which we'll, we will see in a second. And again, after this method, let's do a quick unit test on this method as well. And here, this is my unit test on this method. Now, to what this unit test is doing, let's understand what it's doing first. Now, in this unit test of gradient penalty, what I will be testing is uh, uh, some good gradients and some bad gradients. Now, uh, what is good gradient and bad gradient in WGAN? Let's go to my uh, gradient penalty calculation so this expression this whole expression is my gradient penalty and for a good gradient these whole expression would be minimized and for a bad gradient these whole expression will be maximized and so for a bad gradient for this whole expression to be maximized this part should be minimized that is this part minus one whole square will be maximum when this part is minimum and in that case this term gradient of c of x hat that is a critic score on the x hat this would be zero and in that case zero minus one whole square this term will be maximized and that's the definition of my bad gradients and similarly for the good gradients this whole term that is the whole regularization term needs to be as close to zero as possible because in that case that means i do not have any regularization term to add to my loss that is no penalty to add to my loss that is in that case the whole expression will be equal to zero but we will come to that in a second so let's go back to the code to check my uh, the way that i'm implementing the bad gradient so we just said that my bad gradients will be uh, will be zero and that's what this line is doing i'm creating a bad gradient tensor with torch dot zeros and the shape of these uh, image uh, sh shape is i'm taking from the image shape because uh, and that's what i'll be passing to my unit test and my image shape is just again it's a four-dimensional tensor with batch size channel height width so if you just wanted to see the shape of these uh, bad gradient uh, tensor it will be like this so if, uh, i can just do a print something like this print bad gradient and that will produce uh, uh, this kind of tensor so this is a four dimension dimensional tensor all elements are zero each of the uh, scalar values within this tensor in the innermost dimension is zero because that's what i wanted that is all gradients should be zero so that uh, this term becomes zero and now for the good gradient 
this is my line that is good gradient equal to torch dot once image shape divided by torch dot square root image size and we will understand it in detail that why exactly this line but let's see what image shape is so image shape is my four dimensional tensor this one and for this part that is torch dot square root image size image size i am defining to be a product torch dot product torch dot tensor image shape uh, from one up to n so this will actually multiply uh, so uh, shape one slice means it will take these two elements as a tensor and then uh, do a product between them that's all so it will actually produce um, 28 into 28 which means 784 that's what image size is and that's exactly my image size because i'm just uh, multiplying height by width and then in here in this line i'm taking a square root of that of this image size so that means again here it means uh, square root of 784 which is 28 so effectively in this line i am dividing a four dimensional tensor that is this one and each element of this four dimensional tensor by uh, these uh, scalar value of a tensor that is this torch dot square root image size this is actually uh, 28 uh, well this is actually a tensor because i am using torch dot square root so this 28 is actually something like this tensor dot 28 and to understand this line we have to understand what how the norm is calculated because this line is actually uh, actually based on this entire mathematical expression which is my entire gradient penalty and uh, my gradient penalty to calculate my gradient penalty here in this expression i have to calculate the l2 norm of the gradients and then set l2 norm of the gradient minus one equal to zero so what is an l2 norm and that is this that is uh, if i have a vector u like this the l2 norm will be the square root of the summation of each of the elements squared that is u1 square plus u2 square up to all the way up to un square and then sum them and then take a square root so now that we know how l2 norm is calculated uh, let's go back to the original formula here uh, the gradient the l2 norm of the gradient of my uh, critic score minus one whole this expression should be equal to zero for the good gradients that is in the case where the penalty that is gradient penalty that is th this whole expression is equal to zero and let's just uh, put it in a actual expression so that means for a good gradient this norm of the gradient of my score on the x hat minus one whole square this expression should be equal to zero that is this equation norm gradient x score minus one whole square equal to zero after simplification that means uh, because i can take a square root on both side that means norm gradient score x minus one equal to zero that means norm gradient score x equal to one and which uh, because now we know that is norm of any term actually means this formula that is a square root of the sum of each of the term within the tensor that's the norm that's the definition of the norm by just a pure following the mathematical definition and that's equal to one and if now we simplify it further that is simplification and changing the sides we will end up that is this gradient this gradient will be equal to one by square root of image size and that's what i am doing in this line that is a uh, good gradient is equal to torch dot once uh, then i am putting the image shape as my uh, uh, as my argument to torch dot once because i need each values element values of the tensor to be one divided by torch dot square root image size that's this formula which we just derived one divided by square root of image size and now it's all simple we just need to check that the uh, bad gradient penalty tensor is close to one and the good gradient penalty tensor is close to zero 
Uh, so previously in this line, we already checked the checked for the bad gradient penalty. That is uh, torch dot is close. Bad gradient penalty is close to one. And uh, just to make a point here about this is close method, because I'm using this again and again throughout this notebook. So if you go to the official documentation of is close, uh, that's what it says. Returns a new tensor with Boolean elements representing if each element of input tensor input is the first argument to is close is close to the corresponding element of the other and other is my second argument and closeness is defined by this um, uh, this expression input minus others less or equal to ATO1 plus RTO1 and ATO1 the default value is 1 E minus 0 8 very very low value indeed so uh, and uh, I'm not defining these ATO1 uh, key parameter in my function that means it will take the default value uh, which is very close so, uh, so very much this is close uh, method will go through each element between between these two tensors and check whether they are they are really 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 close not exactly equal just really 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 close so that's what it is doing that each element of bad gradient penalty is very very close to a uh, torch dot tensor with one uh, value and now I have the good gradient penalty uh, and that should be close to uh, zero because in this case I just mentioned that the good in the case of good gradient penalty this whole term should be zero that's it that is that means there is no penalty so that's what I'm checking in sorry that's what I'm checking in this line assert torch dot is close good, good gradient penalty is close to torch dot tensor zero zero and both of these assertion statements should return me true and finally just another random gradient I'm producing to check its value so my random gradient will just be test um, uh, test uh, gradient of critic score image shape and uh, then calculating the random gradient penalty by uh, by passing the random gradient to the gradient penalty l2 norm and here in the last assertion statement i'm just checking that this random gradient penalty minus one should be less than 0 0.1 and uh, yeah so uh, that's all and uh, to, uh, to invoke this function i'm just again making uh, use of this same image shape a batch size channel number height width and that will that should produce that should all the assertions test should pass and finally uh, it should print success all right with that my uh, everything is ready and only thing due is a final training so let's start with the final training and before starting through the codes of my training function let's go uh, through the overall training workflow very quickly and the same workflow we have followed in the uh, previous video where we implemented WGAN without gradient penalty from scratch so uh, the training step starts by training the critic network first and the critic network is passed the real batch of data as well as fake batch of data generated by the generator then the critics loss function is arranged such that it estimates a Wasserstein distance that is it maximizes the distance between the two distribution and what are my two distribution uh, the one distribution is coming from the real images and the second distribution is coming from the generated images then clips its own weights to ensure it is one Lipschitz continuous but that was in the weight clipping method now we'll be using gradient penalty so the loss calculation will include a gradient penalty term based on these entire discussion that is we will be uh, calculating the gradients and then taking l2 norm and then uh, doing the l2 norm minus one and that amount should be uh, squared to calculate my gradient penalty and that should be added to my whole loss function so anyway then after the loss function from the critic then the generator generates a new batch of images from the noise vector passes these new batch of images through the critic who then informs the generator of the Wasserstein one distance between the true distribution and the distribution of the images produced by the generator and it does this via the loss function of the critic and uh, finally this whole workflow is repeated again and again until the loss converges to near zero and the distributions are approximately equal all right with that let's go back to our code
so my this is my final training and um, we already have defined all the required hyperparameters at the very top of the file here uh, all these hyperparameters will be used in my training algorithm so let's go to the bottom uh, yeah so uh, I am as usual for all GAN training I have to go there will be two loops one is for each epoch and the inner loop will be actually enumerating or looping through the uh, data loader and the data loader will return me a batch by batch of input training data so within my this is my inner loop and i'm getting the real batches of data from here and now the actual training of gan uh, here the workflow that we will see is the same uh, kind of pattern that we have used previously in our in my previous videos like dc gan or cycle gan and obviously uh, in the immediately preceding video which was implementation of w gan without gradient penalty so uh, nothing too complex here first is uh, critic training and the very first step before uh, any training obviously is zero grad because i need a clean set and uh, pytorch accumulates is gradient so i need to apply zero grad to clear those uh, accumulated gradients and then i am creating a fake noise with my get noise function and this get noise was defined in my utils file which will just produce a noise vector given the number of samples and z dim uh, which is coming from my hyperparameter and this is the very first step uh, for feeding my generator network because generator network will take these fake noises and create my fake images which is this next line and then i have the fake images which is a fake image tensor and that obviously includes uh, uh, pytorch's gradient tree so what i'm doing in the next line is uh, detaching that gradient tree and passing that to my critic to create my create fake prediction score and similarly uh, that was a fake image and now i also have to create my real image score from the critic so in the next line i'm passing real images to my critic and that will produce my critic real prediction score and uh, then i am creating these epsilon because i need this epsilon to create the interpolated image and just uh, as we discussed that epsilon will be a tensor of size of torch dot size 128 by 1 by 1 by 1 because here the batch size is 128 and uh, that's what i'm doing with uh, rand torch dot rand that i'm creating these tensor the first dimension is length of the real images and the next all dimensions are one 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 and uh, device equal to device requires grad is set to true and now after defining epsilon i need to calculate the gradient penalty term because the other elements of the loss function i already have and which are the other elements these uh, crit real prediction and critic fret fake prediction uh, and to these these are two loss calculation terms in wgan to that i also have to add the gradient penalty and that's what i'm to do i'm going to do now uh, because i have the epsilon defined so i'm first uh, gradient for gradient penalty calculation there's two steps as we discussed in detail that first i have to calculate the gradient and only then i have to calculate the gradient penalty so for calculating the gradient i'm making use of these gradient of critic score method that we wrote to that i'm passing critic real images fake images and epsilon uh, these function will internally create the uh, interpolated images by making use of these epsilon value and uh, uh, then output the gradient on that interpolated image and then the, in the next step of gradient penalty calculation i have to uh, calculate the actual gradient penalty which is this line so this is simple just invoke gradient penalty l2 norm method that we wrote earlier and to that passing gradient and now i have all the elements of my loss calculation which are my critic fake prediction critic real prediction and gradient penalty so all i need to do is invoke these get critic loss that we have defined earlier in my utils file to this file i'm just passing critic fake prediction critic real prediction the gradient penalty term and these hyperparameter c lambda and just to quickly check what this method is doing just uh, go to our utils file 
and here is the definition of this of that function get critic loss that will calculate my critic loss which is um, uh, which is this that is critic loss equal to torch dot mean critic fake prediction minus torch dot mean critic real prediction so this is my regular w loss or the wasserstein distance between two uh, distribution and to that i have to add the gradient penalty term which is c lambda multiplied by gp so this uh, part is implementing implementing uh, this uh, this one that is uh, uh, lambda into the whole gradient penalty term and the first part is a regular gain loss that is uh, uh, c of x that is critic of the real images minus critic of fake images the z of g of z is the fake images and that's a uh, very at the center of w gan that is this is the loss under the wasserstein uh, uh, gan with gradient penalty so this method is just returning this crit loss and that's what i'm using in my train loss uh, so with that my critic loss is ready now i have to keep track of the average critic loss because this is uh, defined for the whole batch uh, all right actually the average is here because the critic is trained many more times than the generator so i have to take the average critic loss so to do that all i'm doing is um, uh, this one mean critic loss for the iteration plus equal to critic loss dot item this this critic loss dot item because i'm taking the actual float values from the tensor divided by critic repeats and critic repeats is uh, one of the hyperparameter that we have defined at the very very top here so this is the number of times a critic will be trained for each generator training let's come back yeah so that's my main critic loss and uh, then i will be updating the actual gradients with the that is do the back propagation with critic loss dot backward um, and then also update the weights uh, with the optimizer so i'm doing critic optimizer dot step this step method will actually update the weights and finally after this uh, inner loop is done for e for each of the critic repeats uh, because this entire calculation was going on inside this uh, loop where i was looping through uh, looping through the range of crit repeats which is in this case crit repeat is five then outside this loop um, keep track to keep track of these uh, of these losses uh, across the all the critic repeats i have to uh, do this um, uh, summation accumulated terms so that will be mean critic loss for this iteration and keep them accumulated so that's there ends my uh, my uh, my discriminator training and then i will be doing the generator training which is much more simple and under the generated training again the first step is just the same that is zero grad to clear my accumulated gradients and have a clean set and then i have to create my fake noise again and so i'm using in this line get noise function uh, that will create these uh, vector fake noise two because we are naming it as two because within the discriminator training we also did the same here fake noise that was for the discriminator training and then i have to create this fake noise again because generator need to have these uh, to create its image uh, and then in the next line i'm creating the fake two this is my uh, images generated from the generator by feeding the generator this fake noise too and then i have to calculate uh, my critic score again that's why i'm bringing in critic passing it fake two which is my uh fake noises sorry fake images generated by the generator and this variable will hold my critic score for the fake images generated from the fake two uh, and all right so my gen losses is simply now uh this method that we defined in our utils fi utils file and to that it will only take the crit fake prediction that is a critic score from my critic and what these uh, get gen losses is doing let's go back to our utils it's a very simple function it is just calculating calculating this gen loss equal to minus one into torch dot mean critic fake prediction and that's uh, defined why minus because that's the way it was defined in the paper that is generated loss generated loss equal to the negative of average critic score on fake images and uh, 
and so the generator tries to maximize this function in order in other words it tries to maximize the discriminator's output for its fake instances in this function uh, so this is the generator loss and because we are doing a gradient descent in training algorithm that is we are we have to deal with the minimization problem so we have to convert if every maximization mathematical expression to a minimization problem to a minimization mathematical expression indeed and so that's the reason i am using this negative because when i want to maximize this term that means i have to minimize the negative of this term and that's why this uh, multiplication by minus one now coming back to train i have my gen losses ready and so all i need to do is just do the backward propagation in this line and then update the weights with the step method and then my just keep track of the average generator losses which will be the accumulated generator losses here there is no division by any number because generator is being trained uh, only after so many discriminator or so many critic has been trained already so uh, in critic remember we did uh, uh, this division of the crit loss dot items because critic was trained more number of times so to get the mean i had to divide by this but here in the case of generator i do not have this that reputation and so it's just an accumulated value of these gen loss dot items and with that i'm pretty much done with my training actual implementation of the training is done and the next set of blocks all these code in this uh, section is just for visualization nothing too complex going on uh, all what i'm doing here is i'm uh, actually showing uh, both the uh, fake image generated by the generator and the real images after each 50 steps and this 50 steps has been defined in a hyperparameter at the top which is display step so uh, when the current step uh, modulo display step equal to equal to zero that is after each display step and when the current step is obviously more than zero because that condition need to satisfy otherwise it will print the very first uh, before the training also so when after each 50 step i am just calculating my uh, generator mean loss for the latest 50 step and also the critic mean loss for the latest display step and then printing them that's all and uh, uh, this this way that i'm taking the the latest display step uh, uh, from the loss with this with this slice notation of python so basically this is the list uh, uh, list notation slice notation of python applied on the list and it, this means that this is the this is what it means that list then minus x and slice means last x items in the array so my generator losses is a whole list of items which has got all the generator losses across all the batches all the epochs etc so when i want to take the latest the last so many number of uh, losses from this i have to do this minus display step and then a slice it will take the last display step and then divided by display step to get the mean of that because otherwise it is an accumulated value so i need to get i need to sum them and then uh, take the mean and doing the same for critic mean loss as well and then printing them that's all it is doing and also at the very end i, I have to plot them i have to plot a graph so i'm making use of this plot image from tensor that we defined in our utils file i have to print i am printing both the fake images and the real images so that i can uh, i can see them side by side and then this final part of this is just simple plotting so i'm just uh, uh, calculating i'm just defining a uh, bins to show the number of examples and then using plt.plot two times one for plotting uh, the number of examples with a uh, with a uh, with a bean size and uh, uh, for the generator losses and doing the same for the critic losses and uh, that's why the first one is label generator loss the second one is critic loss so that pretty much completes my entire training uh yeah so now uh, to run this entire project i just need to uh, go to my Google Collab and uh, 
we have seen this uh, earlier pattern as well that uh, uh, again in my uh, project file i have three files uh, one is utils one is train and another one is wgan uh, these two extra was just defined for uh, during the video so i can close it they have got nothing to do with the project let's just close it yeah so i have got these three files utils train and wgan and i have to upload all these three files into my google collab and then run them run only the train file that is all because my train file is importing the other two files uh, all the modules of the other two files so if i here in this line uh, my train file is importing wgan and utils so if i just execute the train file that will include the other two files all necessary modules so you just go to google collab and in the folder you uh, upload to the session storage the three files that's my train utils and wgan and it will tell you remember uploaded files will get deleted when the runtime is recycled yeah obviously when you close your session those three files will get deleted from the session storage so now that my this train utils and wgan file is uh, uploaded i first just connect my google drive because my mnist data set was saved in my google drive uh, you may choose not to do that but in that case you have to change your root directory in your uh, in your train file accordingly uh, you can actually upload the upload the mnis data set in the session storage of collab itself because uh, that may be easier in some cases in that case remember when you shut down your session storage that mnis data set that was downloaded into your session storage will get deleted as well and in that case uh, you have to change the root directory here so this is my train file i have because my mnis data set was saved in my google drive that's what when i was using using this data loader method uh, this is the root directory i specified so if you are choosing uh, any other directory you have to just change this uh, root path accordingly and so after running this cell my google drive got connected and nvidia smi will just print out the kind of gpu you got so in this case i got tesla k80 with a 12 gb of virtual ram so this is the most common one that you will get but that's uh, good enough for running your wgan on mnist data set because MNIST, mnist is reasonably small data set you do a quick ls uh, command to check that the files are recognized indeed and we see that train.py utils.py and wgan.py are all recognized and then just run this command python train.py that will be enough and that will start your wgan training and we can see the first two printed these two success that's coming from our uh, train.file because remember in our train.file we had two unit test uh, so this is one unit test which is this is uh, calculating the unit test for uh, test gradient for critic score and we had another unit test down below for test gradient penalty l2 norm this also will print success so these two are printing the success from this and i think these are uh, this is printing because i had some print command somewhere to calc to see the actual tensor that i was building uh, uh, so you would uh, well, ideally you should not have any print command uh, print inside your notebook because these will produce so many big tensors uh, while it's running so just comment that out and then just to show the result finally this is the kind of result that i was getting so this is my fake images at the after the uh, very first epoch and we can see that these are just absolute noise no image no mnist data set image at all shown in this and this is the real mnist data set because i was printing and i was showing the fake images and the real images side by side but after going through some few more and also the, after the first epoch we can see the uh, generator loss was quite low but the critic loss is so very high and when you go through the epochs it will continue to go down and after i think few epochs i got uh, somewhere here i think that's only after uh, two or three epochs uh, i'm not sure so anyway uh, we can see after a few epochs the um, mnist images are kind of only starting to emerge but you really have to uh, start uh, go through at least 60 70 
epochs to see the real image to the generated images becoming like the real images uh, all right so that's kind of uh, the end of this video that pretty much wraps up this uh, this architecture implementation of wgan uh, with Py with gradient penalty from scratch with pytorch and obviously all these source code will be there in my github repository the link of which will be there in the description of the video just search by the number because all my videos are numbered that pretty much wraps up this video and all my upcoming videos will all be on some great computer vision projects and algorithm with pytorch and tensorflow so stay tuned and if you have not subscribed yet do subscribe and if you like this video smash the like button thank you for watching